Book Fifth, Chapter Fifteen of Ben Hur by Lou Wallace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Fifteen. Ben Hur tarried across the river with Elderim, for at midnight, as previously determined, they would take the road which the caravan, then thirty hours out, had pursued. The sheik was happy, his offers of gifts had been royal, but Ben-Hur had refused everything, insisting that he was satisfied with the humiliation of his enemy. The generous dispute was long continued. Think, the sheik would say, what thou hast done for me. In every black tent, down to the Aqaba and to the ocean, and across to the Euphrates, and beyond to the Sea of the Scythians, the renown of my Myra and her children will go, and they who sing of them will magnify me and forget that I am in the wane of life, and all the spears now masterless will come to me, and my sword-hands multiply past counting. Thou dost not know what it is to have sway of the desert such as will now be mine. I tell thee it will bring tribute incalculable from commerce and immunity from kings. I, by the sword of Solomon, doth my messengers seek favor for me of Caesar, that will he get, yet nothing. Nothing? And Ben-Hur would answer, Nay, sheik, have I not thy hand and heart? Let thy increase of power and influence enter the king who comes. Who shall say was not allowed thee for him? In the work I am going to, I may have great need. Saying no now will leave me to ask of thee with better grace hereafter. In the midst of a controversy of the kind, two messengers arrived, Maluch and one unknown. The former was admitted first. The good fellow did not attempt to hide his joy over the event of the day. But coming to that with which I am charged, he said, the master Simonides sends me to say that upon the adjournment of the games, some of the Roman faction made haste to protest against payment of the money price. Ilderim started up, crying in his shrillest tones, By the splendor of God, the East shall decide whether the race was fairly won. Nay, good sheik, said Maloth. The editor has paid the money. Tis well. When they said Ben Hur struck Miss Sulla's wheel, the editor left and reminded them of the blow the Arabs had at the turn of the gold. And what of the Athenian? He is dead. Dead? cried Ben Hur. Dead? echoed Ilderim. What fortune these Roman monsters have? Masala escaped? Escaped, yes. Oh, shake with life. But it shall be a burden to him. The physicians say he will live, but never walk again. Ben-Hur looked silently up to heaven. He had a vision of Masala, chair-bound like Simonides, and like him going abroad on the shoulders of servants. The good man had abode well, but what would this one with his pride and ambition? Simonides bade me say further. Malak continued. Sanballat is having trouble. Drusus and those who signed with him referred the question of paying the five talents they lost to the consul Maxentius, and he has referred it to Caesar. Messala also refused his losses, and Sanballat, in imitation of Drusus, went to the consul, where the matter is still in advisement. The better Romans say the Protestants shall not be excused, and all the adverse factions join with them. The city rings with the scandal. What says Simonides? asked Ben-Hur. The master laughs, and is well pleased. If the Roman pays, he is ruined. If he refuses to pay, he is dishonored. The imperial policy will decide the matter. To offend the East would be a bad beginning with the Parthians. To offend Sheikh Ilderim would be to antagonize the desert, over which lie all Maxentius's lines of operation. Wherefore Simonides bade me tell you to have no disquiet. Miss Sala will pay. Eldrim was at once restored to his good humor. Let us be off now, he said, rubbing his hands. The business will do well with Simonides. The glory is ours. I will order the horses. Stay, said Malach. I left a messenger outside. Will you see him? By the splendor of God, I forgot him. Malik retired and was succeeded by a lad of gentle manners and delicate appearance who knelt upon one knee and said winningly, Eras, the daughter of Balthazar, well known to good Sheik Ilderim, hath entrusted me with a message to the Sheik, 
who, she saith, will do her great favor, so he receive her congratulations on account of the victory of his four. The daughter of my friend is kind, said Elderine with sparkling eyes. Do thou give her this jewel, in sign of the pleasure I have from her message. He took a ring from his finger as she spoke. I will as thou sayest, O Sheik, the lad replied, and continued. The daughter of the Egyptian charged me further. She praised the good Sheik Ilderim to send word to the youth Ben-Hur, that her father hath taken residence for a time in the palace of the Eiderney, where she will receive the youth after the fourth hour to-morrow. And if, with her congratulations, Sheik Ilderim will accept her favour, for this other favour done, she will be ever so pleased. The Sheik looked at Ben-Hur, whose face was suffused with pleasure. What will you? he asked. By your leave, O Sheik, I will see the fair Egyptian. Elderine laughed and said, <laughs> Shall not a man enjoy his youth? Then Ben-Hur answered the messenger, Say to her who sent you that I, Ben-Hur, will see her at the palace of Eiderne, wherever that may be, to-morrow at noon. The lad arose and with silent salute departed. At midnight Elderine took the road, having arranged to leave a horse and a guide for Ben-Hur, who was to follow him. End of chapter 15《5th Chapter 16 of Ben Hur by Lou Wallace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 16 Going next day to fill his appointment with the Eras, Ben Hur turned from the Omphalus, which was in the heart of the city, into the colonnade of Herod, and came shortly to the palace of Eiderne. From the street he passed first into a vestibule, on the sides of which were stairways under cover, leading up to a portico. Winged lions sat by the stairs. In the middle there was a gigantic ibis spouting water over the floor. The lions, ibis, walls, and floor were reminders of the Egyptians. Everything, even the balustrading of the stairs, was of massive grey stone. Above the vestibule, and covering the landing of the steps, arose the portico, a pillared grace so light, so exquisitely proportioned, it was at that period hardly possible of conception except by a Greek. Of marble snowy white, its effect was that of a lily dropped carelessly upon a great bare rock. Ben-Hur paused in the shade of the portico to admire its tracery and finish, and the purity of its marble. Then he passed on into the palace. Ample folding doors stood open to receive him. The passage into which he first entered was high, but somewhat narrow. Red tiling formed the floor, and the walls were tinted to correspond. Yet this plainness was a warning of something beautiful to come. He moved on slowly, all his faculties in repose. Presently he would be in the presence of Eras. She was waiting for him, waiting with song and story and badinage, sparkling, fanciful, capricious, with smiles which glorified her glance and glances which lent voluptuous suggestion to her whisper. She had sent for him the evening of the boat ride on the lake in the orchard of palms. She had sent for him now, and he was going to her in the beautiful palace of Eiderne. He was happy and dreamful rather than thoughtless. The passage brought him to a closed door in front of which he paused, and as he did so the broad leaves began to open of themselves without creak or sound of lock or latch, or touch of foot or finger. The singularity was lost in the view that broke upon him. Standing in the shade of the dull passage and looking through the doorway, he beheld the atrium of a Roman house, roomy and rich to a fabulous degree of magnificence. How large the chamber was cannot be stated, because of the deceit there is in exact proportions. Its depth was vista-like, something never to be said of an equal interior. When he stopped to make survey and looked down upon the floor, he was standing upon the breast of Alida represented as a caressing swan, and looking further he saw the floor was similarly laid in mosaic pictures of mythological subjects. And there were stools and chairs, each a separate design, and a work of art exquisitely composed, and tables much carven, and here and there couches which were invitations of themselves. The articles of furniture which stood out from the walls were duplicated on the floor distinctly as if they floated unrippled water. Even the panelling of the walls, the figures upon them in painting and bas-relief, and the fresco of the ceiling, were reflected on the floor. The ceiling curved up towards the centre, where there was an opening through which the sunlight poured without hindrance, and the sky, ever so blue, seemed in hand-reach. The impluvium under the opening was guarded by bronzed rails, 
The gilded pillars supporting the roof at the edges of the opening shone like flame where the sun struck them, and their reflections beneath seemed to stretch to infinite depth. And there were candelabra quaint and curious, and statuary, and vases, the whole making an interior that would have befitted well the house on Palatine Hill which Cicero bought of Crassus, or that other, yet more famous for extravagance, the Tusculan Villa of Sarus. Still in his dreamful mood, Ben-Hur sauntered about, charmed by all he beheld, and waiting. He did not mind a little delay. When Eros was ready, she should come or send a servant. In every well-regulated Roman house the atrium was the reception chamber for visitors. Twice, thrice he made the round. As often he stood under the opening in the roof and pondered the sky in its azure depth. Then, leaning against a pillar, he studied the distribution of light and shade, and its effects, here a veil diminishing objects, there a brilliance exaggerating others, yet nobody came. Time, or rather the passage of time, began at length to impress itself upon him, and he wondered why Eros stayed so long. Again he traced out the figures upon the floor, but not with the satisfaction the first inspection gave him. He paused often to listen, directly impatience blew a little fevered breath upon his spirit, next time it blew stronger and hotter, and at last he woke to a consciousness of the silence which held the house in thrall, and the thought of it made him uneasy and distrustful. Still he put off the feeling with a smile and a promise. Oh, she is giving the last touch to her eyelids, or she is arranging a chaplet for me. She will come presently, more beautiful of the delay. He sat down then to admire a candelabrum, a bronze plinth on rollers, filigree on the sides and edges, the post at one end, and on the end opposite an altar and a female celebrant, the lamp rests swinging by delicate chains from the extremities of drooping palm branches, altogether a wonder in its way. But the silence would obtrude itself. He listened even as he looked at the pretty object. He listened, but there was not a sound. The palace was still as a tomb. There might be a mistake. No, the messenger had come from the Egyptian, and this was the palace of Idony. Then he remembered how mysteriously the door had opened, so soundlessly, so of itself. He would see. He went to the same door. Though he walked ever so lightly, the sound of his stepping was loud and harsh, and he shrank from it. He was getting nervous. The cumbrous Roman lock resisted his first effort to raise it, and the second. The blood chilled in his cheeks. He wrenched with all his might. The door was not even shaken. A sense of danger seized him, and for a moment he stood irresolute. Who in Antioch had the motive to do him harm? Masala! And this palace of irony? He had seen Egypt in the vestibule, Athens in the snowy portico. But here in the atrium was Rome. Everything about him betrayed Roman ownership. True, the site was on the great thoroughfare of the city, a very public place in which to do him violence, but for that reason it was more accordant with the audacious genius of his enemy. The atrium underwent a change, with all its elegance and beauty. It was no more than a trap. Apprehension always paints in black. The idea irritated Ben-Hur. There were many doors on the right and left of the atrium, leading, doubtless, to sleeping chambers. He tried them, but they were all firmly fastened. Knocking might bring response. Ashamed to make outcry, he betook himself to a couch, and lying down, tried to reflect. All too plainly he was a prisoner, but for what purpose, and by whom? If the work were Masala's! He sat up, looked about, and smiled defiantly. There were weapons in every table. But birds had been starved in golden cages. Not so would he. The couches would serve him as battering rams, and he was strong, and there was such increase of might and rage and despair. Masala himself could not come. He would never walk again. He was a cripple like Simonides. Still, he could move others. And where were there not others to be moved by him? Ben-Hur arose and tried the doors again. Once he called out, the room echoed so that he was startled. With such calmness as he could assume, he made up his mind to wait a time before attempting to break a way out. In such a situation the mind has its ebb and flow of disquiet, with intervals of peace in between. At length, how long, though, he could not have said, he came to the conclusion that the affair was an accident or mistake. The palace certainly belonged to somebody. 
It must have care and keeping, and the keeper would come. The evening or the night would bring him. Patience! So concluding, he waited. Half an hour passed, a much longer period to Ben-Hur, when the door which had admitted him opened and closed noiselessly as before, and without attracting his attention. The moment of the occurrence he was sitting at the farther end of the room. A footstep startled him. At last she has come, he thought, with a throb of relief and pleasure, and arose. The step was heavy, and accompanied with the gride and clang of coarse sandals. The gilded pillars were between him and the door. He advanced quietly and leaned against one of them. Presently he heard voices, the voices of men, one of them rough and guttural. What was said he could not understand, as the language was not of the east or south of Europe. After a general survey of the room, the strangers crossed to their left, and were brought into Ben-Hur's view, two men, one very stout, both tall and both in short tunics. They had not the air of masters of the house or domestics. Everything they saw appeared wonderful to them. Everything they stopped to examine they touched. They were vulgarians. The atrium seemed profaned by their presence. At the same time their leisurely manner and the assurance with which they proceeded pointed to some right or business. If business, with whom? With much jargon they sauntered this way and that, all the time gradually approaching the pillar by which Ben-Hur was standing. Off a little way, where a slanted gleam of the sun fell with a glare upon the mosaic of the floor, there was a statue which attracted their notice. In examining it they stopped in the light. The mystery surrounding his own presence in the palace tended, as we have seen, to make Ben-Hur nervous, so now, when in the tall stout stranger he recognized the Northman whom he had known in Rome, and seen crowned only the day before in the circus as the winning pugilist, when he saw the man's face, scarred with the wounds of many battles, and embruted by ferocious passions, when he surveyed the fellow's naked limbs, very marvels of exercise and training, and his shoulders of Herculean breadth, a thought of personal danger started a chill along every vein. A sure instinct warned him that the opportunity for murder was too perfect to have come by chance, and now here were the myrmidons, and their business was with him. He turned an anxious eye upon the Northman's comrade, young, black-eyed, black-haired, and altogether Jewish in appearance. He observed also that both the men were in costume exactly such as professionals of their class were in the habit of wearing in the arena. Putting the several circumstances together, Ben-Hur could not be longer in doubt. He had been lured into the palace with design. Out of reach of aid in this splendid privacy he was to die. At a loss what to do, he gazed from man to man, while there was enacted within him that miracle of mind by which life has passed before us in awful detail, to be looked at by ourselves as if it were another's, and from the involvement, from a hidden depth cast up, as it were, by a hidden hand, he was given to see that he had entered upon a new life, different from the old one in this, whereas in that he had been the victim of violences done to him, henceforth he was to be the aggressor. Only yesterday he had found his first victim. To the purely Christian nature the presentation would have brought the weakness of remorse. Not so with Ben-Hur. His spirit had its emotions from the teachings of the first lawgiver, not the last and greatest one. He had dealt punishment, not wrong, to Masala. By permission of the Lord he had triumphed, and he derived faith from the circumstance, faith the source of all rational strength, especially strength and peril. Nor did the influence stop there. The new life was made appear to him a mission just begun, and holy as the king to come was holy, and certain as the coming of the king was certain, a mission in which force was lawful if only because it was unavoidable. Should he, on the very threshold of such an errand, be afraid? He undid the sash around his waist, and bearing his head and casting off his white Jewish gown, stood forth in an under-tunic not unlike those of the enemy, and was ready, body and mind. Folding his arms, he placed his back against the pillar and calmly waited. The examination of the statue was brief. Directly the Northman turned and said something in an unknown tongue, then both looked at Ben-Hur. A few more words, and they advanced towards him. "'Who are you?' he asked, in Latin. The Northman fetched a smile which did not relieve his face of its brutalism, and answered, "'Barbarians.' "'This is the palace of Eterny. Whom seek you? Stand and answer.' The words were spoken with earnestness. The stranger stopped, and in his turn the Northman asked, "'Who are you?' "'A Roman.' The giant laid his head back upon his shoulders. 
Ah, ah, ah. I have heard how a god once came from a cow licking a salted stone. But not even a god can make a Roman of a Jew. Laugh over. He spoke to his companion again, and they moved nearer. Hold! said Ben-Hur, quitting the pillar. One word. They stopped again. A word replied the Saxon, folding his immense arms across his breast, and relaxing the menace beginning to blacken his face. A word. Speak. You are Thor the Northman. The giant opened his blue eyes. You were Lanista in Rome. Thor nodded. I was your scholar. No, said Thor, shaking his head. By the beard of Ermin, I never had a Jew to make a fighting man of. But I will prove my saying. How? You came here to kill me. That is true. Then let this man fight me singly, and I will make the proof on his body. A gleam of humor shone in the Northman's face. He spoke to his companion, who made answer, then he replied with the naivete of a diverted child. Wait till I say begin. By repeated touches of his foot, he pushed a couch out on the floor and proceeded leisurely to stretch his burly form upon it. When perfectly at ease, he said simply, Now begin. Without ado, Ben-Hur walked to his antagonist. Defend thyself, he said. The man, nothing loath, put up his hands. As the two thus confronted each other in a proof position, there was no discernible inequality between them. On the contrary, they were as like as brothers. To the stranger's confident smile, Ben-Hur opposed an earnestness which, had his skill been known, would have been accepted fair warning of danger. Both knew the combat was to be mortal. Ben-Hur fainted with his right hand. The stranger warded, slightly advancing his left arm. Ere he could return to guard, Ben-Hur caught him by the wrist in a grip which years at the oar had made terrible as a vice. The surprise was complete, and no time given, to throw himself forward, to push the arm across the man's throat and over his right shoulder, and turn him left side front, to strike surely with the ready left hand, to strike the bare neck under the ear, were but petty divisions of the same act. No need of a second blow. The Mermindon fell heavily, and without a cry, and lay still. Ben-Hur turned to Thord. Ha! Huh. What? By the beard of Ermin! The latter cried in astonishment, rising to a sitting posture. Then he laughed. Ha! Ah, ah, ha! Ah. Ha! I could not have done it better myself. He viewed Ben-Hur coolly from head to foot, and rising, faced him with undisguised admiration. It was my trick. The trick I practiced for ten years in the schools of Rome. You are not a Jew. Who are you? You knew Arius the Doomvir. Quintus Arius? Yes, he was my patron. He had a son. Yes, said Thord, his battered features lighting dully. I knew the boy. He would have made a king gladiator. Caesar offered him his patronage. I taught him the very trick you played on this one here, a trick impossible except to a hand and arm like mine. It has won me many a crown. I am that son of Arius. Thord drew nearer and viewed him carefully, then his eyes brightened with genuine pleasure, and laughing he held out his hand. Oh, 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 he told me I would find a Jew here, a Jew, a dog of a Jew, killing whom was serving the gods. Who told you so? asked Ben-Hur, taking the hand. He, Masala. <laughs> when, Thord? Last night. I thought he was hurt. He will never walk again. On his bed he told me between groans. A very vivid portrayal of hate in a few words, and Ben-Hur saw that the Roman, if he lived, would still be capable and dangerous, and follow him unrelentingly. Revenge remained to sweeten the ruined life, therefore the clinging to fortune lost in the wager with Sanballat. Ben-Hur ran the ground over with a distinct foresight of the many ways in which it would be possible for his enemy to interfere with him in the work he had undertaken for the king who was coming. Why not he resort to the Roman's methods? The man hired to kill him could be hired to strike back. It was in his power to offer higher wages. The temptation was strong, and half yielding he chanced to look down at his late antagonist lying still, with white upturned face, so like himself. A light came to him, and he asked, Sword, what was Masala to give you for killing me? A thousand sesterci. You shall have them yet, and so you do now what I tell you. I will add three thousand more to the sum. The giant reflected aloud. I won five thousand yesterday. From the Roman won six. Give me four, good Arius. Four more, and I will stand firm for you. Though old Thor, my namesake, strike me with his hammer. Make it four, and I will kill the lying patrician, if you say so. I only have to cover his mouth with my hand, thus. 
He illustrated the process by clapping his hand over his own mouth. "'I see,' said Ben-Hur. Ten thousand sesterti is a fortune. It will enable you to return to Rome and open a wine shop near the Great Circus and live as becomes the first of the Lenistae. The various scars on the giant's face glowed afresh with the pleasure the picture gave him. I will make it four thousand, Ben-Hur continued. And in what you shall do for the money there will be no blood on your hands, Thord. Hear me now. Did not your friend here look like me? I would have said he was an apple from the same tree. Well, if I put on his tunic and dress him in these clothes of mine, and you and I go away together, leaving him here, can you not get your sesterti eye from Miss Al all the same? You have only to make him believe it me that is dead. Thor laughed till the tears ran into his mouth. Oh, 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 ten thousand sesterti were never won so easily. And a wine shop by the great circus. All for a lie without blood in it. Oh, oh, oh. Give me thy hand, son of Arius. Get on now, and oh, 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 if you ever come to Rome, fail not to ask for the wine shop of Thord the Northman. By the beard of Ermin, I will give you the best, though I borrow it from Caesar. They shook hands again, after which the exchange of clothes was effected. It was arranged then that a messenger should go at night to Thord's lodging place with the four thousand sesterii. When they were done, the giant knocked at the front door. It opened to him, and passing out of the atrium, he led Ben-Hur in a room adjoining, where the latter completed his attire from the coarse garments of the dead pugilist. They separated directly in the omphalus. Fail not, O son of Arius. Fail not the wine-shop near the great circus. Oh, oh, oh! By the beard of Ermin, there was never fortune gained so cheap. The gods keep you. Upon leaving the atrium, Ben-Hur gave a last look at the Myrmidon as he lay in the Jewish vestments, and was satisfied. The likeness was striking. If Thord kept faith, the cheat was a secret to endure forever. At night, in the house of Simonides, Ben-Hur told the good man all that had taken place in the palace of Eiderney, and it was agreed that, after a few days, public inquiry should be set afloat for the discovery of the whereabouts of the son of Arius. Eventually the matter would be carried boldly to Maxentius. Then, if the mystery came not out, it was concluded that Masala and Gratus would be at rest and happy, and Ben-Hur free to betake himself to Jerusalem, to make search for his lost people. At the leave-taking Simonides sat in his chair, out on the terrace overlooking the river, and gave his farewell and the peace of the Lord with the impressment of a father. Esther went with the young man to the head of the steps. "'If I find my mother, Esther,' Thou shalt go to her at Jerusalem, and be a sister to Terza. And with the words he kissed her. Was it only a kiss of peace? He crossed the river next to the late quarters of Ilderim, where he found the Arab who was to serve him as guide. The horses were brought out. This one is thine, said the Arab. Ben-Hur looked, and lo, it was Aldebaran, the swiftest and brightest of the sons of Mira, and next to Sirius, the beloved of the sheik and he knew the old man's heart came to him along with the gift. The corpse in the atrium was taken up and buried by night, and, as part of Masala's plan, a courtier was sent off to Gratus to make him at rest by the announcement of Ben-Hur's death, this time past question. Ere long a wine-shop was opened near the Circus Maximus, with inscription over the door, Thord the Northman. End of chapter 16 End of book 5Book Sixth, Chapter One of Ben Hur by Lou Wallace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One Our story moves forward now, thirty days from the night Ben Hur left Antioch to go out with Sheik Ilderim into the desert. A great change has befallen, great at least as respects the fortunes of our hero. Valerius Gratus has been succeeded by Pontius Pilate. The removal, it may be remarked, cost Simonides exactly five talents Roman money in hand paid to Sejanus, who was then in height of power as imperial favorite, the object being to help Ben-Hur by lessening his exposure while in and about Jerusalem attempting discovery of his people. To such pious use the faithful servant put the winnings from Drusus and his associates, all of whom, having paid their wagers, became at once and naturally the enemies of Masala whose repudiation was yet an unsettled question in rome 
Brief as the time was, already the Jews knew of the change of rulers was not for the better. The cohort sent to relieve the garrison of Antonia made their entry into the city by night. Next morning, the first sight that greeted the people resident in the neighborhood was the walls of the old tower decorated with military ensigns, which unfortunately consisted of busts of the emperor mixed with eagles and globes. A multitude, in passion, marched to Caesarea, where Pilate was lingering, and implored him to remove the detested images. Five days and nights they beset his palace gates. At last he appointed a meeting with them in the circus. When they were assembled, he encircled them with soldiers. Instead of resisting, they offered him their lives and conquered. He recalled the images and ensigns to Caesarea, where Gratus, with more consideration, had kept such abominations housed during the eleven years of his reign. The worst of men do once in a while vary their wickedness by good acts, so with Pilate. He ordered an inspection of all the prisons in Judea, and a return of the names of the persons in custody, with a statement of the crimes for which they had been committed. Doubtless, the motive was one so common with officials just installed, dread of entailed responsibility. The people, however, in thought of the good which might come of the measure, gave him credit, and for a period were comforted. The revelations were astonishing. Hundreds of persons were released against whom there were no accusations. Many others came to light who had long been accounted dead. Yet more amazing, there was an opening of dungeons not merely unknown at the time of the people, but actually forgotten by the prison authorities. With one instance of the latter kind, we now have to deal. And strange to say, it occurred in Jerusalem. The Tower of Antonia, which will be remembered as occupying two-thirds of the sacred area on Mount Moriah, was originally a castle built by the Macedonians. Afterwards, John Hyrcanus erected the castle into a fortress for the defense of the temple, and in his day it was considered impregnable to assault. But when Herod came with his bolder genius, he strengthened its walls and extended them, leaving a vast pile which included every appurtenance necessary for the stronghold he intended it to be forever, such as offices, barracks, armories, magazines, cisterns, and last, though not least, prisons of all grades. He leveled the solid rock and tapped it with deep excavations and built over them, connecting the whole great mass with the temple by a beautiful colonnade, from the roof of which one could look down over the courts of the sacred structure. In such condition, the tower fell at last out of his hands into those of the Romans, who were quick to see its strength and advantages, and convert it to uses becoming such masters. All through the administrations of Gratus, it had been a garrisoned citadel and underground prison terrible to revolutionists. Woe when the cohorts poured from its gates to suppress disorder! Woe not less when a Jew passed the same gates going in under arrest. With this explanation, we hasten to our story. The order of the new procurator requiring a report of the persons in custody was received at the Tower of Antonia and promptly executed, and two days have gone since the last unfortunate was brought up for examination. The tabulated statement, ready for forwarding, lies on the table of the Tribune in command. In five minutes more, it will be on the way to Pilate, so joining in the palace up on Mount Zion. The tribune's office is spacious and cool, and furnished in a style suitable to the dignity of the commandant of a post in every respect so important. Looking in upon him about the seventh hour of the day, the officer appears weary and impatient. When the report is dispatched, he will to the roof of the colonnade for air and exercise, and the amusement to be had watching the Jews over in the courts of the temple. His subordinates and clerk share his impatience. In the spell of waiting, a man appeared in a doorway leading to an adjoining apartment. He rattled a bunch of keys, each heavy as a hammer, and at once attracted the chief's attention. Ah, Jasius, come in, the tribune said. As the newcomer approached the table behind which the chief sat in an easy chair, everybody present looked at him, and observing a certain expression of alarm and mortification on his face, became silent that they might hear what he had to say. Oh, tribune, he began, bending low, I fear to tell what now I bring you. Another mistake? <laughs> Jasius... If I could persuade myself it is but a mistake, I would not be afraid. A crime, then, or, worse, a breach of duty. Thou mayest laugh at Caesar, or curse the gods, and live. But if the offense be to the eagles... Ah, thou knowest, Jasius. Go on. It is now about eight years since Valerius Gratus selected me to be keeper of prisoners here in the tower, said the man deliberately. I remember the morning I entered upon the duties of my office. There had been a riot the day before, and fighting in the streets. We slew many Jews and suffered on our side. 
the affair came it was said of an attempt to assassinate gratus who had been knocked from his horse by a tile thrown from a roof i found him sitting where you now sit o tribune his head swathed in bandages he told me of my selection and gave me these keys numbered to correspond with the numbers of the cells they were the badges of my office he said and not to be parted with there was a roll of parchment on the table calling me to him he opened the roll here are maps of the cells said he there were three of them this one he went on shows the arrangement of the upper floor the second one gives you the second floor and this last is of the lower floor i give them to you in trust i took them from his hand and he said further now you have the keys and the maps go immediately and acquaint yourself with the whole arrangement visit each cell and see to its condition when anything is needed for the security of a prisoner order it according to your judgment for you are the master under me and no other i saluted him and turned to go away he called me back i, I forgot he said give me the map of the third floor i gave it to him and he spread it upon the table here jaceus he said see this cell he laid his finger on the one numbered five there are three men confined in that cell desperate characters who by some means got hold of a state secret and suffer for their curiosity which he looked at me severely in such matters is worse than a crime accordingly they are blind and tongueless and are placed there for life they shall have nothing but food and drink to be given them through a hole which you will find in the wall covered by a slide do you hear jaceus i made him answer it is well he continued one thing more which you shall not forget or he looked at me threateningly the door of their cell cell number five on the same floor this one jaceus he put his finger on the particular cell to impress my memory shall never be open for any purpose neither to let one in nor out not even yourself but if they die i asked if they die he said the cell shall be their tomb they were put there to die and be lost the cell is leprous do you understand with that he let me go gessius stopped and from the breast of his tunic drew three parchments all much yellowed by time and use selecting one of them he spread it upon the table before the tribune saying simply this is the lower floor the whole company looked at the map the map shows five cells all in a row along the outer wall this is exactly o tribune as i had it from gratus see there is cell number five said gessius i see the tribune replied go on now the cell was leprous he said i would like to ask you a question remarked the keeper modestly the tribune assented had i not a right under the circumstances to believe the map a true one what else couldst thou well it is not a true one the chief looked up surprised it is not a true one the keeper repeated it shows but five cells upon the floor while there are six six sayest thou i will show you the floor as it is or as i believe it to be upon a page of his tablets gessius drew the following diagram and gave it to the tribune the map shows five cells in a row with a narrow sixth cell extending the length of all five that is along the outer wall it opens into the fifth cell thou hast done well said the tribune examining the drawing and thinking the narrative at an end i will have the map corrected or better i will have a new one made and given thee come for it in the morning so saying he arose but hear me further o tribune to-morrow jaceus to-morrow that which i have yet to tell will not wait the tribune good-naturedly resumed his chair i will hurry said the keeper humbly only let me ask another question had i not a right to believe gratus in what he further told me as to the prisoners in cell number five yes it was thy duty to believe there were three prisoners in the cell prisoners of state blind and without tongues well said the keeper that was not true either no said the tribune with returning interest 
hear and judge for yourself o tribune as required i visited all the cells beginning with those on the first floor and ending with those on the lower the order that the door of number five should not be opened had been respected through all the eight years food and drink for three men had been passed through a hole in the wall i went to the door yesterday curious to see the wretches who against all expectation had lived so long the locks refused the key we pulled a little and the door fell down rusted from its hinges going in i found but one man old blind tongueless and naked his hair dropped in stiffened mats below his waist his skin was like the parchment there he held his hands out and the fingernails curled and twisted like the claws of a bird i asked him where his companions were he shook his head in denial thinking to find the others we searched the cell the floor was dry so were the walls if three men had been shut in there and two of them had died at least their bones would have endured wherefore thou thinkest i think o tribune there has been but one prisoner there in the eight years the chief regarded the keeper sharply and said have a care thou art more than saying valerius lied gessius bowed but said he might have been mistaken no he was right said the tribune warmly by thine own statement he was right didst thou not say but now that for eight years food and drink have been furnished three men the bystanders approved the shrewdness of their chief yet gessius did not seem discomfited you have but half the story o tribune when you have it all you will agree with me you know what i did with the man that i sent him to the bath and had him shorn and clothed and then took him to the gate of the tower and bade him go free i washed my hands of him to-day he came back and was brought to me by signs and tears he at last made me understand he wished to return to his cell and i so ordered as they were leading him off he broke away and kissed my feet and by piteous dumb imploration insisted i should go with him and i went the mystery of the three men stayed in my mind i was not satisfied about it now i am glad i yielded to his entreaty the whole company at this point became very still when we were in the cell again and the prisoner knew it he caught my hand eagerly and led me to a hole like that through which we were accustomed to pass him his food though large enough to push your helmet through it escaped me yesterday still holding my hand he put his face to the hole and gave a beast-like cry a sound came faintly back i was astonished and drew him away and called out ho there at first there was no answer i called again and received back these words be thou praised o lord yet more astonishing o tribune the voice was a woman's and i asked who are you and had reply a woman of israel entombed here with her daughter help us quickly or we die i told them to be of cheer and hurried here to know your will the tribune arose hastily thou wert right jasius he said and i see now the map was a lie and so was the tale of the three men there have been better romans than valerius gratus yes said the keeper i gleaned from the prisoner that he had regularly given the women of the food and drink he had received it is accounted for replied the tribune and observing the countenances of his friends and reflecting how well it would be to have witnesses he added let us rescue the women come all gesuis was pleased we will have to pierce the wall he said i found where a door had been but it was filled solidly with stones and mortar the tribune stayed to say to a clerk send workmen after me with tools make haste but hold the report for i see it will have to be corrected in a short time they were gone end of chapter one book sixth chapter two of ben-hur by lou wallace this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2 A woman of Israel, entombed here with her daughter, help us quickly or we die. Such was the reply Gessius, the keeper, had from the cell which appears on his amended map as six. The reader, when he observed the answer, knew who the unfortunates were, and doubtless said to himself, At last the mother of Ben-Hur and Terza, his sister. And so it was. The morning of their seizure, eight years before, they had been carried to the tower, where Gratus proposed to put them out of the way. He had chosen the tower for the purpose as more immediately in his own keeping, and cell six, because first it could be better lost than any other, and secondly, it was infected with leprosy, for these prisoners were not merely to be put in a safe place, but in a place to die. They were, accordingly, taken down by slaves in the night time, when there were no witnesses of the deed, then, in completion of the savage task, the same slaves walled up the door, after which they themselves separated, and sent away never to be heard of more. To save accusation, and in the event of discovery, to leave himself such justification as might be allowed in distinction between the infliction of a punishment and the commission of a double murder, Gratus preferred sinking his victims where natural death was certain, though slow. That they might linger along, he selected a convict who had been made blind and tongueless, and sank him in the only connecting cell, there to serve them with food and drink. Under no circumstances could the poor wretch tell the tale or identify either the prisoners or their doomsmen. So, with a cunning partly due to Masala the Roman, under color of punishing a brood of assassins, smoothed a path to confiscation of the estate of the hers, of which no portion ever reached the imperial coffers. At the last step in the scheme, Gratu summarily removed the old keeper of the prisons, not because he knew what had been done, for he did not, but because, knowing the underground floors as he did, it would be next to impossible to keep the transaction from him. Then, with masterly ingenuity, the procurator had new maps drawn for delivery to a new keeper, with the omission, as we have seen, of cell 6. The instructions given the latter, taken with the omission on the map, accomplished the design. The cell and its unhappy tenants were all alike lost. What may be thought of the life of the mother and daughter during the eight years must have relation to their culture and previous habits. Conditions are pleasant or grievous to us according to our sensibilities. It is not extreme to say, if there is a sudden exit of all men from the world, heaven as prefigured in the Christian idea, would not be a heaven to the majority. On the other hand, neither would all suffer equally in the so-called tophet. Cultivation has its balances. As the mind is made intelligent, the capacity of the soul for pure enjoyment is proportionally increased. Well, therefore, if it be saved. If lost, however, alas that it ever had cultivation. Its capacity for enjoyment in the one case is the measure of its capacity to suffer in the other. Wherefore repentance must be something more than mere remorse for sins. It comprehends a change of nature befitting heaven. We repeat, to form an adequate idea of the suffering endured by the mother of Ben-Hur, the reader must think of her spirit and its sensibilities as much as, if not more than, of the conditions of the immurement. The question being, not what the conditions were, but how she was affected by them. And now we may be permitted to say it was in anticipation of this thought that the scene in the summer house on the roof of the family palace was given so fully in the beginning of the second book of our story. So, too, to be helpful when the inquiry should come up, we ventured the elaborate description of the palace of the hers. In other words, let the serene, happy, luxurious life in the princely house be recalled and contrasted with his existence in the lower dungeon of the Tower of Antonia. Then, if the reader, in his effort to realize the misery of this woman, persists in mere reference to conditions physical, he cannot go amiss, as he is a lover of his kind, tender of heart, and he will be melted with much symphony. But will he go further? Will he more than sympathize with her? Will he share her agony of mind and spirit? Will he at least try to measure it? Let him recall her as she discoursed to her son of God and nations and heroes, one moment a philosopher, the next a teacher, and all the time a mother. Would you hurt a man keenest, strike at his self-love? Would you hurt a woman worst, aim at her affections? With a quickened remembrance of these unfortunates, remembrance of them as they were, let us go down and see them as they are. The cell six was in form as Gessius drew it on his map. Of his dimensions, but little idea can be had, and enough that it was a roomy, roughened interior with ledged and broken walls and floor. In the beginning, the site of the Macedonian castle was separated from the site of the temple by a narrow but deep cliff somewhat in the shape of a wedge. 
The workmen, wishing to hew out a series of chambers, made their entry in the north face of the cleft, and worked in, leaving a ceiling of the natural stone. Delving farther, they executed the cells five, four, three, two, one, with no connection with number six except through number five. In like manner, they constructed the passage and stairs to the floor above. The process of the work was precisely that resorted to in carving out the tombs of the kings, yet to be seen a short distance north of Jerusalem, only when the cutting was done, cell six was enclosed on its outer side by a wall of prodigious stones, in which, for ventilation, narrow apertures were left beveled like modern portholes. Herod, when he took hold of the temple and tower, put a face in yet more massive upon this outer wall, and shut up all the apertures but one, which yet admitted a little vitalizing air, an array of light not nearly strong enough to redeem the room from darkness. Such was cell six. Startle not now. The description of the blind and tongueless wretch just liberated from cell five may be accepted to break the horror of what is coming. The two women are grouped close by the aperture. One is seated, the other is half reclining against her. There is nothing between them and the bare rock. The light slanting upwards strikes them with ghastly effect, and we cannot avoid seeing they are without vesture or covering. At the same time, we are helped to the knowledge that love is there yet, for the two are in each other's arms. Riches take wings, comforts vanish, hope withers away, but love stays with us. Love is God. Where the two are thus grouped, the stony floor is polished shining smooth. Who shall say how much of the eight years they have spent in that space there in front of the aperture, nursing their hope of rescue by that timid yet friendly ray of light? When the brightness came creeping in, they knew it was dawn. When it began to fade, they knew the world was hushing for the night, which could not be anywhere so long as utterly dark as with them. The world, through that crevice, as if it were broad and high as a king's gate, they went to the world in thought, and passed the weary time going up and down as spirits go, looking and asking, the one for her son, the other for her brother. On the seas they sought him, and on the islands of the seas. Today he was in this city, tomorrow in that other, and everywhere, and at all times, he was a flitting sojourner for as they lived waiting for him, he lived looking for them. How often their thoughts passed each other in the endless search, his coming, theirs going. It was such sweet flattery for them to say to each other, While he lives, we shall not be forgotten. As long as he remembers us, there is hope. The strength one can eke from little, who knows till he has been subjected to the trial. Our recollections of them in former days enjoin us to be respectful, their sorrows clothe them with sanctity. Without going too near across the dungeon, we see they have undergone a change of appearance not to be accounted for by time or long confinement. The mother was beautiful as a woman, the daughter beautiful as a child, not even love could say so much now. Their hair is long, unkempt, and strangely white. They make us shrink and shudder with an indefinable repulsion. Though the effect may be from an illusory glozing of the light glimmering dismally through the unhealthy murk, or they may be enduring the tortures of hunger and thirst, not having had to eat or drink since their servant, the convict, was taken away, that is, since yesterday. Terza, reclining against her mother in half-embrace, moans piteously. Be quiet, Isa. They will come. God is good. We have been mindful of him, and forgotten not to pray at every sounding of the trumpets over in the temple. The light, you see, is still bright. The sun is standing in the south sky yet, and it is hardly more than the seventh hour. Somebody will come to us. Let us have faith. God is good. Thus the mother. The words were simple and effective, although eight years being now to be added to the thirteen she had attained when we last saw her, Terza was no longer a child. I will try and be strong, mother, she said. Your suffering must be as great as mine, and I do so want to live for you and my brother but my tongue burns, my lips scorch. I wonder where he is, and if he will ever, ever find us. There is something in the voices that strikes us singularly, an unexpected tone, sharp, dry, metallic, unnatural. The mother draws the daughter closer to her breast and says, I dreamed about him last night, and saw him as plainly, dear sir, as I see you. We must believe in dreams, you know, because our fathers did. The Lord spoke to them so often in that way. I thought we were in the woman's court just before the gate beautiful. There were many women with us, and he came and stood in the shade of the gate, and looked here and there, at this one and that. My heart beat strong. I knew he was looking for us, and stretched my arms to him, and ran, calling him. He heard me and saw me, but he did not know me. In a moment he was gone. Would it not be so, mother, if we were to meet him in fact? We are so changed. 
It might be so, but... The mother's head droops, and her face knits as with a wrench of pain. Recovering, however, she goes on. But we could make ourselves known to him. Terza tossed her arms and moaned again. Water, mother, water, though but a drop. The mother stares around in blank helplessness. She has named God so often, and so often promised in his name, the repetition is beginning to have a mocking effect upon herself. A shadow passes before her dimming the dim light, and she is brought down to think of death as very near, waiting to come in as her faith goes out. Hardly knowing what she does, speaking aimlessly, because speak she must, she says again, Patience, Tirsa. They are coming. They are almost here. She thought she heard a sound over by the little trap in the partition wall through which they had held all their actual communication with the world, and she was not mistaken. A moment, and the cry of the convict rang through the cell. Terza heard it also, and they both arose, still keeping hold of each other. Praise be the Lord for ever! exclaimed the mother, with the fervor of restored faith and hope. Ho oh, there! they heard next, and then. Who are you? The voice was strange. What matter? Except from Terza, they were the first and only words the mother had heard in eight years. The revulsion was mighty, from death to life, and so instantly. A woman of Israel, entombed here with her daughter. Help us quickly, or we die. Be of cheer, I will return. The woman sobbed aloud. They were found, help was coming. From wish to wish, hope flew as the twittering swallows fly. They were found, they would be released. And restoration would follow, restoration to all they had lost, home, society, property, son and brother. The scanty light glows to them with the glory of day, and forgetful of pain and thirst and hunger, and of the menace of death, they sank upon the floor and cried, keeping fast hold of each other the while. And this time they had not long to wait. Gessius the keeper told his tale methodically, but finished it at last. The tribune was prompt. Within there, he shouted through the trap. Here, yeah, said the mother, rising. Directly she heard another sound in another place, as of blows on the wall, blows quick, ringing, and delivered with iron tools. She did not speak, nor did Terza, but they listened, well knowing the meaning of it all, that a way to liberty was being made for them. So men, a long time buried in deep mines, hear the coming of rescuers, heralded by thrust of bar and beat of pick, and answer gratefully with heart throbs, their eyes fixed upon the spot whence the sounds proceed, and they cannot look away, lest the work should cease, and they be returned to despair. The arms outside were strong, the hands skillful, the will good. Each instant the blows sounded more plainly. Now and then a piece fell with a crash, and liberty came nearer and nearer. Presently the workmen could be heard speaking. Then, oh happiness, through a crevice flashed a red ray of torches, into the darkness inc incisive as diamond brilliance, beautiful as if from a spear of the morning. It is he, mother, it is he. He has found us at last, cried Terza with the quickened fancy of youth. But the mother answered meekly, God is good. A block fell inside, and another, then a great mass, and the door was open. A man grimed with mortar and stone dust stepped in, and stopped, holding a torch over his head. Two or three others followed with torches, and stood aside for the tribune to enter. Respect for women is not all a conventionality, for it is the best proof of their proper nature. The tribune stopped because they fled from him, not with fear, be it said, but shame, nor yet, O reader, from shame alone. From the obscurity of their partial hiding he heard these words, the saddest, most dreadful, most utterly despairing of the human tongue. Come not near us. Unclean. Unclean. The men flared their torches while they stared at each other. Unclean. Unclean. Came from the corner again, a slow tremulous wail exceedingly sorrowful. With such a cry we can imagine a spirit vanishing from the gates of paradise, looking back the while. So the widow and mother performed her duty, and in the moment realized that the freedom she had prayed for and dreamed of, fruit of scarlet and gold seen afar, was but an apple of Sodom in the hand. She and Terza were lepers. Possibly the reader does not know all the word means. Let him be told it with a reference to the law of that time, only a little modified in this. These four are accounted as dead, the blind, the leper, the poor, and the childless. Thus the Talmud. That is, to be a leper was to be treated as dead, to be excluded from the city as a corpse, to be spoken to by the best beloved and most loving only at a distance, to dwell with none but lepers, to be utterly unprivileged, to be denied the rights of the temple and the synagogue, to go about in rent garments and with covered mouth, except when crying, unclean, unclean, to find home in the wilderness or in abandoned tombs, to become a materialized specter of Hinnom and Gehenna, 
to be at all times less a living offence to others than a breathing torment to self, afraid to die, yet without hope except in death. Once she might not tell the day or the year, for down in the haunted hell even time was lost. Once the mother felt a dry scurf in the palm of her right hand, a trifle which she tried to wash away. It clung to the member pertinaciously, yet she thought but little of the sign till Terza complained that she too was attacked in the same way. The supply of water was scant, and they denied themselves drink that they might use it as a curative. At length the whole hand was attacked, the skin cracked open, the fingernails loosed from the flesh. There was not much pain with all chiefly a steadily increasing discomfort later their lips began to parch and seam one day the mother who was cleanly to godliness and struggled against the impurities of the dungeon with all ingenuity thinking the enemy was taking hold on terza's face led her to the light and looking with an inspiration of a terrible dread lo the young girl's eyebrows were white as snow oh the anguish of that assurance the mother sat a while speechless motionless paralyzed of soul incapable of but one thought leprosy leprosy when she began to think mother-like it was not of herself but her child and mother-like her natural tenderness turned to courage and she made ready for the last sacrifice of perfect heroism she buried her knowledge in her heart hopeless herself she redoubled her devotion to terza and with wonderful ingenuity wonderful chiefly in its very inexhaustibility continued to keep the daughter ignorant of what they were beset with and even hopeful that it was nothing she repeated her little games and retold her stories and invented new ones and listened with ever so much pleasure to the songs she would have from terza while on her own wasting lips the psalms of the singing king and their race served to bring soothing of forgetfulness and keep alive in them both the recollection of the god who had seemed to have abandoned them the world not more lightly or utterly slowly steadily with horrible certainty the disease spread after a while bleaching their heads white eating holes in their lips and eyelids and covering their bodies with scales then it fell to their throats shrilling their voices and to their joints hardening the tissues and cartilages slowly and as the mother well knew past remedy it was affecting their lungs and arteries and bones at each advance making the sufferers more and more loathsome and so it would continue till death which might be years before them Another day of dread at length came, the day the mother, under impulsion of duty, at last told Terza the name of their ailment, and the two, in agony of despair, prayed that the end might come quickly. Still, as is the force of habit, these so afflicted grew in time not merely to speak composedly of their disease, they beheld the hideous transformation of their persons as of course, and in despite clung to existence. One tie to earth remained to them, and mindful of their own loneliness, they kept up a certain spirit by talking and dreaming of Ben-Hur. The mother promised reunion with him to the sister, and she to the mother, not doubting either of them that he was equally faithful to them, and would be equally happy of the meeting. And with the spinning and re-spinning of this slender thread they found pleasure, and excused their not dying. In such manner as we have seen, they were solacing themselves the moment Gessius called them, at the end of twelve hours fasting and thirst. The tortures flashed redly through the dungeon, and liberty was come. "'God is good!' the widow cried not for what had been a reader but for what was in thankfulness for present mercy nothing so becomes us as losing sight of past ills the tribune came directly then in the corner to which she had fled suddenly a sense of duty smote the elder of the women and straightway the awful warning unclean unclean ah the pang of effort to acquit herself of that duty cost the mother not all the selfishness of joy over the prospect could keep her blind to the consequences of relief now that it was at hand the old happy life could never be again if she went near the house called home it would be to stop the gate and cry unclean unclean she must go about with the yearnings of love alive in her breast as strong as ever and more sensitive even because return in kind could not be the boy of whom she had con so constantly thought and with all sweet promises such as mothers find their purest delight in must at meeting her stand afar off if he held out his hands to her and called mother mother for very love of him she must answer unclean unclean and this other child before whom in want of other covering she was spreading her long tangled locks bleached unnaturally white ah that she was she must continue sole partner of her blasted remainder of life yet o oh reader the brave woman accepted the lot and took up the cry which had been its sign immemorially and which thenceforth word was to be her salutation without change unclean unclean the tribune heard it with a tremor but kept his place who are you he asked two women dying of hunger and thirst yet the mother did not falter 
come not near us, nor touch the floor or the wall. Unclean, unclean! Give me thy story, woman, thy name, and when thou wert put here, and by whom, and for what? There was once in the city of Jerusalem a prince Ben-Hur, the friend of all generous Romans, and who had Caesar for his friend. I am his widow, and this one with me is his child. How may I tell you for what we were sunk here, when I do not know, unless it was because we were rich? Valerius Gratus can tell you who our enemy was, and when our imprisonment began. I cannot. See to what we have been reduced. Oh, see, and have pity. The air was heavy with the pest and the smoke of the torches, yet the Roman called one of the torch-bearers to his side, and wrote the answer nearly word for word. It was terse and comprehensive, containing at once a history, an accusation, and a prayer. No common person could have made it, and he could not but pity and believe. Thou shalt have relief, woman, he said, closing the tablets. I will send thee food and drink. And raiment, and purifying water, we pray you, O generous Roman. As thou wilt, he replied. God is good, said the widow, sobbing. May his peace abide with you. And further, he added, I cannot see thee again. Make preparation, and to-night I will have thee taken to the gate of the tower, and set free. Thou knowest the law. Farewell. He spoke to the men, and went out the door. Very shortly some slaves came to the cell with a large gurglet of water, a basin and napkins, a platter with bread and meat, and some garments of women's wear, and setting them down within reach of the prisoners, they ran away. About the middle of the first watch, the two were conducted to the gate, and turned into the street. So the Roman quit himself of them, and in the city of their fathers they were once more free. Up to the stars, twinkling merrily as of old, they looked. Then they asked themselves, What next? And where to? End of chapter 2 Book Sixth, Chapter Three of Ben Hur by Lou Wallace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator read by Lydia. Chapter Three. About the hour, Gessius, the keeper, made his appearance before the tribune in the tower of Antonia. A footman was climbing the eastern face of Mount Olivet. The road was rough and dusty and vegetation on that side burned brown, for it was the dry season in Judea. Well for the traveller that he had youth and strength, not to speak of the cool flowing garments with which he was clothed. He proceeded slowly, looking often to his right and left, not with the vexed, anxious expression which marks a man going forward uncertain of the way, but rather the air with one approaches an old acquaintance after a long separation, half of pleasure, half of inquiry, as he were saying, I am glad to be with you again. Let me see in what you are changed." As he arose higher, he sometimes paused to look behind him over the gradually widening view, terminating in the mountains of Moab. But when at length he drew near the summit, he quickened his step, unmindful of fatigue, and hurried on without pause or turning of the face. On the summit, to reach which he bent his steps somewhat right of the beaten path, he came to a dead stop, arrested as if by a strong hand. Then one might have seen his, his eyes dilate, his cheeks flush, his breath quicken, effects all of one bright sweeping glance at what lay before him. The traveller, good reader, was no other than Ben-Hur, the spectacled Jerusalem. Not the holy city of today, but the holy city as left by Herod, the holy city of the Christ. Beautiful yet, as seen from old Olivet, what must it have been then? Ben-Hur betook him to a stone and sat down, stripping his head of the close white handkerchief which served it for a covering, made the survey at leisure. The same has been done often since by a great variety of persons, under circumstances su surpassingly singular, by the son of Vespasian, by the Islamite, by the Crusader, conquerors, all of them, by many a pilgrim from the great new world, which waited discovery nearly fifteen hundred years after the time of our story. But of the multitude, probably not one has taken that view with sensations more keenly poignant, more sadly sweet, more proudly bitter than Ben-Hur. He was stirred by recollections of his countrymen, their triumphs and vicissitudes, their history, the history of God. The city was of their building, at once a lasting testimony of their crimes and devotion, their weakness and genius, their religion and their irreligion. Though he had seen Rome to familiarity, he was gratified. The sight filled a measure of pride, which would have made him drunk with vainglory, but for the thought, princely as the property was, it did not any longer belong to his countrymen. 
The worship in the temple was by permission of strangers. The hill where David dwelt was a marbled sheet, an office in which the chosen of the Lord were rung and rung for taxes, and scourged for very deathlessness of faith. These, however, were pleasures and griefs of patriotism common to every Jew of the period. In addition, Ben-Hur brought with him a personal history, which would not out of mind for other consideration whatever, which the spectacle served only to freshen and vivify. A country of hills changes but little. Where the hills are of rock, it changes not at all. The scene Ben-Hur beheld is the same now, except as respects the city. The failure is in the handiwork of man alone. The sun dealt more kindly by the west side of Olivet than by the east, and men were certainly more loving towards it. The vines with which it was partially clad, and the sprinkling of trees, chiefly figs and old wild olives, were comparatively green. Down to the dry bed of the Cedron the verdure extended, a refreshment to the vision. There Olivet ceased, and Mariah began. A wall of bluff boldness, white as snow, founded by Solomon, completed by Herod. Up, up the wall the eye climbed course by course of the ponderous rocks composing it, up to Solomon's porch, which was as the pedestal of the monument, the hill being the plinth. Lingering there a moment, the eye resumed its climbing, going next to the Gentiles' court, then to the Israelites' court, then to the women's court, then to the court of the priests, each a pillared tier of white marble, one above the other in terraced retrocession. Over them all a crown of crowns, infinitely sacred, infinitely beautiful, Majestic in proportions, effulgent with beaten gold, lo, the tent, the tabernacle, the holy of holies. The ark was not there, but Jehovah was. In the faith of every child of Israel, he was there a personal presence. As a temple, as a monument, there was nowhere anything of a man's building to approach that superlative apparition. Now not a stone of it remains above another. Who shall rebuild that building? When shall the rebuilding be begun? So asks every pilgrim who has stood where Ben-Hur was. He asks, knowing the answer is in the bosom of God, whose secrets are not least marvelous in their well-keeping. And then the third question. What of him who foretold the ruin which has so certainly befallen? God or man of God? Or enough that the question is for us to answer. And still Ben-Hur's eyes climbed on and up up over the roof of the temple to the hill Zion, consecrated to sacred memories, inseparable from the anointed kings. He knew the cheesemonger valley dipped deep down between Moriah and Zion, that it was spanned by the Zistus, that there were gardens and palaces in its depths. But over them all his thoughts soared with his vision to the great grouping on the royal hill, the house of Caiaphas, the central synagogue, the Roman praetorium, Hippicus the Eternal, and the sad but mighty cenotaphs Phaisalus and Mariamne all relieved against Garab, purpling in the distance. And when midst them he singled out the palace of Herod, what could he but think of the king who was coming, to whom he himself was devoted, whose path he had undertaken to smooth, whose empty hands he dreamed of filling? And forward ran his fancy to the day the new king should come to claim his own and take possession of it, of Moriah and its temple, of Zion and its towers and palaces, of Antonia, frowning darkly there just to the right of the temple, of the new unwalled city of Bezetha, of the millions of Israel to assemble with palm branches and banners, to sing rejoicing because the Lord had conquered and given them the world. Men speak of dreaming as if it were a phenomenon of night and sleep. They should know better. All results achieved by us are self-promised, and all self-promises are made in dreams awake. Dreaming is the relief of labor, the wine that sustains us in act. We learn to love labor not for itself, but for the opportunity it furnishes for dreaming, which is the great under-monotone of real life, unheard, unnoticed because of its constancy. Living is dreaming. Only in the grave are there no dreams. Let no one smile at Ben-Hur for doing that which he himself would have done at that time and place under the same circumstances. The sun stooped low in its course. A while the flaring disk seemed to perch itself on the far summit of the mountains in the west, brazening all the sky above the city and rimming the walls and towers with the brightness of gold. Then it disappeared as with a plunge. The quiet turned Ben Purr's thought homeward. There was a point in the sky a little north of the peerless front of the Holy of Holies upon which he fixed his gaze. Under it, straight as a lead line would have dropped, lay his father's house, if yet the house endured. The mellowing influences of the evening mellowed his feelings, and putting his ambitions inside, he thought of the duty that was bringing him to, to Jerusalem. Out in the desert well with Ilderim, looking for strong places and acquainting himself with it generally, as a soldier studies a country in which he has projected a campaign, a messenger came one evening with the news that Gratus was removed, and Pontius Pilate set to take his place. 
Nisala was disabled and believed him dead. Gratus was powerless and gone. Why should Ben-Hur longer defer the search for his mother and sister? There was nothing to fear now. If he could not himself see into the prisons of Judea, he could examine them with the eyes of others. If the lost were found, Pilate could have no motive in holding them in custody, none at least which could not be overcome by purchase. If found, he would carry them to a place of safety, and then, in calmer mind, his conscience at rest, this one first duty done, he could give himself more entirely to the king who was coming. He resolved at once. That night he counseled with Ildrim and obtained his assent. Three Arabs came with him to Jericho, where he left them in the horses and proceeded alone and on foot. Malik was to meet him in Jerusalem. Then her scheme, be it observed, was, as yet, a generality. In view of the future, it was advisable to keep himself in hiding from the authorities, particularly the Romans. Malik was shrewd and trusty, the very man to charge with the conduct of the investigation. Where to begin was the first point. He had no clear idea about it. His wish was to commence with the Tower of Antonia. Tradition not of long standing planted the gloomy pile over a labyrinth of prison cells, which, more even than the strong garrison, kept it a terror to the Jewish fancy. A burial such as his people had been subjected to might be possible there. Besides, in such a strait, the natural inclination is to start search at the place where the loss occurred, and he could not forget that his last sight of the loved ones was, at the, was as the guard pushed them along in the street in the direction to the tower. If they were not there now, but had been, some record of the fact must remain, a clue which had only to be followed faithfully to the end. Under this inclination, moreover, there was a hope which he could not forgo. From Simonides he knew Amra, the Egyptian nurse, was living. It will be remembered, doubtless, that the faithful creature the morning the calamity overtook the hers broke from the guard and ran back into the palace, where, along with other chattels, she had been sealed up. During the years following, Simonides kept her supplied, so she was there now, so occupant of the great house, which, with all his offers, Gratus had not been able to sell. The story of its rightful owner sufficed to secure the property from strangers, whether purchasers or mere occupants. People going to and fro passed it with whispers. Its reputation was that of a haunted house, derived probably from the infrequent glances of poor old Amra, sometimes on the roof, sometimes in a latticed window. Certainly no more constant spirit ever abided than she, nor was she there ever a tenement so shunned and fitted for ghostly habitation. Now, if he could get to her, Ben-Hur fancied she could help him to knowledge which, though faint, might yet be serviceable. Anyhow, the sight of her in that place, so endeared by recollection, would be to him a pleasure next to finding the objects of his solicitude. So, first of all things, he would go to the old house and look for Amra. Thus resolved, he arose shortly after the going down of the sun, and began descent of the mount by the road, which from the summit bends a little north of the east. Down nearly at the foot, close by the bed of the Cedron, he came to the intersection with the road leading south to the village of Siloam and the pool of it that name. There he fell in with a herdsman driving some sheep to market. He spoke to the man and joined him, and in his company passed by Gethsemane on into the city through the fish gate. End of chapter 3「Book Sixth, Chapter Four of Ben Hur by Lou Wallace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Four It was dark when, parting with the drover inside the gate, Ben Hur turned into a narrow lane leading to the south. A few of the people whom he met saluted him. The bouldering of the pavement was rough. The houses on both sides were low, dark, and cheerless, the doors all closed. From the roofs, occasionally, he heard women crooning to children. The loneliness of his situation, the night, the uncertainty cloaking the object of his coming, all affected him cheerlessly. With feelings sinking lower and lower, he came directly to the deep reservoir now known as the Pool of Bethesda, in which the water reflecting the overpending sky. Looking up, he beheld the northern wall of the Tower of Antonia, a black frowning heap reared into the dim steel-gray sky. He halted, as if challenged by a threatening sentinel. The tower stood up so high and seemed so vast, resting apparently upon foundations so sure that he was constrained to acknowledge it, its strength. If his mother were there in living burial, what could he do for her? By the strong hand? Nothing. An army might beat the stony face with ballista and ram and be laughed at. Against him alone the gigantic southeast turret looked down in the self-containment of a hill. And he thought, 
cunning is so easily baffled and god always the last resort of the helpless god is sometimes so slow to act in doubt and misgiving he turned into the street in front of the tower and followed it slowly on to the west over in bezetha he knew there was a khan where it was his intention to seek lodging while in the city but just now he could not resist the impulse to go home his heart drew him that way the old formal salutation which he received from the few people who passed him had never sounded so pleasantly presently all the eastern sky began to silver and shine and objects before invisible in the west chiefly the tall towers on mount zion emerged as from a shadowy depth and put on spectral distinctness floating as it were above the yawning blackness of the valley below very castless in the air he came at length to his father's house of those who read this page some there will be to divine his feelings without prompting they are such as had happy homes in their youth no matter how far that have may been back in time homes which are now the starting points of all recollection paradises from which they went forth in tears and which they would now return to if they could as little children places of laughter and singing and associations dearer than any or all the triumphs of afterlife at the gate on the north side of the old house ben Hur stopped in the corners the wax used in the ceiling up was still plainly seen and across the valves was the board with the inscription this is the property of the emperor nobody had gone in or out of the gate since the dreadful day of the separation should he knock as of old it was useless he knew yet he could not resist the temptation amra might hear and look out of one of the windows on that side taking a stone he mounted the broad stone step and tapped three times a dull echo replied he tried again louder than before and again pausing each time to listen the silence was mocking retiring into the street he watched the windows but they too were lifeless the parapet on the roof was defined sharply against the brightening sky nothing could have stirred upon it unseen by him and nothing did stir from the north side he passed to the west where there were four windows which he watched long and anxiously but with as little effect at times his heart swelled with impotent wishes at others he trembled at the deceptions of his own fancy Amor made no sign not even a ghost stirred silently then he stole round to the south there too the gate was sealed and inscribed the mellow splendour of the august moon pouring over the crest of olivet since termed the mount of offence brought the lettering boldly out and he read and was filled with rage all he could do was to wrench the board from its nailing and hurl it into the ditch then he sat upon the step and prayed for the new king and that his coming might be hastened as his blood cooled insensibly he yielded to the fatigue of long travel in the summer heat and sank down lower and at last slept about that time two women came down the street from the direction of the tower of antonia approaching the palace of the hearse they advanced stealthily with timid steps pausing often to listen at the corner of the rugged pile one said to the other in a low voice this is it tirza and tirza after a look caught her mother's hand and leaned upon her heavily sobbing but silent let us go on my child because the mother hesitated and trembled then with an effort to be calm continued because when morning comes they will put us out of the gate of the city to return no more tirza sank almost to the stones oh, yes she said between sobs i forgot i had the feeling of going home but we are lepers and have no homes we belong to the dead the mother stooped and raised her tenderly saying we have nothing to fear let us go on indeed lifting their empty hands they could have run upon a legion and put it to flight and creeping in close to the rough wall they glided on like two ghosts till they came to the gate before which they also paused seeing the board they stepped upon the stone in the scarce cold tracks of ben Hur and read the inscription this is the property of the emperor then the mother clasped her hands and with upraised eyes moaned in unutterable anguish what now mother you scare me and the answer was presently oh tirsa the poor are dead he is dead who mother your brother they took everything from him everything even this house poor said tirza vacantly he will never be able to help us and then mother to-morrow to-morrow my child we must find a seat by the wayside and beg alms as the lepers do beg or tirza leaned upon her again and said whispering let us let us die no the mother said firmly the lord has appointed our times and we are believers in the lord we will wait on him even in this come away she caught tirza's hand as she spoke and hastened to the west corner of the house keeping close to the wall 
no one being in sight there they kept on to the next corner and shrank from the moonlight which lay exceedingly bright over the whole south front and along a part of the street the mother's will was strong casting one look back and up to the windows on the west side she stepped out into the light drawing terza after her and the extent of their affliction was then to be seen on their lips and cheeks in their bleared eyes in their cracked hands especially in the long snaky locks stiff with loathsome ichor and like their eyebrows ghastly white nor was it possible to have told which was mother which daughter both alike seemed witch-like old hist said the mother there is some one lying upon the step a man let us go round him they crossed to the opposite side of the street quickly and in the shade there moved on till before the gate where they stopped he is asleep tirsa the man was very still stay here and i will try the gate so saying the mother stole noiselessly across and ventured to touch the wicket she never knew if it yielded for at that moment the man sighed and turning restlessly shifted the handkerchief on his head in such a manner that the face was left upturned and fair in the broad moonlight she looked down at it and startled then looked again stooping a little and arose and clasped her hands and raised her eyes to heaven in mute appeal an instant so and she ran back to terza as the lord liveth the man is my son thy brother she said in an awe-inspiring whisper my brother judah the mother caught her hand eagerly come she said in the same enforced whisper let us look at him together once more only once then help thou thy servants lord they crossed the street in hand in hand ghostly quick ghostly still when their shadows fell upon him they stopped one of his hands was lying out upon the step palm up teresa fell upon her knees and would have kissed it but the mother drew her back not for thy life not for thy life unclean unclean she whispered teresa shrank from him as if he were the leprous one ben hur was handsome as the manly are his cheeks and forehead were swarthy from exposure to the desert sun and air yet under the light moustache the lips were red and the teeth shone white and the soft beard did not hide the full roundness of chin and throat how beautiful he appeared to the mother's eyes how mightily she yearned to put her arms about him and take his head upon her bosom and kiss him as had been her wont in his happy childhood where got she the strength to result the impulse from her love o reader her mother love which if thou wilt observe well hath this unlikeness to any other love tender to the object it can be infinitely tyrannical to itself and thence all power of self-sacrifice not for restoration to health and fortune not for any blessing of life not for life itself would she have left her leprous kiss upon his cheek yet touch him she must in that instant finding him she must renounce him for ever how bitter bitter hard it was lest some other mother say she knelt down and crawling to his feet touched the sole of one of his sandals with her lips yellow though it was with the dust of the street and touched it again and again and her very soul was in the kisses he stirred and tossed his hand they moved back but heard him mutter in his dream mother amra where is he fell off into the deep sleep terza stared wistfully the mother put her face in the dust struggling to suppress a sob so deep and strong it seemed her heart was bursting almost she wished he might waken he had asked for her she was not forgotten in his sleep he was thinking of her was it not enough presently mother beckoned to terza and they arose taking one more look as if to print his image past fading hand in hand they recrossed the street back in the shade of the wall there they retired and knelt looking at him waiting for him to wake waiting some revelation they knew not what nobody has yet given us a measure for the patience of a love like theirs by and by the sleep being yet upon him another woman appeared at the corner of the palace the two in the shade saw her plainly in the light a small figure much bent dark-skinned gray hair dressed neatly in servant's garb and carrying a basket full of vegetables at sight of the man upon the step the newcomer stopped then as if decided she walked on very lightly as she drew near the sleeper passing round him she went to the gate slid the wicket latch easily to one side and put her hand in the opening one of the broad boards in the left valve swung ajar without noise she put the basket through and was about to follow when yielding to curiosity she lingered to have one look at the stranger whose face was below her in open view the spectators across the street heard a low exclamation and saw the woman rub her eyes as if to renew their power bend closer down clasp her hands gaze wildly around look at the sleeper stoop and raise the outlying hand and kiss it fondly that which they wished so mightily to do but dared not awakened by the action ben hur instinctively withdrew the hand as he did so his eyes met the woman's amra oh amra is it thou he said 
The good heart made no answer in words, but fell upon his neck, crying for joy. Gently he put her arms away, and lifting the dark face, wet with tears, kissed it, his joy only a little less than hers. Then those across the way heard him say, Mother, Terza, O oh, Amra, tell me of them. Speak, speak, I pray thee. Amra only cried afresh. Thou hast seen them, Amra. Thou knowest where they are. Tell me they are at home. Terza moved, but her mother, divining her purpose, caught her and whispered, Do not go, not for life. Unclean, unclean. Her love was in tyrannical mood. Though both their hearts broke, he should not become what they were, and she conquered. Meantime, Amra, so entreated, only wept the more. Wert thou going in? he asked presently, seeing the board swung back. Come then, I will go with thee. He arose as he spoke. The Romans, be the curse of the Lord upon them. The Romans lied. The house is mine. Rise, Amra, and let us go in. A moment and they were gone, leaving the two in the shade to behold the gate staring blankly at them, the gate which they might not ever enter more. They nestled together in the dust. They had done their duty. Their love was proven. Next morning they were found and driven out to the city with stones. Be gone! You are of the dead! Go to the dead! With the doom ringing in their ears, they went forth. End of chapter 4《Book Six, Chapter Five of Ben Hur by Lou Wallace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Five. Nowadays, travelers in the Holy Land, looking for the famous place with the beautiful name, the King's Garden, descend the bed of the Cedron or the curve of the Gihon and Hinnom as far as the old well and Rogel, take a drink of the sweet living water, and stop, having reached the limit of the interesting in that direction. They look at the great stones with which the well is curved, ask its depth, smile at the primitive mode of drawing the purling treasure, and waste some pity on the ragged wretch who presides over it. Then, facing about, they are enraptured with the mounts Moriah and Zion, both of which slope towards them from the north, one terminating in Ophel, the other in what used to be the site of the city of David. In the background, up far in the sky, the garniture of the sacred places is visible. Here the harem, with its grateful dome, yonder the stalwart remains of Hippicus, defiant even in ruins. When that view has been enjoyed, and is sufficiently impressed upon the memory, the travellers glance at the Mount of Offence, standing in rugged stateliness at their right hand, then at the Hill of Evil Council over on the left, in which, if they be well up in scriptural history and in the traditions rabbinical and monkish, they will find a certain interest not to be overcome by superstitious horror. It were long to tell all the points of interest grouped about that hill. For the present purpose, enough that its feet are planted in the veritable orthodox hell of the moderns, the hell of brimstone and fire in the old nomenclature Gehenna, and that now, as in the days of Christ, its bluff face opposite the city on the south and southeast is seamed and pitted with tombs, which have been immemorially the dwelling places of lepers, not singly, but collectively. There they set up their government and established their society. There they founded a city and dwelt by themselves, avoided as the accursed of God. The second morning after the incidents of the preceding chapter, Amra drew near the well and Rogel and seated herself upon a stone. One familiar with Jerusalem, looking at her, would have said that she was the favorite servant of some well-to-do family. She brought with her a water jar and a basket, the contents of the latter covered with a snow-white napkin. Placing them on the ground at her side, she loosened the shawl which fell from her head, knit her fingers together in her lap, and gazed demurely up to where the hill dropped steeply down into the Aseldama and the potter's field. It was very early, and she was the first to arrive at the well. Soon, however, a man came bringing a rope and a leathern bucket. Saluting the little dark-faced woman, he undid the rope, fixed it to the bucket, and waited customers. Others who chose to do so might draw water for themselves. He was professional in the business and would fill the largest jar the stoutest woman could carry for a gara. Amber sat still and had nothing to say. Seeing the jar, the man asked after a while if she wished it filled. She answered him civilly, Not now. Whereupon he gave her no more attention. When the dawn was fairly defined over all of it, his patrons began to arrive, and he had all he could do to attend to them. All the time she kept her seat, looking intently up the hill. The sun made its appearance, yet she sat watching and waiting, and while she thus waits, let us see what her purpose is. Her custom had been to go to market after nightfall. Stealing out unobserved, she would seek the shops in the type Tyrapoin, or those over by the fish gate in the east, make her purchases of meat and vegetables, and return and shut herself up again. The pleasure she derived from the presence of Ben-Hur in the old house once more may be imagined. 
She had nothing to tell him of her mistress or Terza, nothing. He would have had her move to a place not so lonesome. She refused. She would have had him take his own room again, which was just as he had left it. But the danger of discovery was too great, and he wished above all things to avoid inquiry. He would come and see her as often as possible. Coming in the night, he would also go away in the night. She was compelled to be satisfied, and at once occupied herself contriving ways to make him happy. That he was a man da now did not occur to her, nor did it enter her mind that he might have put by or lost his boyish tastes. To please him, she thought to go on her old round of services. He used to be fond of confections. She remembered the things in that line which delighted him most, and resolved to make them and have a supply always ready when he came. Could anything be happier? So next night, earlier than usual, she stole out with her basket and went over to the fish gate market. Wandering about seeking the best honey, she chanced to hear a man telling a story. What the story was, the reader can arrive at with sufficient certainty when told that the narrator was one of the men who had held torches for the commandant of the Tower of Antonia when, down in cell six, the hers were found. The particulars of the finding were all told, and she heard them with the names of the prisoners and the widow's account of herself. The feelings with which Amra listened to the recital were such as became the devoted creature she was. She made her purchases and returned home in a dream. What a happiness she had in store for her boy. She had found his mother. She put the basket away, now laughing, now crying. Suddenly she stopped and thought. It would kill him to be told that his mother and Terza were lepers. He would go through the awful city over on the hill of evil counsel, into each infected tomb he would go without rest, asking for them, and the disease would catch him and their fate would be his. She wrung her hands. What should she do? Like many a one before her, and many a one since, she derived inspiration, if not wisdom, from her affection, and came to a singular conclusion. The lepers, she knew, were accustomed of mornings to come down from their sepulchral abodes in the hill and take a supply of water for the day from the well and rogel. Bringing their jars, they would set them on the ground and wait, standing afar until they were filled. To that the mistress and Terza must come, for the law was inexorable and admitted no distinction. A rich leper was no better than a poor one. So Amory decided not to speak to Ben-Hur of the story she had heard, but go alone to the well and wait. Hunger and thirst would drive the unfortunates thither, and she believed she could recognize them at sight. If not, they might recognize her. Meantime, Ben-Hur came, and they talked much. Tomorrow Malik would arrive, then the search should immediately begin. He was impatient to be about it. To amuse himself, he would visit the sacred places in the vicinity. The secret, we may be sure, weighed heavily on the woman, but she held her peace. When he was gone, she busied herself in the preparation of things good to eat, applying her utmost skill to the work. At the approach of day, as signaled by the stars, she filled a basket, selected a jar, and took the road to Enrogel, going out by the fish gate which was earliest open and arriving as we have seen. Shortly after sunrise, when business at the well was most pressing, and the drawer of water most hurried, when in fact half a dozen buckets were in use at the same time, everybody making haste to get away before the cool of the morning melted into the heat of the day, the tenantry of the hill began to appear and move about the doors of their tombs. Somewhat later they were discernible in groups, of which not a few children were so young that they suggested the holiest relation. Numbers came momentarily around the turn of the bluff, women with jars upon their shoulders, old and very feeble men hobbling along on staffs and crutches. Some leaned upon the shoulders of others, a few, the utterly helpless, lay like heaps of rags upon litters. Even that community of superlative sorrow had its love light to make life endurable and attractive. Distance softened without entirely veiling the misery of the outcasts. From her seat by the well, Amra kept watch upon the spectral groups. She scarcely moved. More than once she imagined she saw those she sought. That they were there upon the hill she had no doubt, that they must come down and near she knew. When the people at the well were all served, they would come. Now, quite at the base of the bluff, there was a tomb which had more than once attracted Amra by its wide gaping. A stone of large dimension stood near its mouth. The sun looked into it through the hottest hours of the day, and altogether it seemed uninhabitable by anything living, unless, perchance, by some wild dogs returning from scavenger duty down in Gehenna. Thence, however, and greatly to her surprise, the patient Egyptian beheld two women come, one half supporting, half leading the other. They were both white-haired, both looked old, but their garments were not rent, and they gazed about them as if the locality were new. The witness below thought she even saw them shrink terrified at the spectacle offered by the hideous assemblage of which they found themselves part. Slight reasons, certainly, to make her heart beat faster and draw her attention to them exclusively, but so they did. The two remained by the stone a while, then they moved slowly, painfully, and with much fear towards the well, 
whereat several voices were raised to stop them, yet they kept on. The drawer of water picked up some pebbles and made ready to drive them back. The company cursed them. The greater company on the hill shouted shrilly, Unclean! Unclean! Surely, thought Amra of the two as they kept coming, surely they are strangers to the usage of lepers. She arose and went to meet them, taking the basket and jar. The alarm at the well immediately subsided. <laughs> what a fool, said one laughing. What a fool to give good bread to the dead in that way. And to think of her coming so far, said another. I would at least make them meet me at the gate. Amra, with better impulse, proceeded. If she should be mistaken, her heart arose into her throat, and the farther she went, the more doubtful and confused she became. Four or five yards from where they stood waiting for her, she stopped. But the mistress she loved, whose hand she had so often kissed in gratitude, whose image of matronly loveliness she had treasured in memory so faithfully, and that the Terza she had nursed through babyhood, whose pain she had soothed, whose sport she had shared, that the smiling, sweet-faced, songful Terza, the light of the great house, the promised blessing of her old age, her mistress, her darling, they, the soul of the woman sickened at the sight. These are old women, she said to herself. I never saw them before. I will go back. She turned away. Amra, said one of the lepers. The Egyptian dropped the jar and looked back, trembling. Who called me? She asked. Amra. The servant's wondering eyes settled upon the speaker's face. Who are you? She cried. We are there you are seeking. Amra fell upon her knees. Oh, my mistress, my mistress, as I have made your God my God, be he praised that he has led me to you. And upon her knees the poor overwhelmed creature began moving forward. Stay, Amra, come not nearer, unclean, unclean. The words sufficed. Amra fell upon her face, sobbing so loud the people at the well heard her. Suddenly she arose upon her knees again. Oh, my mistress, where is Tirza? Here I am, Amra, here. Will you not bring me a little water? The habit of the servant renewed itself. Putting back the coarse hair fallen over her face, Amra arose and went to the basket and uncovered it. See, she said, here are bread and meat. She would have spread the napkin upon the ground, but the mistress spoke again. Do not so, Amra. Those yonder may stone you and refuse us drink. Leave the basket with me. Take up the jar and fill it and bring it here. We will carry them to the tomb with us. For this day you will then have rendered all the service that is lawful. Haste, Amra. The people under whose eyes all this had passed made way for the servant and even helped her fill the jar, so piteous was the grief her countenance showed. Who are they? A woman asked. Amra meekly answered. They used to be good to me. Raising the jar upon her shoulder, she hurried back. In forgetfulness she would have gone to them, but the cry, Unclean! Unclean! Beware! arrested her. Placing the water by the basket, she stepped back and stood off a little way. Thank you, Amra, said the mistress, taking the articles into possession. This is very good of you. Is there nothing more I can do? asked Amra. The mother's hand was upon the jar, and she was fevered with thirst, yet she paused and, rising, said firmly, Yes, I know that Judah has come home. I saw him at the gate night before last, asleep on the step. I saw you wake him. Amra clasped her hands. Oh, my mistress! You saw it and did not come. That would have been to kill him. I can never take him in my arms again. I can never kiss him more. Oh, Amra, Amra, you love him, I know. Yes, said the true heart, bursting into tears again and kneeling. I would die for him. Prove to me what you say, Amra. I am ready. Then you shall not tell him where we are, or that you have seen us. Only that, Amra. But he is looking for you. He has come from afar to find you. He must not find us. He shall not become what we are. Here, Amra, you shall serve us as you have this day. You shall bring us the little we need. Not long now, not long. You shall come every morning, and everything thus, and... and... The voice trembled, the strong will almost broke down. And you shall tell us of him, Amra. But to him you shall say nothing of us. Hear you. Oh, it will be so hard to hear him speak of you, and see him going about looking for you, to see all his love and not tell him so much as that you are alive. Can you tell him we are well, Amra? The servant bowed her head in her arms. No, the mistress continued. Wherefore to be silent altogether. Go now and come this evening. We will look for you. Till then, farewell. The burden will be heavy, O oh my mistress, and hard to bear. 
said Amra, falling upon her face. How much harder would it be to see him as we are? The mother answered as she gave the basket to Terza. Come again this evening, she repeated, taking up the water and starting for the tomb. Amra waited kneeling until they had disappeared. Then she took the road sorrowfully home. In the evening she returned. Thereafter it became her custom to serve them in the morning and evening, so that they wanted for nothing needful. The tomb, though ever so stony and desolate, was less cheerless than the cell in the tower had been. Daylight gilded its door, and it was in the beautiful world. Then one can wait death with so much more faith out under the open sky. End of chapter 5 Book Sixth, Chapter Six of Ben Hur by Lou Wallace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Six, the morning of the first day of the seventh month, Tishri in Hebrew, October in English. Ben Hur arose from his couch in the Khan, ill satisfied with the whole world. Little time had been lost in consultation upon the arrival of Malik. The latter began the search in the Tower of Antonia, and began it boldly, by a direct inquiry of the Tribune commanding. He gave the officer a history of the hers, and all the particulars of the accident to Gratus, describing the affair as wholly without criminality. The object of the quest now, he said, was if any of the unhappy family were discovered alive to carry a petition to the feet of Caesar, praying restitution of the estate and return to their civil rights. Such a petition, he had no doubt, would result in an investigation by the imperial order a proceeding of which the friends of the family had no fear. In reply, the tribune stated circumstantially to the discovery of the women in the tower, and permitted a reading of the memorandum he had taken of their account of themselves. When leave to copy it was prayed, he even permitted that. Malik thereupon hurried to Ben-Hur. It were useless to attempt description of the effect the terrible story had upon the young man. The pain was not relieved by tears or passionate outcries. It was too deep for any expression. He sat still a long time, with pallid face and laboring heart. Now and then, as if to show the thoughts which were most poignant, he muttered, Lepers? Lepers? They? My mother and Terza? They? Lepers? How long? How long, O oh Lord? One moment he was torn by a virtuous rage of sorrow, next by a longing for vengeance, which, it must be admitted, was scarcely less virtuous. At length he arose. I must look for them. They may be dying. Where will you look? asked Malik. There is but one place for them to go. Malik interposed and finally prevailed so far as to have the management of the further attempt entrusted to him. Together they went to the gate, over on the side opposite the hill of evil council, immemorially the leper's begging ground. There they stayed all day, giving alms, asking for the two women, and offering rich rewards for their discovery. So they did in repetition day after day, through the remainder of the fifth month and all the sixth. There was diligent scouring of the dread city on the hill by lepers to whom the rewards offered were mighty incentives, for they were only dead in law. Over and over again the gaping tomb down by the well was invaded, and its tenants subjected to inquiry, but they kept their secret fast. The result was failure, and now, the morning of the first day of the seventh month, the extent of the additional information gained was that not long before two leprous women had been stoned from the fish gate by authorities. A little pressing of the clue, together with some shrewd comparison of dates, led to the sad assurance that the sufferers were the hers, and left the old questions darker than ever. Where were they, and what had become of them? It was not enough that my people should be made lepers, said the son over and over again, with what intensity of bitterness the reader may imagine. That was not enough. Oh no, they must be stoned from their native city. My mother is dead, she has wandered to the wilderness, she is dead. Terza is dead, I alone am left, and for what? How long, O God, thou, Lord God of my fathers, how long shall this room endure? Angry, hopeless, vengeful, he entered the court of the Khan, and found it crowded with people who come in during the night. While he ate his breakfast, he listened to some of them. To one party he was specially attracted. They were mostly young, stout, active, hardy men, in manner and speech provincial. In their look, the certain indefinable air, the pose of the head, glance of the eye, there was a spirit which did not, as a rule, belong to the outward seeming of the lower orders of Jerusalem. The spirit thought by some to be a peculiarity of life in mountainous districts, but which may be more surely traced to a life of healthful freedom. In a short time, he ascertained they were Galileans, in the city for various purposes, but chiefly to take part in the Feast of Trumpets, set for that day. They became to him at once objects of interest, as hailing from the region 
in which he hoped to find readiest support in the work he was shortly to set about. While observing them, his mind running ahead and thought of achievements possible to a legion of such spirits disciplined after the severe Roman style, a man came into the court, his face much flushed, his eyes bright with excitement. Why are you here? he said to the Galileans. The rabbis and elders are going from the temple to see Pilate. Come, make haste, and let us go with him. They surrounded him in a moment. To see Pilate? For what? They have discovered a conspiracy. Pilate's new aqueduct is to be paid for with money of the temple. What, with the sacred treasure? They repeated the question to each other with flashing eyes. It is poor man, money of God. Let him touch a shekel of it if he dare. Come, cried the messenger. The procession is by this time across the bridge. The whole city is pouring after. We may be needed. Make haste. As if the thought and act were one, there was quick putting away of useless garments, and the party stood forth bareheaded, and in the short sleeveless under tunics they were used to wearing as reapers in the field and boatmen on the lake, the garb in which they climbed the hills following the herds and plucked the ripened vintage, careless of the sun. Lingering only to tighten their girdles, they said, We are ready. Then Ben-Hur spoke to them. Men of Galilee, I am a son of Judah. Will you take me in your company? We may have to fight, they replied. Oh, then, I will not be first to run away. They took the retort in good humor, and the messenger said, You seem stout enough. Come along. Ben-Hur put off his outer garments. You think there may be fighting? He asked quietly as he tightened his girdle. Yes. With whom? The guard. Legionaries? Whom else can a Roman trust? What have you to fight with? They looked at him silently. Well, he continued, We will have to do the best we can. Had we not better choose a leader? The legionaries always have one, and so are able to act with mine. The Galileans stared more curiously, as if the idea were new to them. Let us at least agree to stay together. Now I am ready, if you are. Yes, let us go. The Khan, it should not be forgotten, was in Bethesda, the new town, and to get to the Praetorium, as the Romans resonantly styled the Palace of Herod on Mount Zion, the party had to cross the lowlands north and west of the temple. By streets, if they may be called, so, trending north and south, with intersections hardly up the dignity of alleys, they passed rapidly round the acrid district to the Tower of Mariamne, from which the way was short to the grand gate of Wald Heights. In going, they overtook, or were overtaken by, people like themselves stirred to wrath by news of the proposed desecration. When, at length, they reached the gate of the Praetorium, the procession of elders and rabbis had passed in with a great following, leaving a greater crowd clamoring outside. A centurion kept the entrance with a guard drawn up, full armed under the beautiful marble battlements. The sun struck the soldiers fervently on helm and shield, but they kept their ranks indifferent alike to its dazzle and to the mouthings of the rabble. Through the open bronze gates, a current of citizens poured in, while a much lesser one poured out. What is going on? One of the Galileans asked an outcomer. Nothing, was the reply. The rabbis are before the door of the palace, asking to see Pilate. He has refused to come out. They have sent one to tell him they will not go away till he has heard them. They are waiting. Let us go in, said Ben-Hur in his quiet way, seeing what his companions probably did not, that there was not only a disagreement between the suitors and the governor, but an issue joined, and a serious question as to who should have his will. Inside the gate there was a row of trees and leaf, with seats under them. The people, whether going or coming, carefully avoided the shade cast gratefully upon the white, clean-swept pavement. For, strange as it may seem, a rabbinical ordinance— alleged to have been derived from the law permitted no green thing to be grown within the walls of jerusalem even the wise king it was said wanting a garden for his egyptian bride was constrained to found it down in the meeting place of the valleys above and rogel though the treetops shone the outer fronts of the palace turning to the right the party proceeded a short distance to a spacious square on the west side of which stood the residence of the governor an excited multitude filled the square. Every face was directed towards a portico built over a broad doorway which was closed. Under the portico there was another array of legionnaires. The throng was so close the friends could not have well advanced if such had been their desire. They remained, therefore, in the rear, observers of what was going on. About the portico they could see the high turbans of the rabbis, whose impatience communicated at times to the mass behind them. A cry was frequent to the effect, Pilate. If thou be a governor, come forth. Come forth. Once a man pushed through the crowd, his face red with anger. Israel is of no account here, he said in a loud voice. On this holy ground we are no better than dogs of Rome. Will he not come out, think you? 
Come, has he not thrice refused? What will the rabbis do? As at Caesarea, camp here till he gives them ear. He will not dare touch the treasure, will he? Asked one of the Galileans. Who can say? Did not a Roman profane the holy of holies? Is there anything sacred from Romans? An hour passed, and though Pilate deigned them no answer, the rabbis and the crowd remained. Noon came, bringing a shower from the west, but no change in the situation, except that the multitude was larger and much noisier, and feeling more decidedly angry. The shouting was almost continuous. Come forth, come forth! The cry was sometimes with disrespectful variations. Meanwhile, Ben-Hur held his Galilean friends together. He judged the pride of the Romans would eventually get the better of his discretion, and that the end could not be far off. Pilate was but waiting for the people to furnish him an excuse as resort to violence. And at last the end came. In the midst of the assemblage there was heard the sound of blows, succeeded instantly by yells of pain and rage, and a most furious commotion. The venerable men in front of the portico faced about aghast. The common people in the rear at first pushed forward. In the center, the effort was to get out, and for a short time the pressure of opposing forces was terrible. A thousand voices made inquiry, raised all at once. As no one had time to answer, the surprise speedily became a panic. Ben-Hur kept his senses. You cannot see? He said to one of the Galileans. No. I will raise you up. He caught the man about the middle and lifted him bodily. What is it? I see now, said the man. There are some armed with clubs, and they are beating the people. They are dressed like Jews. Who are they? Romans, as the Lord liveth. Romans in disguise. Their clubs fly like flails. There I saw a rabbi struck down, an old man. They spare nobody. Ben-Hur let the men down. Men of Galilee, he said. It is a trick of pilots. Now, will you do what I say? We will get even with the clubmen. The Galilean spirit arose. Yes! Yes, they answered. Let us go back to the trees by the gate, and we may find the planting of Herod, the unlawful, has some good in it after all. Come. They ran back all of them as fast as they could, and by throwing their united weight upon the limbs, tore them from the trunks. In a brief time they, too, were armed. Returning at the corner of the square, they met the crowd rushing madly from the gate. Behind, the clamor continued, a medley of shrieks, groans, and execrations. To the wall, Ben-Hur shouted to the wall and let the herd go by so clinging to the masonry at their right hand they escaped the might of the rush and little by little made headway until at last the square was reached keep together now and follow me by this time ben hur's leadership was perfect and as he pushed into the seething mob his party closed after him in a body and when the romans clubbing the people and make merry as they struck them down came hand to hand with the galileans lithe of limb either girl for the fray and equally armed they were in turn surprised then the shouting was close and fierce, the crash of sticks rapid and deadly, the advance furious as hate could make it. No one performed his part as well as Ben-Hur, whose training served him admirably, for not merely he knew to strike and guard. His long arm, perfect action, and incomparable strength helped him also to success in every encounter. He was at the same time fighting man and leader. The club he wielded was of goodly length and weighty, so he had need to strike a man but once. He seemed, moreover, to have eyes for each combat of his friends, and the faculty of being at the right moment exactly where he was most needed. In his fighting cry there were inspiration for his party and alarm for his enemies. Thus surprised and equally matched, the Romans at first retired, but finally turned their backs and fled to the portico. The impetuous Galileans would have pursued them to the steps, but Ben-Hur wisely restrained them. "'Stay, my men,' he said. The centurion yonder is coming with the guard. They have swords and shields. We cannot fight them. We have done well. Let us get back and out of the gate while we may. They obeyed him, though slowly, for they had frequently to step over their countrymen lying where they had been felled, some writhing and groaning, some praying for help, others mute as the dead. But the fallen were not all Jews, and there was consolation. The centurion shouted to them as they went off. Ben-Hur laughed at him and replied in his own tongues, If we are dogs of Israel, you are jackals of Rome. Remain here, and we will come again. The Galileans cheered, and laughing went on. Outside the gate there was a multitude the like of which Ben-Hur had never seen, not even in the circus at Antioch. The housetops, the streets, the slope of the hill appeared densely covered with people wailing and praying. The air was filled with their cries and imprecations. The party were permitted to pass, without challenge by the outer guard. But hardly were they out before the centurion in charge of the portico appeared, and in the gateway called to Ben-Hur. Ho, oh, insolent! Art thou a Roman or a Jew? 
Ben-Hur answered, I am a son of Judah, born here. What wouldst thou with me? Stay and fight. Singly? As thou wilt. Ben-Hur laughed derisively. O oh, brave Roman, worthy son of the bastard Roman Joe, I have no arms. Thou shalt have mine, the centurion answered. I will borrow of the guard here. The people hearing the colloquy became silent, and from them the hush spread afar. But lately Ben-Hur had beaten a Roman under the eyes of Antioch on the farther east. Now, could he beat another one under the eyes of Jerusalem? The honor might be vastly profitable to the cause of the new king. He did not hesitate. Going frankly to the centurion, he said, I am willing. Lend me thy sword and shield. And the helm and breastplate? asked the Roman. Keep them. They might not fit me. The arms were as frankly delivered, and directly the centurion was ready. All this time the soldiers in rank close by the gate never moved, they simply listened. As to the multitude, only when the combatants advanced to begin the fight, the question sped from mouth to mouth. Who is he? And no one knew. Now the Roman supremacy in arms lay in three things, submission to discipline, the legionary formation of a battle, and a peculiar use of the short sword. In combat, they never struck or cut, from first to last they thrust, they advanced thrusting, they retired thrusting, and generally their aim was at a foeman's face. All this was well known to Ben-Hur. As they were about to engage, he said, I told thee I was the son of Judah, but I did not tell that I am Manista taught. Defend thyself. At the last word, Ben-Hur closed with his antagonist. A moment, standing foot to foot, they glared at each other over the rims of their embossed shields. Then the Roman pushed forward and fainted in underthrust. The Jew laughed at him. A thrust at the face was followed. The Jew stepped lightly to the left. Quick as the thrust was, the step was quicker. Under the lifted arm of the foe, he slid his shield, advancing it until the sword and sword arm were both caught on its upper surface. Another step, this time forward and left, and the man's whole right side was offered to the point. The centurion fell heavily on his breast, clanging the pavement, and Ben-Hur had won. With his foot upon the enemy's back, he raised his shield overhead after a gladiatorial custom and saluted the imperturbable soldiers by the gate. When the people realized the victory, they behaved like mad. On the houses as far as the Zistus, fast as the word could fly, they waved their shawls and handkerchiefs and shouted, and if he had consented, the Galileans would have carried Ben-Hur off upon their shoulders. To a petty officer who then advanced from the gate, he said, Thy comrade died like a soldier. I leave him undespoiled. Only his sword and shield are mine. With that, he walked away. Off a little, he spoke to the Galileans. Brethren, you have behaved well. Let us now separate, lest we be pursued. Meet me tonight at the Khan in Bethany. I have something to propose to you of great interest to Israel. Who are you? they asked him. A son of Judah, he answered simply. A throng eager to see him surged around the party. Will you come to Bethany? he asked. Yes, we will come. Then bring with you this sword and shield that I may know you. Pushing briskly through the increasing crowd, he speedily disappeared. At the instance of Pilate, the people went up from the city and carried off their dead and wounded, and there was much mourning for them, but the grief was greatly lightened by the victory of the unknown champion, who was everywhere sought and by everyone extolled. The fainting spirit of the nation was revived by the brave deed, insomuch as that in the streets and up the temple even, amidst the solemnities of the feast, old tales of the Maccabees were told again, and thousands shook their head whispering wisely. A little longer, only a little longer, brethren and Israel will come to her own. Let there be faith in the Lord, and patience. In such a manner, Ben-Hur obtained hold on Galilee, and paved the way to greater services in the cause of the king who was coming. And with what result, we shall see. End of chapter 6. End of book 6. Book 7, chapter 1 of Ben-Hur by Lou Wallace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrated by Rachel. Book Seventh. And waking, I beheld her there, sea dreaming in the moated air, a siren lithe and debonair, with wristlets woven of scarlet weeds, and oblong lucent amber beads of sea kelp shining in her hair. Thomas Bailey Aldrich Chapter 1 The meeting took place in the can of Bethany as appointed. Thence Ben-Hur went with the Galileans into their country, where his exploits up in the old marketplace gave him fame and influence. Before the winter was gone he raised three legions and organized them after the Roman pattern. 
He could have had as many more, for the martial spirit of that gallant people never slept. The proceeding, however, required careful guarding as against both Rome and Herod Antipas. Contenting himself for the present with the three, he strove to train and educate them for systematic action. For that purpose he carried the officers over into the lava beds of Traconitis, and taught them the use of arms, particularly the javelin and sword, and the manoeuvring peculiar to the legionary formation, after which he sent them home as teachers. And soon the training became a pastime of the people. As may be thought, the task called for patience, skill, zeal, faith, and devotion on his part, qualities into which the power of inspiring others in matters of difficulty is always resolvable, and never man possessed them in greater degree or used them to better effect. How he labored, and with utter denial of self, yet withal he would have failed but for the support he had from Simonides, who furnished him with arms and money, and from Ilderim, who kept watch and brought him supplies. And still he would have failed but for the genius of the Galileans. Under that name were comprehended the four tribes, Asher, Zebulun, Issachar, and Naphtali, and the districts originally set apart to them. The Jew born in sight of the temple despised these brethren of the north, but the Talmud itself has said, The Galilean loves honor, and the Jew money. Hating Rome fervidly as they loved their own country, in every revolt they were first in the field and last to leave it. One hundred and fifty thousand Galilean youths perished in the final war with Rome. For the great festal days they went up to Jerusalem marching and camping like armies, yet they were liberal in sentiment and even tolerant to heathenism. In Herod's beautiful cities, which were Roman in all things, in Sephorus and Tiberius especially, they took pride, and in the building gave them loyal support. They had for fellow citizens men from the outside world everywhere, and lived in peace with them. To the glory of the Hebrew name they contributed poets like the singer of the Song of Songs and prophets like Hosea. Upon such a people, so quick, so proud, so brave, so devoted, so imaginative, a tale like that of the coming of the king was all-powerful. That he was coming to put Rome down would have been sufficient to enlist them in the scheme proposed by Ben-Hur. But when, besides, they were assured he was to rule the world, more mighty than Caesar, more magnificent than Solomon, and that the rule was to last for ever, the appeal was irresistible, and they vowed themselves to the cause body and soul. They asked Ben-Hur his authority for the sayings, and he quoted the prophets and told them of Balthazar in waiting over in Antioch, and they were satisfied, for it was the old much-loved legend of the Messiah, familiar to them almost as the name of the Lord, the long-cherished dream with a time fixed for its realization. The king was not merely coming now, he was at hand. So with Ben-Hur the winter months rolled by, and spring came, with gladdening showers blown over from the summering sea in the west, and by that time so earnestly and successfully had he toiled, that he could say to himself and his followers, Let the good king come. He has only to tell us where he will have his throne set up. We have the sword hands to keep it for him. And in all his dealings with the many men they knew him only as a son of Judah, and by that name. One evening, over in Trachonitis, Ben-Hur was sitting with some of his Galileans at the mouth of the cave in which he quartered, when an Arab courier rode to him and delivered a letter. Breaking the package, he read, Jerusalem, Nissan four. A prophet has appeared who men say is Elias. He has been in the wilderness for years, and to our eyes he is a prophet, and such also is his speech the burden of which is one much greater than himself, who, he says, is to come presently, and for whom he is now waiting on the eastern shore of the river Jordan. I have been to see and hear him, and the one he is waiting for is certainly the king you are awaiting. Come and judge for yourself. All Jerusalem is going out to the prophet, and with many people else the shore on which he abides is like Mount Olivet in the last days of the Passover. Malok. Ben-Hur's face flushed with joy. By this word, O oh my friends, he said, by this word our waiting is at an end. The herald of the king has appeared and announced him. Upon hearing the letter read, they also rejoiced at the promise it held out. Get ready now, he added. 
and in the morning set your faces homeward when arrived there send word to those under you and bid them be ready to assemble as i may direct for myself and you i will go see if the king be indeed at hand and send you a report let us in the meantime live in the pleasure of promise going into the cave he addressed a letter to ilderim and another to simonides giving notice of the news received and of his purpose to go up immediately to jerusalem the letters he dispatched by swift messengers when night fell and the stars of direction came out he mounted and with an arab guide set out for the jordan intending to strike the track of the caravans between rabath ammon and damascus the guide was sure and aldebaran swift so by midnight the two were out of the lava fastness speeding southward end of chapter one Book Seventh, Chapter Two of Ben Hur by Lou Wallace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Two. It was Ben Hur's purpose to turn aside at the break of day and find a safe place in which to rest, but the dawn overtook him while out in the desert, and he kept on. The guide promising to bring him after a while to a vale shut in by great rocks where there were a spring some mulberry trees and herbage in plenty for the horses as he rode thinking of the wondrous events so soon to happen and of the changes they were to bring about in the affairs of men and nations the guide ever on the alert called attention to an appearance of strangers behind them everywhere around the desert stretched away in waves of sand slowly yellowing in the growing light and without any green thing visible over on the left, but still far off, a range of low mountains extended, apparently interminable. In the vacancy of such a waste, an object in motion could not long continue a mystery. "'It's a camel with riders,' the guide said, directly. "'Are there others behind?' said Ben-Hur. "'It's a lump. No, there's a man on horseback. Um, the driver. Probably.' A little later Ben-Hur himself could see the camel was white and unusually large, reminding him of the wonderful animal he had seen bring Balthazar and Iris to the fountain in the grove of Daphne. There could be no other like it. Thinking then of the fair Egyptian, insensibly his gait became slower, and at length fell into the merest loiter, until finally he could discern a curtained howdah, and two persons seated within it. If they were Balthasar and Iris— should he make himself known to them? But it could not be. This was the desert, and they were alone. But while he debated the question, the long swinging stride of the camel brought its riders up to him. He heard the ringing of the tiny bells, and beheld the rich housings which had been so attractive to the crowd of the Castalian fount. He beheld also the Ethiopian, always attendant upon the Egyptians. The tall brute stopped close by his horse, and Ben-Hur, looking up, Lo, Iris herself, under the raised curtain, looking down at him, her great swimming eyes bright with astonishment and inquiry. "'The blessing of the true God upon you,' said Balthasar, in his tremulous voice. "'And to thee and thine be the peace of the Lord,' Ben-Hur replied. "'My eyes are weak with years,' said Balthasar. "'But they approve you, that son of her, whom lately I knew an honoured guest in the tent of Ilderim the Generous.' And thou art that Balthazar, the wise Egyptian, whose speech concerning certain holy things in expectation is having so much to do with the finding me in this waste place. What dost thou hear? He is never alone who is where God is, and God is everywhere. Balthazar answered gravely. But in the sense of your asking, there is a caravan short way behind us going to Alexandria, and as it is to pass through Jerusalem, I thought best to avail myself of its company as far as the holy city, whither I am journeying. This morning, however, in discontent with its slow movement, slower because of a Roman cohort in attendance upon it, we rose early and ventured thus far in advance. As to robbers along the way, we are not afraid, for I have here a signet of Sheik Iram. Against beasts of prey, God is our sufficient trust. Ben-Hur bowed and said, the good sheik's signet is a safeguard wherever the wilderness extends and the lion shall be swift that overtakes the king of his kind he patted the neck of the camel as he spoke yet 
said Iris, with a smile which was not lost upon the youth, whose eyes, it must be omitted, had several times turned to her during the interchange of speeches with the elder. Yet even he would be better if his fast were broken. Kings have hunger and headaches. If you be, indeed, the Ben-Hur of whom my father has spoken, and whom it was my pleasure to have known as well, you will be happy, I am sure, to show us some near path to living water, that with its sparkle we may grace a morning's meal in the desert. Ben-Hur, nothing loath, hastened to answer. Fair Egyptian, I give you sympathy. Can you bear suffering a little longer? We will find the spring you ask for, and I promise that its draught shall be as sweet and cooling as that of the more famous Castalia. With leave we will make haste. I give you the blessing of the thirsty, she replied, and offer you in return a bit of bread from the city ovens, dipped in fresh butter from the dewy meadows of Damascus. A most rare favor, let us go. So saying, Ben-Hur rode forward with the guide, one of the inconveniences of travelling with camels being that it is necessarily an interdiction of polite conversation. After a while the party came to a shallow wadi, down which, turning to the right hand, the guide led them. The bed of the cut was somewhat soft from recent rains, and quite bold in its descent. Momentarily, however, it widened, and ere long the sides became bluffs ribbed with rocks much scarred, by floods rushing to lower depths ahead. Finally, from a narrow passage, the travellers entered a spreading vale which was very delightful, but come upon suddenly from the yellow, unrelieved, verdureless plain it had the effect of a freshly discovered paradise. The water channels winding here and there, definable by crisp white shingling, appeared like threads tangled among islands green with grasses and fringed with reeds. Up from the final depths of the valley of Jordan some venturous Olanders had crept, and with their large bloom now stirred the sunken place. One palm tree arose in royal assertion. The bases of the boundary walls were cloaked with clambering vines, and under a leaning cliff on the left the mulberry grove had planted itself, proclaiming the spring which the party were seeking, and thither the guide conducted them, careless of whistling partridges, and lesser birds of brighter hues roused whirring from the reedy coverts. The water started from a crack in the cliff which some loving hand had enlarged into an arched cavity. Graven over it in bold Hebraic letters was the word God. The graver had no doubt drunk there, and tarried many days, and given thanks in that durable form. From the arch the stream ran merrily over a flag spotted with bright moss and leaped into a pool glassy clear, Thence it stole away between grassy banks, nursing the trees before it vanished in the thirsty sand. A few narrow paths were noticeable about the margin of the pool, otherwise the space around was untrodden turf, at sight of which the guide was assured of rest free from intrusion by men. The horses were presently turned loose, and from the kneeling camel the Ethiopian assisted Balthasar and Iris, whereupon the old man, turning his face to the east, crossed his hands reverently upon his breast and prayed. "'Bring me a cup,' Iris said, with some impatience. From the howdah the slave brought her a crystal goblet, then she said to Ben-Hur, "'I will be your servant at the fountain.' They walked to the pool together. He would have dipped the water for her, but she refused his offer, and, kneeling, held the cup to be filled by the stream itself, nor yet content when it was cooled and overrunning. She tendered him the first draught. "'No.' he said, putting the graceful hand aside and seeing only the large eyes half hidden beneath the arches of the upraised brows. "'Be the service mine, I pray.' She persisted in having her way. "'In my country, O son of her, we have a saying, "'Better a cup-bearer to the fortunate than minister to a king.' "'Fortunate?' he said. There were both surprise and inquiry in the tone of his voice and in his look, and she said quickly, the gods give us success as a sign by which we may know them on our side. Were you not winner in the circus? His cheeks began to flush. That was one sign. There is another. In a combat with swords you slew a Roman. The flush deepened not so much for the triumphs themselves as the flattery there was in the thought that she had followed his career with interest. A moment, and the pleasure was succeeded by a reflection. The combat, he knew, was matter of report throughout the East. But the name of the victor had been committed to a very few, Maluch, Ilderim, and Simonides. Could they have made a confidant of the woman? So with wonder and gratification he was confused, and seeing it she arose and said, holding the cup over the pool, O gods of Egypt, I give thanks for a hero discovered, 
thanks that the victim in the palace of Idarney was not my king of men. And so, O holy gods, I pour and drink. Part of the contents of the cup she returned to the stream. The rest she drank. When she took the crystal from her lips she laughed at him. O oh, son of her, is it the fashion of the very brave to be so easily overcome by a woman? Take the cup now and see if you cannot find a happy word in it for me. He took the cup and stooped to refill it. A son of Israel has no gods who, whom he can lie bait, he said, playing with the water to hide his amazement now greater than before. What more did the Egyptian know about him? Had she been told of his relations with Simonides? And there was the treaty with Ilderim. Had she knowledge of that also? He was struck with mistrust. Somebody had betrayed his secrets, and they were serious. And besides, he was going to Jerusalem. Just then, of all the world, the place where such intelligence possessed by an enemy might be most dangerous to him, his associates, and the cause. But was she an enemy? It is well for us that, while writing is slow, thought is instantaneous. When the cup was fairly cooled, he filled it and arose, saying, with indifference well affected, Most fair, were I an Egyptian, or a Greek, or a Roman, I would say. He raised the goblet overhead as he spoke. O oh, ye better God, I give thanks that there are yet left to the world, despite its wrongs and sufferings, the charm and beauty, and the solace of love, and I drink to her who best represents them, to Eras, loveliest of the daughters of the Nile. She laid her hand softly upon his shoulder. You have offended against the law. The gods to which you have drunk are false gods. Why shall I not tell the rabbis on you? Oh, he replied, laughing. That is very little to tell for one who knows so much else that is really important. I will go further. I will go to the little Jewess who makes the roses grow and the shadows flame in the house of the great merchant over in Antioch. To the rabbis I will accuse you of impenitence. To her. Well, to her? I will repeat what you have said to me under the lifted cups with the gods for witnesses. He was still a moment as if waiting for the Egyptian to go on. With quickened fancy he saw Esther at her father's side, listening to the dispatches he had forwarded, sometimes reading them. In her presence he had told Simonides the story of the affair in the palace of Idarne. She and Iris were acquainted. This one was shrewd and worldly, the other was simple and affectionate, and therefore easily won. Simonides could not have broken faith, nor Elderim, for if not held by honour there was no one, unless it might be himself to whom the consequences of exposure were more serious and certain. Could Esther have been the Egyptian's informant? He did not accuse her, yet a suspicion was sown with the thought, and suspicions, as we all know, are weeds of the mind which grow of themselves, and most rapidly when least wanted. Before he could answer the allusion to the little Jewess, Balthazar came to the pool. We are greatly indebted to you, son of her, he said in his grave manner. This veil is very beautiful. The grass, the trees, the shade, invite us to stay and rest, and the spring here has a sparkle of diamonds in motion, and sings to me of a loving God. It is not enough to thank you for the enjoyment we find. Come, sit with us, and taste our bread. Suffer me first to serve you. With that Ben-Hur filled the goblet and gave it to Balthasar, who lifted his eyes in thanksgiving. Immediately the slave brought napkins, and after laving their hands and drying them, the three seated themselves in eastern style under the tent, which years before had served the wise men at the meeting in the desert. And they ate heartily of the good things taken from the camel's pack. End of chapter 2 Book 7, Chapter 3 of Ben-Hur by Lou Wallace This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3 The tent was cosily pitched beneath a tree where the gurgle of the stream was constantly in ear. Overhead the broad leaves hung motionless on their stems, the delicate reed stalks off in the pearly haze stood up arrowy straight, occasionally a home-returning bee shot humming athwart the shade, and a partridge creeping from the sedge drank, whistled to his mate, and ran away. The restfulness of the veil, the freshness of the air, the garden beauty, the Sabbath stillness, seemed to have affected the spirits of the elder Egyptian. His voice, gestures, and whole manner were unusually gentle, and, often as he bent his eyes upon Ben-Hur conversing with Iris, they softened with pity. "'When we overtook you, son of Hur,' he said at the conclusion of the repast, 
it seemed your face was also turned towards Jerusalem. May I ask, without offence, if you are going so far? I am going to the holy city. For the great need I have to spare myself prolonged toil, I will further ask you, is there a shorter road than that by Rabbath Ammon? A rougher route, but shorter, lies by Jerasa and Rabbath Gilead. It is the one I design taking. I am impatient, said Balthasar. Latterly my sleep has been visited by dreams, or rather by the same dream in repetition. A voice, it is nothing more, comes and tells me, Haste, arise, he whom thou hast so long awaited is at hand. You mean he that is to be king of the Jews? Then Hur asked, gazing at the Egyptian in wonder. Even so. Then you have heard nothing of him? Nothing, except the words of the voice in the dream. Here, then, are chidings to make you glad, as they made me. From his gown Ben-Hur drew the letter received from Malach. The hand the Egyptian held out trembled violently. He read aloud, and as he read his feelings increased, the limp veins in his neck swelled and throbbed. At the conclusion he raised his suffused eyes in thanksgiving and prayer. He asked no questions, yet had no doubts. Thou hast been very good to me, O God, he said. Give me, I pray thee, to see the Saviour again and worship him, and thy servant will be ready to go in peace. The words, the manner, the singular personality of the simple prayer touched Ben-Hur with a sensation new and abiding. God never seemed so actual and so nearby. It was as if he were there bending over them or sitting at their side, a friend whose favours were to be had by the most unceremonious asking, a father to whom all his children were alike in love father not more of the jew than of the gentile the universal father who needed no intermediates no rabbis no priests no teachers the idea that such a god might send mankind a saviour instead of a king appeared to ben-hur in a light not merely new but so plain that he could almost discern both the greater want of such a gift and its greater consistency with the nature of such a deity so he could not resist asking now that he has come, O Balthazar, you still think he is to be a saviour and not a king? Balthazar gave him a look thoughtful as it was tender. How shall I understand you? He asked in return. The spirit, which was the star that was my guide of old, has not appeared to me since I met you in the tent of the good sheik. That is to say, I have not seen or heard it as formerly. I believe the voice that spoke to me in my dreams was it. But other than that, I have no revelation. I will recall the difference between us, said Ben-Hur with deference. You were of opinion that he would be a king, but not as Caesar is. You thought his sovereignty would be spiritual, not of the world. Oh, yes, the Egyptian answered. And I am of the same opinion now. I see the divergence in our faith. You are going to meet a king of men, I, a savior of souls. He paused with the look often seen when people are struggling, with introverted effort to disentangle a thought which is either too high for quick discernment or too subtle for simple expression. Let me try, O son of her, he said directly, and help you to a clear understanding of my belief. Then it may be, seeing how the spiritual kingdom I expect him to set up can be more excellent in every sense than anything of mere Caesarian splendor, you will better understand the reason of the interest I take in the mysterious person we are going to welcome. I cannot tell you when the idea of a soul in every man had its origin. Most likely the first parents brought it with them out of the garden in which they had their first dwelling. We all do know, however, that it has never perished entirely out of mind. By some peoples it was lost, but not by all. In some ages it dulled and faded, in others it was overwhelmed with doubts. But in great goodness, God kept sending us at intervals mighty intellects to argue it back to faith and hope. Why should there be a soul in every man? Look, O son of her, for one moment look at the necessity of such a device. To lie down and die, and be no more, no more for ever? Time never was when man wished for such an end nor has the man ever been who did not in his heart promise himself something better. The monuments of the nations are all protests against nothingness after death. So are statues and inscriptions. So is history. The greatest of our Egyptian kings had his effigy cut out of a hill of solid rock. 
day after day he went with a host in chariots to see the work at last it was finished never effigy so grand so enduring it looked like him the features were his faithful even in expression now may we not think of him saying in that moment of pride let death come there is an afterlife for me he had his wish the statue was there yet but what is the afterlife he thus secured only a recollection by men a glory unsubstantial as moonshine on the brow of a great bust a story in stone nothing more meanwhile what has become of the king there is an embalmed body up in the royal tombs which once was his his effigy not so fair to look at as the other out in the desert but where o son of her where is the king himself has he fallen into nothingness two thousand years have gone since he was a man alive as you and i are was his last breath the end of him to say yes would be to accuse god let us rather accept his better plan of attaining life after death for us actual life i mean though something more than a place in mortal memory life with going and coming with sensation with knowledge with power and all appreciation life eternal in term though it may be with changes of condition ask you what god's plan is the gift of a soul to each of us at birth with this simple law there shall be no immortality except through the soul in that law see the necessity of which i spoke let us turn from the necessity now a word as to the pleasure there is in the thought of a soul in each of us in the first place it robs death of its terrors by making dying a change for the better and burial but the planting of a seed from which there will spring a new life in the next place behold me as i am weak weary old shrunken in body and graceless look at my wrinkled face think of my failing senses listen to my shrilled voice ah what happiness to me in the promise that when the tomb opens as soon it will to receive the worn-out husk i call myself the now viewless doors of the universe which is but the palace of god will swing wide ajar to receive me a liberated immortal soul i wish i could tell the ecstasy there must be in that life to come do not say i know nothing about it this much i know and it is enough for me the being a soul implies conditions of divine superiority in such a being there is no dust nor any gross thing it must be finer than air more impalpable than light purer than essence it is life in absolute purity what now o son of her knowing so much shall i dispute with myself or you about the unnecessaries about the form of my soul or where it is to abide or whether it eats and drinks or is it winged or wears this or that no it is more becoming to trust in god the beautiful in this world is all from his hand declaring the perfection of taste he is the author of all form he clothes the lily he colors the rose he distills the dewdrop he makes the music of nature in a word he organized us for this life and imposed its conditions and they are such guarantee to me that trustful as a little child i leave to him the organization of my soul and every arrangement for the life after death i know he loves me the good man stopped and drank and the hand carrying the cup to his lips trembled and both iris and ben hur shared his emotion and remained silent upon the latter a light was breaking he was beginning to see as never before that there might be a spiritual kingdom of more important to men than any earthly empire and that after all a saviour would indeed be a more godly gift than the greatest king i might ask you now said balthasar continuing whether this human life so troubled and brief is preferable to the perfect and everlasting life designed for the soul but take the question and think of it for yourself formulating thus supposing both to be equally happy is one hour more desirable than one year from that then advance to the final inquiry what are threescore and ten years on earth to all eternity with god by and by son of her thinking in such manner you will be filled with the meaning of the fact i present to you next to me the most amazing of all events and in its effects the most sorrowful it is that the very idea of life as a soul is a light almost gone out in the world here and there to be sure a philosopher may be found who will talk to you of a soul 
likening it to a principle. But because philosophers take nothing upon faith, they will not go the length of admitting a soul to be a being, and on that account its purpose is compressed darkness to them. Everything animate has a mind measurable by its wants. Is there to you no meaning in the singularity that power in full degree to speculate upon the future was given to man alone? By the sign as I see it, God meant to make us know ourselves created for another and a better life, such being in fact the greatest need of our nature. But alas, into what a habit the nations have fallen! They live for the day, as if the present were the all in all, and go about saying, There is no tomorrow after death, or if there be, since we know nothing about it, be it a care unto itself. So when death calls them, Come! They may not enter into the enjoyment of the glorious afterlife because of their unfitness. That is to say, the ultimate happiness of man was everlasting life in the society of God. Alas, O son of her, that I should say it, but as well yon sleeping camel constant in such society as the holiest priest this day serving the highest altars in the most renowned temples, so much are men given to this lowly earthly life. So nearly have they forgotten that other which is to come. See now, I pray you, that which is to be saved to us. For my part, speaking with the holiness of truth, I would not give one hour of life as a soul, for a thousand years of life as a man. Here the Egyptians seem to become unconscious of companionship and fall away into abstraction. This life has its problems, he said, and there are men who spend their days trying to solve them. But what are they to the problems of the hereafter? What is there like knowing God? Not a scroll of the mysteries, but the mysteries themselves would, for that hour at least, lie before me revealed. Even the innermost and most awful, the power which now we shrink from thought of, which rimmed the void with shores and lighted the darkness, and out of nothing appointed the universe. All places would be opened. I would be filled with divine knowledge. I would see all glories, taste all delights. I would revel in being. And if, at the end of the hour, it should please God to tell me, I take thee into my service forever, the furthest limit of desire would be passed, after which the attainable ambitions of life, and its joys of whatever kind, would not be so much as the tinkling of little bells. Balthazar paused as if to recover from very ecstasy of feeling, and to ben -Hur it seemed the speech had been the delivery of a soul speaking for itself. I pray pardon, son of her, the good man continued, with a bow the gravity of which was relieved by the tender look that followed it. I meant to leave the life of a soul, its conditions, pleasures, superiority, to your own reflection and finding out. The joy of the thought has betrayed me into much speech. I set out to show though ever so faintly, the reason of my faith. It grieves me that words are so weak. But help yourself to truth. Consider first the excellence of the existence which was reserved for us after death, and give heed to the feelings and impulses the thought is sure to awaken in you. Heed them, I say, because they are your own soul astir, doing what it can to urge you in the right way. Consider next that the afterlife has become so obscured as to justify calling it a lost light. If you find it, rejoice, O son of her, rejoice as I do, though in beggary of words. For then, besides the great gift which is to be saved to us, you will have found the need of a saviour so infinitely greater than the need of a king. And he we are going to meet will not longer hold place in your hope a warrior with a sword or a monarch with a crown. A practical question presents itself. How shall we know him at sight? If you continue in your belief as to his character, that he is to be a king as Herod was, of course you will keep on until you meet a man clothed in purple and with a scepter. On the other hand, he I look for will be one poor, humble, undistinguished, a man in appearance as other men, and the sign by which I will know him will never be so simple. He will offer to show me and all mankind the way to the eternal life, the beautiful pure life of the soul. The company sat a moment in silence, which was broken by Balthasar. Let us arise now, he said. 
let us arise and set forward again. What I have said has caused a return of impatience to see him who is ever in my thought. And if I seem to hurry you, O son of her, and you, my daughter, be that my excuse. At his signal the slave brought them wine in a skin bottle, and they poured and drank, and shaking the lapcloths out arose. While the slave restored the tent and wares to the box under the howdah, and the Arab brought up the horses, the three principals laved themselves in the pool. In a little while they were retracing their steps back through the wadi, intending to overtake the caravan if it had passed them by. End of chapter 3 Book Seventh, Chapter Four of Ben Hur by Lou Wallace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Four. The caravan stretched out upon the desert was very picturesque. In motion, however, it was like a lazy serpent. By and by, its stubborn dragging became intolerably irksome to Balthasar, patient as he was. So, at his suggestion, the party determined to go on by themselves. If the reader be young, or if he has yet a sympathetic recollection of the romanticisms of his youth, he will relish the pleasure with which Ben-Hur, riding near the camel of the Egyptians, gave a last look at the head of the straggling column almost out of sight on the shimmering plain. To be definite as may be, and perfectly confidential, Ben-Hur found a certain charm in Iris's presence. If she looked down upon him from her high place, he made haste to get near her. If she spoke to him, his heart beat out of its usual time. The desire to be agreeable to her was a constant impulse. Objects on the way, though ever so common, became interesting the moment she called attention to them. A black swallow in the air, pursued by her pointing finger, went off in a halo. If a bit of quartz or a flake of mica was seen to sparkle in the drab sand under kissing of the sun, at a word he turned aside and brought it to her, and if she threw it away in disappointment, far from thinking of the trouble he had been put to, he was sorry it proved so worthless and kept a lookout for something better, a ruby, perchance a diamond. So the purple of the far mountains became intensely deep and rich if she distinguished it with an exclamation of praise, and when now and then the curtain of the howdah fell down, it seemed a sudden dullness had dropped from the sky bedraggling all the landscape. Thus disposed, yielding to the sweet influence what shall save him from the dangers there are in days of the close companionship with the fair Egyptian incident to the solitary journey they were entered upon. For that there is no logic in love, nor the least mathematical element, it is simply natural that she shall fashion the result who has the wielding of the influence. To quicken the conclusion there were signs, too, that she well knew the influence she was exercising over him. From some place under hand she had since morning drawn a call of golden coins, and adjusted it so the gleaming strings fell over her forehead and upon her cheeks, blending lustrously with the flowing of her blue-black hair. From the same safe deposit she had also produced articles of jewellery, rings for finger and ear, bracelets, a necklace of pearls, also a shawl embroidered with threads of fine gold, the effect of all which she softened with a scarf of Indian lace skilfully folded about her throat and shoulders and so arrayed she plied Ben-Hur with countless coquetries of speech and manner, showering him with smiles, laughing in flute-like tremolo, and all the while following him with glances, now melting tender, now sparkling bright. By such play Antony was weaned from his glory, yet she who wrought his ruin was really not half so beautiful as this her countrywoman. And so to them the nooning came, and the evening— the sun at its going down behind a spur of the old Bashan left the party halted by a pool of clear water of the rains out in the Abilene desert. There the tent was pitched, the supper eaten, and preparations made for the night. The second watch was Ben-Hur's, and he was standing, spear in hand, within arm reach of the dozing camel, looking a while at the stars, then over the veiled land. The stillness was intense, only after long spells a warm breath of wind would sow past, but without disturbing him, for yet in thought he entertained the Egyptian, recounting her charms, and sometimes debating how she came by his secrets, the uses she might make of them, and the course he should pursue with her. And through all the debate love stood off but a little way, a strong temptation, the stronger of a gleam of policy behind. At the very moment he was most inclined to yield to the allurement, a hand very fair even in the moonless gloaming was laid softly upon his shoulder. 
The touch thrilled him. He started, turned, and she was there. I thought you were asleep, he said presently. Sleep is for old people and little children, and I came to look out at my friends, the stars in the south, those now holding the curtains of midnight over the Nile. But confess yourself surprised. He took the hand which had fallen from his shoulder and said, Well, was it by an enemy? Oh, no. To be an enemy is to hate, and hating is a sickness which Isis will not suffer to come near me. She kissed me, you should know, on the heart when I was a child. Your speech does not sound in the least like your father's. Are you not of his faith? I might have been. <laughs> and she laughed low. I might have been had I seen what he has. I may be when I get old like him. There should be no religion for youth, only poetry and philosophy, and no poetry except such as is the inspiration of wine and mirth and love, and no philosophy that does not not excuse for follies which cannot outlive a season. My father's God is too awful for me. I failed to find him in the grove of Daphne. He was never heard of as present in the atria of Rome. But, son of her, I have a wish. A wish? Where is he who could say it? No. I will try you. Tell it, then. It is very simple. I wish to help you. She drew closer as she spoke. He laughed and replied lightly, O oh, Egypt! I came near saying, Dear Egypt, does not the Sphinx abide in your country? Well? You are one of its riddles. Be merciful, and give me a little clue to help me understand you. In what do I need help? And how can you help me? She took her hand from him, and, turning to the camel, spoke to it endearingly, and patted its monstrous head as if it were a thing of beauty. O oh, thou last and swiftest and stateliest of the herds of Job! Sometimes thou, too, go stumbling, because the way is rough and stony and the burden grievous. How is it thou knowest the kind intent by word, and always makest the answer gratefully, though the help offered is from a woman? I will kiss thee, thou royal brute. She stooped and touched its broad forehead with her lips, saying immediately, Because in thy intelligence there is no suspicion. And Ben-Hur, restraining himself, said calmly, The reproach has not failed its mark, O Egypt. I seem to say thee no, may it not be, because I am under the seal of honour and by my silence cover the lives and fortunes of others? Maybe, she said quickly. It is so. He shrank a step and asked, his voice sharp with amazement, What all knowest thou? She answered after a laugh, Why do men deny that the senses of women are sharper than theirs? Your face has been under my eyes all day. I had but to look at it to see you bore some weight in mind, and to find the weight, what had I to do more than recall your debates with my father? son of her she lowered her voice with singular dexterity and going near spoke so her breath was warm upon his cheek son of her he thou art going to find is to be king of the jews is he not his heart beat fast and hard a king of the jews like herod only greater she continued he looked away into the night up to the stars then his eyes met hers and lingered there and her breath was on his lips so near was she since morning she said further, We have been having visions. Now if I tell you mine, will you serve me as well? What? Silence still? She pushed his hand away and turned as if to go, but he caught her and said eagerly, Stay! Stay and speak! She went back and with her hand upon his shoulder leaned against him, and he put his arm around her and drew her close, very close, and in the caress was the promise she asked. Speak and tell me thy visions, O Egypt, dear Egypt. A prophet, nay, not the Tishbite, not even the lawgiver could have refused an asking of thine. I am at thy will. Be merciful, merciful, I pray. The entreaty passed apparently unheard, for looking up and nestling in his embrace, she said slowly, The vision which followed me was of magnificent war, war on land and sea, with clashing of arms and rush of armies, as if Caesar and Pompey were come again, and Octavius and Antony. A cloud of dust and ashes arose and covered the world, and Rome was not any more. All dominion returned to the east. Out of the cloud issued another race of heroes, and there were vaster satrapies and brighter crowns for giving away than it were ever known. And, son of her, while the vision was passing and after it was gone, I kept asking myself, What shall he not have who serves the king earliest and best? Again Ben-Hur recoiled. Question was the very question which had been with him all day. Presently he fancied he had the clue he wanted. So, he said, I have you now. The satrapies and crowns are the things to which you would help me. I see, I see. 
and there never was such a queen as you would be so shrewd so beautiful so royal never but alas dear egypt by the vision as you show it me the prizes are all of war and you are but a woman the isis did kiss you on the heart and crowns are starry gifts beyond your power of help unless indeed you have a way to them more certain than that of the sword and so o egypt egypt show it to me and i will walk in it if only for your sake she removed his arm and said spread your cloak upon the sand here so i can rest against the camel i will sit and tell you a story which came down the nile to alexandria where i had it he did as she said first planting the spear in the ground near by and what shall i do he said ruefully when she was seated in alexandria is it customary for the listeners to sit or stand from the comfortable place against the old domestic she answered laughing the audiences of storytellers are wilful and sometimes do as they please without more ado he stretched himself upon the sand and put her arm about his neck i am ready he said and directly she began how the beautiful came to the earth you must know in the first place that isis was and for that matter she may yet be the most beautiful of deities and osiris her husband though wise and powerful was sometimes stung with jealousy of her, for only in their loves are the gods like mortals. The palace of the divine wife was of silver, crowning the tallest mountain in the moon, and thence she passed off into the sun, in the heart of which, a source of eternal light, Osiris kept his palace of gold too shining for men to look at. One time there were no days with the gods. While she was full pleasantly with him on the roof of the golden palace, she chanced to look, and afar, just on the line of the universe, saw Indra passing with an army of simians, all borne upon the backs of flying eagles. He, the friend of living things, so with much love is Indra called, was returning from his final war with the hideous Rakshakas, returning victorious, and in his suit were Rama, the hero, and Sita, his bride, who next to Isis himself was the very most beautiful. And Isis arose, and took off her girl of stars, and waved it to Sitta, to Sitta, mind you, waved it in glad salute. And instantly, between the marching host and the two on the golden roof, a something as of night fell, and shut out the view, but it was not night, only the frown of Osiris. It happened on the subject of his speech that moment was such as none else than they could think of, and he arose, and said majestically, Get thee home, I will do the work myself. To make a perfectly happy being, I do not need thy help. Get thee gone. Now Isis had lies large as those of the white cow which in the temple eats sweet grasses from the hands of the faithful, even while they say their prayers, and her eyes were the color of the cows, and quite as tender. And she too arose and said, smiling as she spoke, so her look was little more than the glow of the moon in the hazy harvest month. Farewell, my good lord. You will call me presently, I know, for without me you cannot make the perfectly happy creature of which you are thinking any more and she stopped to laugh knowing well the truth of the saying any more my lord than you yourself can be perfectly happy without me we will see he said and she went her way and took her needles in her chair and on the roof of the silver palace sat watching and knitting and the will of osiris at labour in his mighty breast was as the sound of the mills of all the other gods grinding at once so loud that the near stars rattled like seeds in a parched pod and some dropped out and were lost and while the sound kept on she waited and knit nor lost she ever a stitch the while soon a spot appeared in the space over the sun and it grew until it was as great as the moon and then she knew as a world was intended but when growing and growing at last it cast her planet in the shade all save the little point lighted by her presence she knew how very angry he was yet she knit away assured that the end would be as she had said and so came the earth at first but a cold grey mass hanging listless in the hollow void later she saw it separate into divisions here a plain there a mountain yonder a sea all as yet without a sparkle and then by a river bank something moved and she stopped her knitting for wonder the something arose and lifted its hands to the sun in sign of knowledge whence it had its being and this first man was beautiful to see and about him were the creations we call nature the grass the trees birds beasts even the insects and reptiles and for a time the man went about happy in his life it was easy to see how happy he was and in the lull of the sound of the labouring will isis heard a scornful laugh and presently the whirr was blown across from the sun 
Thy help, indeed, behold the creature perfectly happy. And Isis fell to knitting again, for she was as patient as Osiris was strong, and if he could work she could wait, and wait she did, knowing that mere life is not enough to keep anything content. And sure enough, not long until the divine wife could see a change in the man. He grew listless, and kept to one place prone by the river, and looked up but seldom, and then always with a moody face. Interest was dying in him, and when she made sure of it, even while she was saying to herself, the creature is sick of his being, there was a roar of the creative will at work again, and in a twinkling the earth, therefore all a thing of the coldest grey, flamed with colours, the mountains swam in purple, the plains bearing grass and trees turned green, the sea blue, and the clouds varied infinitely. And the man sprang up and clapped his hands, for he was cured and happy again. And Isis smiled and knit away to herself, saying, "'It was well thought, and will do a little while, but mere beauty in a world is not enough for such a being. My lord must try again.' With the last word the thunder of the will at work shook the moon, and looking, Isis dropped her knitting and clapped her hands. For theretofore everything on the earth but the man had been fixed to a given place. Now all living, and much that was not living, received the gift of motion. The birds took to wing joyously. Beasts, great and small, went about each in its way. The trees shook their birders' branches, nodding to the enamoured winds. The rivers ran to the seas, and the seas tossed in their beds and rolled in crested waves, and with surging and ebbing painted the shores with glistening foam, and over all the clouds floated like sailed ships unanchored. And the man rose up, happy as a child, whereat Osiris was pleased, so that he shouted, Ha, ha, see how well I am doing without thee. The good wife took up her work, and answered ever so quietly, It was well thought, my lord, ever so well thought, and it will serve a while. And as before, so again, the sight of things in motion became to the man as of course. The birds in flight, the rivers running, the seas in tumult of action, ceased to amuse him, and he pined again even worse. And Isis waited, saying to herself, Poor creature, he is more wretched than ever. And as if he heard the thought, Osiris stirred, and the noise of his will shook the universe. The sun in its central seat alone stood firm, and Isis looked but saw no change. Then while she was smiling, assured that her lord's last invention was sped, suddenly the creature arose and seemed to listen, and his face brightened, and he clapped his hands for joy, for sounds were heard for the first time on earth, sounds dissonant, and sounds harmonious. The winds murmured in the trees, the birds sang, each kind a song of its own, or chattered in speech. The rivulets running to the rivers became so many harpers with harps of silver strings, all tinkling together, and the rivers running to the seas surged on in solemn accord, while the seas beat the land to a tune of thunder. There was music, music everywhere, and all the time, so the man could not but be happy. Then Isis mused, thinking how well, how wondrous well her lord was doing, but presently she shook her head. Color, motion, sound, and she repeated them slowly. There was no element of beauty else except form and light, and to them the earth had been born. Now, indeed, Osiris was done, and if the creature should again fall off into wretchedness, her help must be asked. And her fingers flew, two, three, five, even ten stitches she took at once. And the man was happy a long time, longer than before, it seemed. Indeed, he would never tire again. But Isis knew better, and she waited and waited, nor minded the many laughs flung at her from the sun. She waited and waited, and at last saw signs of the end. Sounds became familiar to him, and in their range, from the chirping of the cricket under the roses, to the roar of the seas and the bellow of the clouds and storm, there was not anything unusual. And he pined and sickened, and sought his place of moping by the river, and at last fell down motionless. Then Isis in pity spoke. "'My lord,' she said, "'the creature is dying.' But Osiris, though seeing it all, held his peace. He could do no more. "'Shall I help him?' she asked. Osiris was too proud to speak. Then Isis took the last stitch in her knitting, and gathering her work in a roll of brilliance, flung it off, flung it so it fell close to the man. And he, hearing the sound of the fall so near by, looked up, and lo, a woman, the first woman, was stooping to help him. She reached a hand to him. He caught it and arose, and never more was miserable, but ever more happy. Such, O oh son of her, is the genesis of the beautiful as they tell it on the Nile. She paused. A pretty invention and cunning, he said directly. But it is imperfect. What did Osiris afterwards? Oh, yes, she replied. He called the divine wife back to the sun, and they all went on pleasantly, each helping the other. And shall I not do as the first man? 
he carried the hand resting upon his neck to his lips. "'In love, in love,' he said. His head dropped softly into her lap. "'You will find the king,' she said, placing her other hand caressingly upon his head. "'You will go on and find the king and serve him. With your sword you will earn his richest gifts, and his best soldier will be my hero.' He turned his face and saw hers close above. In all the sky there was that moment nothing so bright to him as her eyes, and shadowed though they were. Presently he sat up and put his arms about her and kissed her passionately, saying, O oh, Egypt, Egypt, if the king has crowns in gift, one shall be mine, and I will bring it and put it here over the place my lips have marked. You shall be a queen, my queen, no one more beautiful, and we will be ever, ever so happy. And you will tell me everything and let me help you in all? she said, kissing him in return. The question chilled his fervor. Is it not enough that I love you? he asked. Perfect love means perfect faith, she replied. But never mind, you will know me better. She took her hand from him and arose. You are cruel, he said. Moving away, she stopped by the camel and touched its front face with her lips. O oh, thou noblest of thy kind, that because there is no suspicion in thy love. An instant, and she was gone. End of chapter 4book seventh chapter five of ben hur by lou wallace this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter five the third day of the journey the party nooned by the river jabok where there were a hundred or more men mostly of perea resting themselves and their beasts hardly had they dismounted before a man came to them with a pitcher of water and a bowl and offered them drink as they received the attention with much courtesy he said looking at the camel i am returning from the jordan where just now there are many people from distant parts travelling as you are illustrious friend but they had none of them the equal of your servant here very noble animal may i ask of what breed he is sprung balthasar answered and sought his rest but ben hur more curious took up the remark at what place on the river are the people he asked at Bethabara. It used to be a lonesome ford, said Ben Hur. I cannot understand how it can have become of such interest. I see, the stranger replied. You too are from abroad and have not heard the good tidings. What tidings? Well, a man has appeared out of the wilderness, a very holy man, with his mouth full of strange words which take hold of all who hear them. He calls himself John, the Nazarite son of Zacharias, and says he is the messenger sent before the Messiah. Even Iris listened closely while the man continued. They say it is John that he has spent his life from childhood, in a cave down by En Gedi, praying and living more strictly than the Essenes. Crowds go to hear him preach. I went to hear him with the rest. Have all these, your friends, been there? Most of them are going. A few are coming away. What does he preach? A new doctrine. One never before taught in Israel, as I'll say. He calls it repentance and baptism. The rabbis do not know what to make of him, nor do we. Some have asked him if he is the Christ, others if he is a lies. But to them all he has the answer. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. At this point the man was called away by his friends. As he was going, Balthasar spoke. Good stranger, he said tremulously. Tell us if we shall find the preacher at the place you left him. Yes, at Bethabara. Who should this Nazarite be? said Ben-Hur to Iris. If not the herald of our king. In so short a time he had come to regard the daughter as more interested in the mysterious personage he was looking for than the aged father. Nevertheless, the latter, with a positive glow in his sunken eyes, half arose and said, Let us make haste. I am not tired. They turned away to help the slave. There was little conversation between the three at the stopping place for the night west of Ramoth Gilead. Let us arise early, son of her, said the old man. The Saviour may come, and we not there. The king cannot be far behind his herald, Iris whispered as she prepared to take her place on the camel. Tomorrow we will see, Ben Hur replied, kissing her hand. Next day, about the third hour, 
out of the pass through which, skirting the base of Mount Gilead, they had journeyed since leaving Ramoth, the party came upon the barren steppe east of the sacred river. Opposite them they saw the upper limit of the old palm lands of Jericho, stretching off to the hill country of Judea. Ben-Hur's blood ran quickly, for he knew the ford was close at hand. "'Content you, good Balthazar,' he said. "'We are almost there.' The driver quickened the camel's pace. Soon they caught sight of booths and tents and tethered animals, and then of the river, and a multitude collected down close by the bank, and yet another multitude on the western shore. Knowing that the preacher was preaching, they made greater haste. Yet, as they were drawing near, suddenly there was a commotion in the mass, and it began to break up and disperse. They were too late. "'Let us stay here,' said Ben-Hur to Balthasar, who was wringing his hands. "'The Nazarite may come this way.' The people were too intent upon what they had heard, and too busy in discussion to notice the newcomers. When some hundreds were gone by, and it seemed the opportunity to so much as see the Nazarite was lost to the latter, up the river not far away they beheld a person coming towards them of such singular appearance they forgot all else. Outwardly the man was rude and uncouth, even savage. Over a thin, gaunt visage of the hue of brown parchment, over his shoulders and down his back below the middle, in witch-like locks, fell a covering of sun-scorched hair. His eyes were burning bright. All his right side was naked, and of the color of his face, and quite as meagre, a shirt of the coarsest camel's hair, coarse as Bedouin tent-cloth, clothed the rest of his person to his knees, being gathered at the waist by a broad girdle of untanned leather. His feet were bare. A scrip, also, of untanned leather, was fastened to the girdle. He used a knotted staff to help him forward. His movement was quick, decided, and strangely watchful. Every little while he tossed the unruly hair from his eyes, and peered round as if searching for somebody. The fair Egyptian surveyed the son of the desert with surprise, not to say disgust. Presently, raising the curtain of the howdah, she spoke to Ben-Hur, who sat his horse nearby. "'Is that the herald of thy king?' "'It is the Nazarite,' he replied, without looking up. In truth he was himself more than disappointed. Despite his familiarity with the ascetic colonists in En Gedi, their dress, their indifference to all worldly opinion, their constancy to vows which gave them over to every imaginable suffering of body, and separated them from others of their kind as absolutely as if they had not been born like them, and notwithstanding he had been notified on the way to look for a Nazarite, whose simple description of himself was a voice from the wilderness. Still Ben-Hur's dream of the king, who was to be so great and do so much, had coloured all his thought of him, so that he never doubted to find in the forerunner some sign or token of the goodliness and royalty he was announcing. Gazing at the savage figure before him, the long trains of courtiers whom he had been used to see in the Thermae and imperial corridors at Rome, arose before him, forcing a comparison. Shocked, shamed, bewildered, he could only answer, "'It is the Nazarite.' With Balthazar it was very different. The ways of God, he knew, were not as men would have them. He had seen the Saviour a child in the manger, and was prepared by his faith for the rude and simple in connection with the divine reappearance. So he kept his seat, his hands crossed upon his breast, his lips moving in prayer. He was not expecting a king. In this time of such interest to the newcomers, and in which they were so differently moved, another man had been sitting by himself on a stone at the edge of the river, thinking yet, probably, of the sermon he had been hearing. Now, however, he arose and walked slowly up from the shore, in a course to take him across the line the Nazarite was pursuing, and bring him near the camel. And the two, the preacher and the stranger, kept on until they came, the former within twenty yards of the animal, the latter within ten feet. Then the preacher stopped and flung the hair from his eyes, looked at the stranger, threw his hands up as a signal to all the people in sight, and they also stopped, each in the pose of a listener, and when the hush was perfect, slowly the staff in the Nazarite's right hand came down and pointed to the stranger. All those who were before but listeners became watchers also. At the same instant, under the same impulse, Balthazar and Ben-Hur fixed their gaze upon the man pointed out and both took the same impression, only in different degree. He was moving slowly towards them in a clear space a little to their front, a form slightly above the average in stature, and slender, even delicate. 
His action was calm and deliberate, like that habitual to men much given to serious thought upon grave subjects, and it well became his costume, which was an undergarment full-sleeved and reaching to the ankles, and an outer robe called the talith. On his left arm he carried the usual handkerchief for the head, the red fillet swinging loose down his side. Except the fillet and a narrow border of blue at the lower edge of the talith, his attire was of linen yellowed with dust and road stains. Possibly the exception should be extended to the tassels, which were blue and white, as prescribed by law for rabbis. His sandals were of the simplest kind. He was without scrip or girdle or staff. These points of appearance, however, the three beholders observed briefly, and rather as accessories to the head and face of the man, which, especially to the latter, were the real sources of the spell they caught in common with all who stood looking at him. The head was open to the cloudless light, except as it was draped with hair long and slightly waved, and parted in the middle, and auburn in tint, with a tendency to reddish golden were most strongly touched by the sun. Under a broad, low forehead, under black, well-arched brows, beamed eyes dark blue and large, and softened to exceeding tenderness by lashes of the great length, sometimes seen on children, but seldom, if ever, on men. As to the other features, it would have been difficult to decide whether they were Greek or Jewish. The delicacy of the nostrils and mouth was unusual to the latter type, and when it was taken into account with the gentleness of the eyes, the pallor of the complexion, the fine texture of the hair, and the softness of the beard, which fell in waves over his breast, never a soldier but would have laughed at him in a canter, never a woman who would not have confided him at sight, never a child that would not, with quick instinct, have given him its hand and whole artless trust, nor might any one have said he was not beautiful. The features, it should be further said, were ruled by a certain expression which, as the viewer chose, might with equal correctness have been called the effect of intelligence, love, pity, or sorrow, though in better speech it was a blending of them all, a look easy to fancy as the mark of a sinless soul doomed to the sight and understanding of the utter sinfulness of those among whom it was passing, yet withal no one could have observed the face with a thought of weakness in the man. So, at least, would not they who know that the qualities mentioned, love, sorrow, pity, are the results of a consciousness of strength to bear, suffering oftener than strength to do. Such has been the might of martyrs and devotees and the myriads written down in saintly calendars. And such, indeed, was the air of this one. Slowly he drew near, nearer the three. Now Ben-Hur, mounted in spear in hand, was an object to claim the glance of a king, yet the eyes of the man approaching were all the time raised above him, and not to Iris, whose loveliness had been so often remarked, but to Balthazar, the old and unserviceable. The hush was profound. Presently the Nazarite, still pointing with his staff, cried out in a loud voice, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. The many standing still, arrested by the action of the speaker, and listening for what might follow, were struck with awe by words so strange and past their understanding. Upon Balthazar they were overpowering. He was there to see once more the Redeemer of men. The faith which had brought him the singular privileges of the time long gone abode yet in his heart, and if now it gave him a power of vision above that of his fellows, a power to see and know him for whom he was looking, better than calling the power a miracle, let it be thought of as the faculty of a soul, not yet entirely released from the divine relations to which it had been formerly admitted, or as the fitting reward of a life in that age, so without examples of holiness, a life in itself a miracle. The detail of his faith was before him, perfect in face, form, dress, action, age, and he was in its view, and the view was recognition." Ah, now, if something should happen to identify the stranger beyond all doubt. And that was what did happen. Exactly at the fitting moment, as if to assure the trembling Egyptian, the Nazarite repeated the outcry, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Balthasar fell upon his knees. For him there was no need of explanation, and as if the Nazarite knew it, he turned to those more immediately about him, staring in wonder, and continued, This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, 
but that he should be manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come, baptizing with water. I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw, and bear record, that this... He paused, his staff still pointing at the stranger in the white garments, as if to give a more absolute certainty to both his words and the conclusions intended. I bear record, that this is the Son of God. It is he! It is he! Balthazar cried, with upraised tearful eyes. Next moment he sank down insensible. In this time it should be remembered, Ben-Hur was studying the face of the stranger, though with an interest entirely different. He was not insensible to its purity of feature, and its thoughtfulness, tenderness, humility, and holiness, but just then there was room in his mind for but one thought. Who is this man? And what, Messiah or King? Never was apparition more unroyal. Nay, looking at that calm, benignant countenance, the very idea of war and conquest, and lust of dominion smote him like a profanation. He said, as if speaking to his own heart, Balthazar must be right and Simonides wrong. This man has not come to rebuild the throne of Solomon. He has neither the nature nor the genius of Herod. King he may be, but not of another and greater than Rome. It should be understood now that this was not a conclusion with Ben-Hur, but an impression merely, and while it was forming, while yet he gazed at the wonderful countenance, his memory began to throw and struggle. Surely, he said to himself, I have seen the man, but where and when? that the look, so calm, so pitiful, so loving, had somewhere in a past time beamed upon him as that moment it was beaming upon Balthazar, became an assurance. Faintly at first, at last a clear light, a burst of sunshine, the scene by the well at Nazareth, what time the Roman guard was dragging him to the galleys, returned, and all his being thrilled. Those hands had helped him when he was perishing. The face was one of the pictures that he had carried in mind ever since. In the effusion of feeling excited, the explanation of the preacher was lost by him, all but the last words, words so marvellous that the world yet rings with them. This is the Son of God. Ben-Hur leaped from his horse to render homage to his benefactor, but Iris cried to him, Help, son of her, help, or my father will die. He stopped, looked back, then hurried to her assistance. She gave him a cup, and leaving the slave to bring the camel to its knees, he ran to the river for water. The stranger was gone when he came back. At last Balthazar was restored to consciousness. Stretching forth his hands, he asked feebly, "'Where is he?' "'Who?' asked Iris. An intense instant interest shone upon the good man's face, as if a last wish had been gratified, and he answered, "'He, the Redeemer!' The Son of God, whom I have seen again. Believest thou so? Iris asked in a low voice of Ben-Hur. The time is full of wonders. Let us wait, was all he said. And next day, while the three were listening to him, the Nazarite broke off in mid-speech, saying reverently, Behold the Lamb of God. Looking to where he pointed, they beheld the stranger again. As Ben-Hur surveyed the slender figure and holy, beautiful countenance compassionate to sadness, a new idea broke upon him. Balthazar is right, so is Simonides. May not the Redeemer be a king also? And he asked one at his side, Who is the man walking yonder? The other laughed mockingly and replied, He is the son of a carpenter over in Nazareth. End of chapter 5 End of book 7「Book Eighth, Chapter One of Ben Hur by Lou Wallace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Book Eighth. Who could resist? Who in this universe? She did so breathe ambrosia, so immerse. My fine existence in the golden clime. She took me like a child of suckling time, and cradled me in roses, thus condemned. The current of my former life was stemmed. And to this arbitrary queen of sense, I bowed a trans-vassal. Keats, 
Endymion. I am the resurrection and the life. Chapter 1 Esther, Esther, uh, speak to the servant below that he may bring me a cup of water. Would you not rather have wine, father? Let him bring both. This was in the summer house upon the roof of the old palace of the Hurs in Jerusalem. From the parapet, overlooking the courtyard, Esther called to a man in waiting there. At the same moment, another manservant came up the steps and saluted respectfully. A package for the master, he said, giving her a letter enclosed in linen cloth, tied and sealed. For the satisfaction of the reader, we stop to say that it is the 21st day of March, nearly three years after the Annunciation of the Christ at Betharborough. In the meanwhile, Maluk, acting for Ben-Hur, who could no longer endure the emptiness and decay of his father's house, had bought it from Pontius Pilate, and in process of repair, gates, courts, lewens, stairways, terraces, rooms, and roof had been cleansed and thoroughly restored. Not only was there no reminder left of the tragic circumstances so ruinous to the family, but the refurnishment was in a style richer than before. At every point, indeed, a visitor was met by evidences of the higher taste acquired by the young proprietor during his years of residence in the villa by Mycenaeum and in the Roman capital. Now it should not be inferred from this explanation that Ben-Hur had publicly assumed ownership of the property. In his opinion, the hour for that was not yet come. Neither had he yet taken his proper name. Passing the time in the labors of preparation in Galilee, he waited patiently the action of the Nazarene, who became daily more and more a mystery to him, and by prodigies done, often before his eyes, kept him in a state of anxious doubt, both as to his character and mission. Occasionally he came up to the holy city, stopping at the paternal house, always, however, as a stranger and a guest. These visits of Ben-Hur, it should also be observed, were from more than mere rest from labor. Balthasar and Arras made their home in the palace and the charm of the daughter was still upon him with all its original freshness, while the father, though feebler in body, held him an unflagging listener to speeches of astonishing power, urging the divinity of the wandering miracle worker of whom they were all so expectant. As to Simonides and Esther, they had arrived from Antioch only a few days before this their reappearance, a wearisome journey to the merchant, born, as he had been, in a palanquin swung between two camels which in their careening did not always keep the same step but now that he was come the good man it seemed could not see enough of his native land he delighted in the perch upon the roof and spent most of his day hours there seated in an armchair the duplicate of that one kept for him in the cabinet over the storehouse by the arantes in the shade of the summer house he could drink fully of the inspiring air lying lightly upon familiar hills he could better watch the sun rise, run its course, and set as it used to in the far gone. Not a habit lost, and with Esther by him it was so much easier up there close to the sky, to bring back the other Esther, his love and youth, his wife, dearer growing with the passage of years, and yet he was not unmindful of business. Every day a messenger brought him a dispatch from Sambalot, in charge of the big commerce behind, and every day a dispatch left him for Sambalot with directions of such minuteness of detail as to exclude all judgment save his own, and all chances except those the Almighty has refused to submit to the most mindful of men. As Esther started and returned to the summer house, the sunlight fell softly upon the dustless roof, showing her a woman now, small, graceful in form, of regular features, rosy with youth and health, bright with intelligence, beautiful with the outshining of a devoted nature, a woman to be loved because loving was a habit of life irrepressible with her. She looked at the package as she turned, paused, looked at it a second time more closely than at first, and the blood rose reddening her cheeks. The seal was been hers. With quickened steps she hastened on. Simonides held the package at a moment while he also inspected the seal. Breaking it open, he gave her the roll it contained. Read, he said. His eyes were upon her as he spoke, and instantly a troubled expression fell upon his face. You know who it is from, I see, Esther. Yes, from our master. Though the manner was halting, she met his gaze with modest sincerity. Slowly his chin sank into the roll of flesh puffed out under it like a cushion. You love him, Esther, he said quietly. 
Yes, she answered. Have you thought well of what you do? I have tried not to think of him, father, except as the master to whom I am dutifully bound. The effort has not helped me to strength. A good girl, a good girl, even as thy mother was, he said, dropping into reverie, from which she roused him by unrolling the paper. The Lord forgive me, but... But thy love might not have been vainly given had I kept fast hold of all I had, as I might have done. Such power is there in money. It would have been worse for me had you done so, father, for then I had been unworthy a look from him and without pride in you. Shall I not read now? In a moment, he said, let me for your sake, my child, show you the worst. Seeing it with me may make it less terrible to you. His love, Esther, is all bestowed. I know it, she said calmly. The Egyptian has him in her net, he continued. She has the cunning of her race with beauty to help her. Much beauty, great cunning. But like her race again, no heart. The daughter who despises her father will bring her husband to grief. Does she that? Simonides went on. Balthazar is a wise man who has been wonderfully favored for a Gentile, and his faith becomes him. Yet she makes a jest of it. I heard her say, speaking of him yesterday, The follies of youth are excusable. Nothing is admirable in the aged except wisdom. And when that goes from them, they should die. A cruel speech fit for a Roman. I applied it to myself, knowing a feebleness like her father's will come to me also. Nay, it is not far off. But you, Esther, will never say of me, no, never, it were better he were dead. No, your mother was a daughter of Judah. With half-formed tears she kissed him and said, I am my mother's child. Yes, my daughter. My daughter, who is to me all the temple, was to Solomon. After a silence he laid his hand upon her shoulder and resumed. When he has taken the Egyptian to wife, Esther, he will think of you with repentance and much calling of the spirit. For at last he will awake to find himself but the minister of her bad ambition. Rome is the center of all her dreams. To her he is the son of Arius of Dumvir, not the son of her, Prince of Jerusalem. Esther made no attempt to conceal the effect of these words. Save him, father, it is not too late, she said entreatingly. He answered with a dubious smile. A man drowning may be saved, but not so a man in love. But you have influence with him. He is alone in the world. Show him his danger. Tell him what a woman she is. That might save him from her. Would it give him to you, Esther? No. And his brows fell darkly over his eyes. I am a servant, as my fathers were for generations. Yet I could not say to him, Lo, master, my daughter, she is fairer than the Egyptian, and loves thee better. I have caught too much from years of liberty and direction. The words would blister my tongue. The stones upon the old hills yonder would turn in their beds for shame when I go out to them. No, by the patriarchs, Esther, I would rather lay us both with your mother to sleep as she sleeps. A blush burned Esther's whole face. I did not mean you to tell him so, father. I was concerned for him alone, for his happiness, not mine. Because I have dared love him, I shall keep myself worthy his respect. So only can I excuse my folly. Let me read his letter now. Yes, uh, read it. She began at once, in haste to conclude the distasteful subject. Nisan, eighth day, on the road from Galilee to Jerusalem. The Nazarene is on the way also. With him, though without his knowledge, I am bringing a full legion of mine. A second legion follows. The Passover will excuse the multitude. He said upon setting out, We will go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning me shall be accomplished. Our waiting draws to an end. In haste. Peace to thee, Simonides. Ben-Hur. Esther returned the letter to her father, while a choking sensation gathered in her throat. There was not a word in the missive for her. Not even in the salutation had she a share. 
and it would have been so easy to have written and to thine peace for the first time in her life she felt the smart of a jealous sting the eighth day said simonides the eighth day and this esther this is the the ninth she replied ah then they may be in bethany now and possibly we may see him to-night she added pleased into momentary forgetfulness it may be it may be to-morrow is the feast of unleavened bread and he may wish to celebrate it so may the nazarene and we may see him we may see both of them esther at this point the servant appeared with the wine and water esther helped her father and in the midst of the service iras came upon the roof to the jewish the egyptian never appeared so very very beautiful as at that moment her gauzy garments fluttered about her like a little cloud of mist her forehead neck and arms glittered with the massive jewelry so affected by her people her countenance was suffused with pleasure she moved with buoyant steps and self-conscious though without affectation esther at the sight shrank within herself and nestled closer to her father peace to you simonides and to the pretty esther peace said Arez, inclining her head to the latter you remind me good master if i may say it without offence you remind me of the priests in persia who climb their temples at the decline of day to send prayers after the departing sun is there anything in the worship you do not know let me call my father he is magian bred fair egyptian the merchant replied nodding with grave politeness your father is a good man who would not be offended if he knew i told you his persian lore is the least part of his wisdom Arras's lip curled slightly to speak like a philosopher as you invite me she said the least part always implies a greater let me ask what you esteem the greater part of the rare quality you are pleased to attribute to him simonides turned upon her somewhat sternly pure wisdom always directs itself towards god the purest wisdom is knowledge of god and no man in my acquaintance has it in higher degree or makes it more manifest in speech and act than the good balthazar to end the parley he raised the cup and drank the egyptian turned to esther a little testily a man who has millions in store and fleets of ships at sea cannot discern in what simple women like us find amusement let us leave him by the wall yonder we can talk they went to the parapet then stopping at the place where years before ben hur loosed the broken tile upon the head of gratis you have not been to rome iras began toying the while with one of her unclasped bracelets no said esther demurely have you not wished to go no ah how little there has been of your life the sigh that succeeded the exclamation could not have been more piteously expressive had the loss been the egyptian's own next moment her laugh would have been heard in the street below and she said oh oh my pretty simpleton the half-fledged birds nested in the ear of the great bust out on the memphian sands know nearly as much as you then seeing esther's confusion she changed her manner and said in a confiding tone you must not take offence oh no i was playing let me kiss the hurt and tell you what i would not to any other not if symbol himself asked of me offering a lotus cup of the spray of the nile another laugh masking excellently the look she turned sharply upon the jewess and she said the king is coming esther gazed at her in innocent surprise the nazarene iris continued he whom our fathers have been talking about so much whom ben-hur has been serving and toiling for so long her voice dropped several tones lower the nazarene will be here to-morrow and ben-hur to-night esther struggled to maintain her composure but failed her eyes fell the tell-tale blood surged to her cheek and forehead and she was saved sight of the triumphant smile that passed like a gleam over the face of the egyptian see here is his promise and from her girdle she took a roll rejoice with me o oh my friend he will be here to-night on the tiber there was a house a royal property which he has pledged to me and to be its mistress is to be a sound of some one walking swiftly along the street below interrupted the speech and she leaned over the parapet to see then she drew back and cried with hands clasped above her head now blessed be isis to see ben-hur himself that he should appear while i had such thought of him there are no gods if it be not a good omen put your arms about me esther and a kiss the jewish looked up upon each cheek there was a glow 
her eyes sparkled with a light more nearly of anger than ever her nature emitted before her gentleness had been too roughly overridden it was not enough for her to be forbidden more than fugitive dreams of the man she loved a boastful rival must tell her in confidence of her better success and of brilliant promises which were its rewards of her the servant of a servant there had been no hint of remembrance this other could show his letter leaving her to imagine all it breathed so she said dost thou love him so much then or rome so much better the egyptian drew back a step then she bent her haughty head quite near her questioner what is he to thee o daughter of simonides esther all thrilling began he is my a thought blasting as lightning stayed the words she paled trembled recovered and answered he is my father's friend her tongue had refused to admit her servile condition Irez laughed more lightly than before <laughs> not more than that she said ah oh, by the lover gods of egypt thou mayst keep thy kisses keep them thou hast taught me but now that there are others more estimable than waiting me here in judea and she turned away looking back over her shoulder i will go get them peace to thee esther saw her disappear down the steps when putting her hands over her face she burst into tears so they ran scalding through her fingers tears of shame and choking passion and to deepen the paroxysm to her even temper so strange up with a new meaning of withering force rose her father's words thy love might not have been vainly given had i kept fast hold of all i had as i might have done and all the stars were out burning low above the city and the dark wall of mountains about it before she recovered enough to go back to the summer-house and in silence take her accustomed place at her father's side humbly waiting his pleasure to such duty it seemed her youth if not her life must be given and let the truth be said now that the pang was spent she went not unwillingly back to the duty end of chapter one book eighth chapter two of ben hur by lou wallace this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2 An hour or thereabouts after the scene upon the roof, Balthazar and Simonides, the latter attended by Esther, met in the great chamber of the palace, and while they were talking, Ben-Hur and Eris came in together. The young Jew, advancing in front of his companion, walked first to Balthazar, and saluted him, and received his reply. Then he turned to Simonides, but paused at sight of Esther. It is not often we have hearts roomy enough for more than one of the absorbing passions at the same time. In its blaze the others may continue to live, but only as lesser lights. So with Ben-Hur, much study of possibilities, indulgence of hopes and dreams, influences born of the condition of his country influences more direct that of eris for example had made him in the broadest worldly sense ambitious and as he had given the passion place allowing it to become a rule and finally an imperious governor the resolves and impulses of former days faded imperceptibly out of being and at last almost out of recollection it is at best so easy to forget our youth in his case it was but natural that his own sufferings and the mystery darkening the fate of his family should move him less and less as in hope at least he approached nearer and nearer the goals which occupied all his visions only let us not judge him too harshly he paused in surprise at seeing esther a woman now and so beautiful and as he stood looking at her a still voice reminded him of broken vows and duties undone almost his old self returned for an instant he was startled but recovering he went to esther and said peace to thee sweet esther peace and now simonides he looked to the merchant as he spoke the blessing of the lord be thine if only because thou hast been a good father to the fatherless esther heard him with downcast face simonides answered i repeat the welcome of the good balthazar son of her welcome to thy father's house and sit and tell us of thy travels and of thy work and of the wonderful Nazarene, who he is and what. If thou art not at ease here, who shall be? Sit, I pray, there between us, that we may all hear. Esther stepped out quickly and brought a covered stool and set it for him. 
Thanks, he said to her gratefully. When seated, after some other conversation, he addressed himself to the men. I have come to tell you of the Nazarene. The two became instantly attentive. For many days now I have followed him with such watchfulness as one may give another, upon whom he is waiting so anxiously. I have seen him under all circumstances said to be trials and tests of men, and while I am certain he is a man as I am, not less certain am I that he is something more. What more? asked Simonides. I will tell you. Someone coming into the room interrupted him. He turned and arose with extended hands. Amra, dear old Amra, he cried. She came forward, and they, seeing the joy in her face, thought not once how wrinkled and tawny it was. She knelt at his feet, clasped his knees, and kissed his hands over and over. And when he could, he put the lank gray hair from her cheeks and kissed them, saying, Good Amra, have you nothing, nothing of them, not a word, not one little sign? Then she broke into sobbing, which made him answer plainer even than the spoken word. God's will has been done, he next said, solemnly, in a tone to make each listener know he had no hope more of finding his people. In his eyes there were tears which he would not have them see, because he was a man. When he could again, he took seat and said, Come, sit by me, Amra, here. No, then at my feet, for I have much to say to these good friends of a wonderful man come into the world. But she went off, and stooping with her back to the wall, joined her hands before her knees content, they all thought, was seeing him. Then Ben-Hur, bowing to the old men, began again. I fear to answer the question asked me about the Nazarene without first telling you some of the things I have seen him do, and to that I am the more inclined, my friends, because tomorrow he will come to the city and go up into the temple, which he calls his father's house, where, it is further said, he will proclaim himself. So whether you are right, O Balthazar, or you, Simonides, we in Israel shall know tomorrow. Balthazar rubbed his hands tremulously together and asked, Where shall I go to see him? The pressure of the crowd will be very great. Better, I think, that you all go upon the roof above the cloisters, say upon the porch of Solomon. Can you be with us? No, said Ben-Hur. My friends will require me, perhaps, in the procession. Procession? exclaimed Simonides. Does he travel in state? Ben-Hur saw the argument in mind. He brings twelve men with him, fishermen, tillers of the soil, one a publican, all of the humbler class, and he and they make their journeys on foot, careless of wind, cold, rain, or sun. Seeing them stop by the wayside at nightfall to break bread or lie down to sleep, I have been reminded of a party of shepherds going back to their flocks from market not of nobles and kings, only when he lifts the corner of his handkerchief to look at someone or shake the dust from his head. I am made known he is their teacher as well as their companion, their superior not less than their friend. You are shrewd men. Then her resumed after a pause. You know what creatures of certain master motives we are, and that it has become little less than a law of nature to spend life in eager pursuit of certain objects. Now, appealing to that law as something by which we may know ourselves, what would you say of a man who could be rich by making gold of the stones under his feet, yet is poor of choice? The Greeks would call him a philosopher, said Eris. Nay, daughter, said Balthazar. The philosophers never had the power to do such thing. How know you this man has? Ben-Hur answered quickly. I saw him turn water into wine. Very strange, uh, very strange, said Simonides. But it is not so strange to me as that he should prefer to live poor when he could be rich. Is he so poor? He owns nothing and envies nobody his owning. He pities the rich. But passing that, what would you say to see a man multiply seven loaves and two fishes, all his store, and into enough to feed five thousand people and have full baskets over it? That I saw the Nazarene do. Uh, you saw it? exclaimed Simonides. I and ate of the bread and fish. More marvelous still. Ben Hur continued. What would you say of a man in whom there is such healing virtue that the sick have but to touch the hem of his garment to be cured, or cry to him afar? 
that too i witnessed not once but many times as we came out of jericho two blind men by the wayside called to the nazarene and he touched their eyes and they saw so they brought a palsied man to him and he said merely go into thy house and the man went away well what say you to these things the merchant had no answer think you now as i have heard others argue that what i have told you are tricks of jugglery let me answer by recalling greater things which i have seen him do look first to that curse of god comfortless as you all know except by death leprosy at these words amra dropped her hands to the floor and in her eagerness to hear him half arose what would you say said ben hur with increased earnestness what would you say to have seen that i now tell you a leper came to the nazarene while i was with him down in galilee and he said lord if thou wilt thou canst make me clean he heard the cry and touched the outcast with his hand saying be thou clean and forthwith the man was himself again healthful as any of us who beheld the cure and we were a multitude here amra arose and with her gaunt fingers held the wiry locks from her eyes the brain of the poor creature had long since gone to heart and she was troubled to follow the speech then again said ben hur without stop ten lepers came to him one day in a body and falling at his feet called out i saw and heard it all called out master master have mercy upon us he told them go show yourselves to the priest as the law requires and before you are come there ye shall be healed and were they yes on the road going their infirmity left them so that there was nothing to remind us of it except their polluted clothes such thing was never heard before never in all israel said simonides in undertone and then while he was speaking amra turned away and walked noiselessly to the door and went out and none of the company saw her go the thought stirred by such things down under my eyes i leave you to imagine said ben hur continuing but my doubts my misgivings my amazement were not yet at the full the people of galilee are as you know impetuous and rash after years of waiting their swords burn their hands nothing would do them but action he is slow to declare himself let us force him they cried to me and i too became impatient if he is to be king why not now the legions are ready so as he was once teaching by the seaside we would have crowned him whether or not but he disappeared and when his next seen on a ship departing from the shore good simonides the desires that make other men mad riches power even kingships offered out of great love by a great people move this one not at all what say you the merchant's chin was low upon his breast raising his head he replied resolutely the lord liveth and so do the words of his prophets time is in the green yet let to-morrow answer be it so said balthazar smiling and ben hur said be it so then he went on but i have not yet done from these things not too great to be above suspicion by such as did not see them in performance as i did let me carry you now to others infinitely greater i acknowledge since the world began to be past the power of man tell me has any one to your knowledge ever reached out and taken from death what death has made his own who ever gave again the breath of a life lost who but god said balthazar reverently ben hur bowed o oh, wise egyptian i may not refuse the name you lend me what would you or you simonides what would you either or both have said had you seen as i did a man with few words and no ceremony without effort more than a mother's when she speaks to wake her child asleep undo the work of death it was down at nain we were about going into the gate when a company came out bearing a dead man the nazarene stopped to let the train pass there was a woman among them crying i saw his face soften with pity he spoke to her and then went and touched the bahir and said to him who lay upon it dressed for burial young man i say unto thee arise and instantly the dead sat up and talked god only is so great said balthazar to simonides mark you ben hur proceeded i do but tell you things of which i was a witness together with a cloud of other men on the way hither i saw 
another act still more mighty in bethany there was a man named lazarus who died and was buried and after he had lain four days in a tomb shut by a great stone the nazarene was shown to the place upon rolling the stone away we beheld the man lying inside bound and rotting there were many people standing by and we all heard what the nazarene said for he spoke in a loud voice lazarus come forth i cannot tell you my feelings when in answer as it were the man arose and came out to us with all his sermons about him loose him said the nazarene next loose him and let him go and when the napkin was taken from the face of the resurrected lo my friends the blood ran anew through the wasted body and he was exactly as he had been in life before the sickness that took him he lives yet and is hourly seen and spoken to you you may go see him to-morrow and now as nothing more is needed for the purpose i ask you that which i came to ask it being but a repetition of what you asked me o simonides what more than a man is this nazarene the question was put solemnly and long after midnight the company sat and debated it simonides being yet unwilling to give up his understanding of the sayings of the prophets and ben hur contending that the elder disputants were both right that the nazarene was a redeemer as claimed by balthazar and also the destined king the merchant would have to-morrow we will see peace to you all so saying ben hur took his leave intending to return to bethany End of chapter 2book eight chapter three of ben hur by lou wallace this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter three the first person to go out of the city upon the opening of the sheep's gate next morning was amra basket on arm no questions were asked her by the keepers since the morning itself had not been more regular in coming than she they knew her somebody's faithful servant, and that was enough for them. Down the eastern valley she took her way. The side of Olivet, darkly green, was spotted with white tents, recently put up by people attending the feast. The hour, however, was too early for the strangers to be abroad. Still, had it not been so, no one would have troubled her. Past Gethsemane, past the tombs at the meeting of the Bethany Roads, past the sepulchral village of Siloam, she went occasionally the decrepit little body staggered once she sat down to get her breath rising shortly she struggled on with renewed haste the great rocks on either hand if they had ears might have heard her mutter to herself could they have seen it would have been to observe how frequently she looked up over the mount reproving the dawn for its promptness if it had been possible for them to gossip not improbably they would have said to each other our friend is an hurry this morning the mouth she goes to feed must be very hungry. When at last she reached the king's garden, she slackened her gait, for then the grim city of the lepers was in view, extending far round pitted south hill of Hinnom. As the reader must by this time have surmised, she was going to her mistress, whose tomb, it will be remembered, overlooked the well on Rogo. Early as it was, the unhappy woman was up and sitting outside, leaving terza asleep within the course of the malady had been terribly swift in the three years conscious of her appearance with the refined instincts of her nature she kept her whole person habitually covered seldom as possible she permitted even terza to see her this morning she was taking the air with bared head knowing there was no one to be shocked by the exposure the light was not full but enough to show the ravages to which she had been subject her hair was snow-white and unmanageably coarse, falling over her back and shoulders like so much silver wire. The eyelids, the lips, the nostrils, the flesh of the cheeks were either gone or reduced to fetid rawness. The neck was a mass of ash-colored scales. One hand lay outside the folds of her habit, rigid as that of a skeleton. The nails had been eaten away. The joints of the fingers, if not bare to the bone, were swollen knots crusted with red secretion. Head, face, neck, and hand indicated all too plainly the condition of the whole body. Seeing her thus, it was easy to understand how the once fair widow of the princely her had been able to maintain her incognito so well through such a period of years. 
when the sun would gild the crest of olivet in the mount of offense with light sharper and more brilliant in that old land than in the west she knew amra would come first to the well then to a stone midway the well and the foot of the hill on which she had her abode and that the good servant would there deposit the food she carried in the basket and fill the water jar afresh for the day of her former plenitude of happiness that brief visit was all that remained to the unfortunate she could then ask about her son and be told of his welfare with such bits of news concerning him as a messenger could glean usually the information was meagre enough yet comforting at times she heard he was at home then she would issue from her dreary cell at break of day and sit till noon and from noon to set of sun a motionless figure draped in white looking statue-like invariably to one point over the temple to the spot under the rounded sky where the old house stood dear in memory and dearer because he was there nothing else was left her hers she counted of the dead and as for herself she simply waited the end knowing that every hour of life was an hour of dying happily a painless dying the things of nature about the hill to keep her sensitive to the world's attractions were wretchedly scant beasts and birds avoided the place as if they knew its history and present use every green thing perished in the first season the winds warred upon the shrubs and venturous grasses leaving to drought such as they could not uproot look where she would the view was made depressingly suggested by tombs tombs above her tombs below tombs opposite her own tomb all now freshly whitened in warning to visiting pilgrims in the sky clear fair inviting one would think she might have found some relief to her ache of mind but alas in making the beautiful elsewhere the sun served her never so unfriendly it did but disclose her growing hideousness but for the sun she would not have been the horror she was to herself nor been waked so cruelly from dreams of terza as she used to be the gift of seeing can be sometimes a dreadful curse does one ask why she did not make an end to her sufferings the law forbade her a gentile may smile at the answer but so will not a son of israel while she sat there peopling the dusky solitude with thoughts even more cheerless suddenly a woman came up the hill staggering and spent with exertion the widow arose hastily and covering her head cried in a voice unnaturally harsh unclean unclean in a moment heedless of the notice amron was at her feet all the long pent love of the simple creature burst forth with tears and passionate exclamations she kissed her mistress's garments and for a while the latter strove to escape from her then seeing she could not she waited till the violence of the paroxysm was over what have you done amra she said is it by such disobedience you prove your love for us wicked woman you are lost and he your master you can never never go back to him amra grovelled sobbing in the dust the ban of the law is upon you too you cannot return to jerusalem what will become of us who will bring us bread oh wicked wicked amra we are all all undone alike mercy mercy amra answered from the ground you should have been merciful to yourself and by so doing be most merciful to us now where can we fly there is no one to help us oh false servant the wrath of the lord was already too heavy upon us here terza awakened by the noise appeared at the door of the tomb the pen shrinks from the picture she presented in the half-clad apparition patched with scales lividly seen nearly blind its limbs and extremities swollen to grotesque largeness familiar eyes however sharpened by love could not have recognized the creature of childish grace and purity we first beheld her is it amra mother the servant tried to crawl to her also stay amra the widow cried imperiously i forbid you touching her rise and get you gone before any at the well see you here nay i forgot it is too late you must remain now and share our doom rise i say amra rose to her knees and said brokenly and with clasped hands oh good mistress i am not false i am not wicked i bring you good tidings of judah and as she spoke the widow half withdrew the cloth from her head there is a wonderful man amra continued who has power to cure you he speaks a word and the sick are made well 
and even the dead come to life. I have come to take you to him. Poor Amra, said Terza compassionately. No, cried Amra, detecting the doubt underlying the expression. No, as the Lord lives, even the Lord of Israel, my God as well as yours, I speak the truth. Go with me, I pray, and lose no time. This morning he will pass by on his way to the city. See, the day is at hand. Take the food here, eat, and let us go. The mother listened eagerly. Not unlikely she had heard of the wonderful man, for by this time his fame had penetrated every nook in the land. Who is he? she asked. A Nazarene. Who told you about him? Judah. Judah told you? Is he at home? He came last night. The widow, trying to still the beating of her heart, was silent for a while. Did Judah send you to tell us? She next asked. No, he believes you dead. There was a prophet once who cured a leper. The mother said thoughtfully to Terza. But he had his power from God. Then, addressing Amra, she asked. How does my son know this man so possesses it? He was travelling with him, and heard the lepers cry, and saw them go away well. First there was one man, then there were ten, and they were all made whole. The elder listener was silent again. The skeleton hand shook. We may believe she was struggling to give the story the sanction of faith, which is always an absolutist in demand, and that it was with her as with the men of the day, eyewitnesses of what was done by the Christ, as well as the myriads who have succeeded him. She did not question the performance, for her own son was a witness testifying through the servant but she strove to comprehend the power by which work so astonishing could be done by a man. Well enough to make inquiry as to the fact, to comprehend the power. On the other hand, it is first necessary to comprehend God, and he who waits for that will die waiting. With her, however, the hesitation was brief. To Terza, she said, This must be the Messiah. She spoke not coldly, like one reasoning a doubt away, but as a woman of Israel, familiar with the promises of God to her race, a woman of understanding, ready to be glad over the least sign of the realization of the promises. There was a time when Jerusalem and all Judea were filled with a story that he was born. I remember it. By this time he should be a man. It must be. It is he. Yes, she said to Amra. Yes. We will go with you. Bring the water which you will find in the tomb in the jar, and set the food for us. We will eat and be gone. The breakfast, partaken under excitement, was soon dispatched, and the three women set out on their extraordinary journey. As Terza had caught the confident spirit of the others, there was but one fear that troubled the party. Bethany, Amra said, was the town the man was coming from. Now from that to Jerusalem there were three roads, or rather paths, one over the first summit of Olivet, a second at its base a third between the second summit and the Mount of Offense. The three were not far apart, far enough, however, to make it possible for the unfortunates to miss the Nazarene if they failed the one he chose to come by. A little questioning satisfied the mother that Amra knew nothing of the country beyond the Cedron, and even less of the intentions of the man they were going to see, if they could. She discerned also that both Amra and Terza, the one from confirmed habits of servitude, the other from natural dependency, looked at her for guidance, and she accepted the charge. We will go first to Bethpage, she said to them. There, if the Lord favor us, we may learn what else to do. They descended the hill to Tophet in the king's garden, and paused in the deep trail furrowed through them by centuries of wayfaring. I am afraid of the road, the matron said. Better that we keep to the country among the rocks and trees. This is feast day, and on the hillsides yonder I see signs of a great multitude in attendance. By going across the Mount of Offense here, we may avoid them. Terza had been walking with great difficulty. Upon hearing this, her heart began to fail her. The Mount is steep, Mother. I cannot climb it. Remember, we are going to find health and life. See, my child, how the day brightens around us. And yonder are women coming this way to the well. They will stone us if we stay here. Come, be strong this once. Thus the mother, not less tortured herself, sought to inspire the daughter, and Amr came to her aid. To this time, the latter had not touched the persons of the afflicted, nor they her. Now, in disregard of consequences as well as of command, 
the faithful creature went to terza and put her arm over her shoulder and whispered lean on me i am strong though i am old and it is but a little way off there now we can go the face of the hill they essayed to cross was somewhat broken with pits and ruins of old structures but when at last they stood upon the top to rest and looked at the spectacle presented them over in the northwest at the temple and its courtly terraces at zion at the enduring towers white beetling into the sky beyond the mother was strengthened with a love of life for life's sake look tirza she said look at the plates of gold on the gate beautiful how they give back the flames of the sun brightness for brightness do you remember we used to go up there will it not be pleasant to do so again and think home is but a little way off i can almost see it over the roof of the holy of holies and judah will be there to receive us from the side of the middle summit garnished green with myrtle and olive trees they saw upon looking that way next thin columns of smoke rising lightly and straight up into the pulseless morning each a warning of restless pilgrims astir and of the flight of the pitiless hours and the need of haste though the good servant told faithfully to lighten the labor in descending the hillside not sparing herself in the least the girl moaned at every step sometimes in extremity of anguish she cried out upon reaching the road that is the road between the mount of offense and the middle or second summit of olivet she fell down exhausted go on with amra mother and leave me here she said faintly no no tirsa what would the gain be to me if i were healed and you not when judah asks for you as he will what would i have to say to him were i to leave you tell him i loved him the elder leper arose from bending over the fainting sufferer and gazed about her with that sensation of hope perishing which is more nearly like annihilation of the soul than anything else the supremest joy of the thought of cure was inseparable from terza who was not too old to forget in the happiness of healthful life to come the years of misery by which she had been so reduced in body and broken in spirit even as the brave woman was about to leave the venture they were engaged into the determination of god she saw a man on foot coming rapidly up the road from the east courage tirza be of cheer she said yonder i know is one to tell us of the nazarene amra helped the girl to a sitting posture and supported her while the man advanced in your goodness mother you forget what we are the stranger will go around us his best gift to us will be a curse if not a stone we will see there was no other answer to be given since the mother was too well and sadly acquainted with the treatment outcasts of the class to which she belonged were accustomed to at the hands of her countrymen as had been said the road at the edge of which the group was posted was little more than a worn path or trail winding crookedly through tumuli of limestone if the stranger kept it he must meet them face to face and he did so until near enough to hear the cry she was bound to give then uncovering her head a further demand of the law she shouted shrilly unclean unclean to her surprise the man came steadily on what would you have he asked stopping opposite them not four yards off thou seest us have a care the mother said with dignity woman i am a courier of him who speaketh but once to such as thou and they are healed i am not afraid the nazarene the messiah he said is it true that he cometh to the city to-day he is now at bethphage on what road master this one she clasped her hands and looked up thankfully for whom takest thou him the man asked with pity the son of god she replied stay thou here then or as there is a multitude with him take thy stand by the rock yonder the white one under the tree and as he goeth by fail not to call to him call and fear not if thy faith but equal thy knowledge he will hear thee though all the heavens thunder i go to tell israel assembled in and about the city that he is at hand and to make ready to receive him peace to thee and thine woman the stranger moved on did you hear tirza did you hear the nazarene is on the road on this one and he will hear us once more my child oh only once and let us to the rock it is but a step thus encouraged tirza took amra's hand and arose but as they were going amra said stay the man is returning and they waited for him i pray your grace woman he said upon overtaking them remembering that the sun will be hot before the nazarene arrives and that the city is near by to give me refreshment should i need it 
I thought this water would do thee better than it will me. Take it and be of good cheer. Call to him as he passes. He followed the words by offering her a gourd full of water, such as foot travelers sometimes carried with them in their journeys across the hills. And instead of placing the gift on the ground for her to take up when he was at a safe distance, he gave it into her hand. Art thou a Jew? she asked, surprised. I am that, and better, I am a disciple of the Christ, who teacheth daily by word and example this thing which I have done unto you. The world hath long known the word charity without understanding it. Again, I say peace and good cheer to thee and thine. He went on, and they went slowly to the rock he had pointed out to them, high as their heads, and scarcely thirty yards from the road on the right. Standing in front of it, the mother satisfied herself they could be seen and heard plainly by passers-by, whose notice they desired to attract. There they cast themselves under the tree in its shade, and drank of the gourd, and rested refreshed. Ere long Terza slept, and fearing to disturb her, the others held their peace. End of chapter 3book eighth chapter four of ben hur by lou wallace this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter four during the third hour the road in front of the resting place of the lepers became gradually more and more frequented by people going in the direction of bethphage and bethany now however about the commencement of the fourth hour a great crowd appeared over the crest of Olivet, and as it defiled down the road thousands in number, the two watchers noticed with wonder that every one in it carried a palm branch freshly cut. As they sat absorbed by the novelty, the noise of another multitude approaching from the east drew their eyes that way. Then the mother awoke Terza. What is the meaning of it all? The latter asked. He is coming, answered the mother. These we see are from the city going to meet him. Those we hear in the east are his friends, bearing him company and it will not be strange if the processions meet here before us. I fear if they do we cannot be heard. The same thought was in the elder's mind. Amra, she asked, when Judah spoke of the healing of the ten, in what words did he say they called to the Nazarene? Either they said, Lord have mercy upon us, or Master have mercy. Only that. No more that I heard. Yes, it was enough, the mother added to herself. Yes, said Amra. Judah said he saw them go away well. Meantime, the people in the east came up slowly. When at length the foremost of them were in sight, the gaze of the lepers fixed upon a man riding in the midst of what seemed a chosen company, which sang and danced about him in extravagance of joy. The rider was bareheaded and clad all in white. When he was in distance to be more clearly observed, these, looking anxiously, saw an olive-hued face shaded by long chestnut hair slightly sunburned and parted in the middle. He looked neither to the right nor left. In the noisy abandon of his followers, he appeared to have no part, nor did their favor disturb him in the least, or raise him out of the profound melancholy into which, as his countenance showed, he was plunged. The sun beat upon the back of his head, and lighting up the floating hair gave it a delicate likeness to a golden nimbus. Behind him the irregular procession, pouring forward with continuous singing and shouting, extended out of view. There was no need of any one to tell the lepers that this was he, the wonderful Nazarene. He is here, Tirza, the mother said. He is here. Come, my child. As she spoke, she glided in front of the white rock and fell upon her knees. Directly, the daughter and servant were by her side. Then at sight of the procession in the west, the thousands from the city halted and began to wave their green branches, shouting, or rather chanting, for it was all in one voice. Blessed, Blessed is the king, the king of, of Israel, Israel that cometh that come in the name, name of the Lord. And all the thousands who were of the rider's company, both those near and those afar, replied so the air shook with the sound, which was as a great wind rushing the side of the hill. Amidst the din, the cries of the poor lepers were not more than the twittering of day's sparrows. The moment of the meeting of the host was come, and with it the opportunity the sufferers were seeking, if not taking, it would be lost forever, and they would be lost as well. Nearer, my child. Let us get nearer. He cannot hear us, said the mother. She arose and staggered forward. Her ghastly hands were up, and she screamed with horrible shrillness. The people saw her, saw her hideous face, and stopped awestruck, an effect for which extreme human misery, visible as in this instance, 
is as potent as majesty in purple and gold. Terza, behind her a little way, fell down too faint and frightened to follow farther. The lepers! The lepers! Stone them! They have cursed of God! Kill them! These, with other yells of like import, broke in upon the hosannas of the part of the multitude too far removed to see and understand the cause of the interruption. Some there were, however, nearby familiar with the nature of the man to whom the unfortunates were appealing. Some who, by long intercourse with him, had caught somewhat of his divine compassion. They gazed at him, and were silent while, in fair view, he rode up and stopped in front of the woman. She also beheld his face, calm, pitiful, and of exceeding beauty, the large eyes tender with benignant purpose. And this was the colloquy that ensued. Oh, master, master, thou seest our need. Thou canst make us clean. Have mercy upon us. Mercy. Believest thou I am able to do this? He asked. Thou art he of whom the prophet spake. Thou art a messiah, she replied. His eyes grew radiant, his manner confident. Woman, he said, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. He lingered an instant after, apparently unconscious of the presence of the throng. An instant, then he rode away. To the heart divinely original, yet so human in all the better elements of humanity, going with sure provision to a death of all the inventions of men, the foulest and most cruel, breathing even then in the forecast shadow of the awful event, and still as hungry and thirsty for love and faith as in the beginning. How precious and ineffably soothing the farewell exclamation of the grateful woman. To God in the highest glory, blessed, thrice blessed, the sum whom he hath given us. Immediately both the hosts, that from the city and that from Bethphage closed around him with their joyous demonstrations, with hosannas and waving of palms, and so he passed from the lepers forever. Covering her head, the elder hastened to Terza and folded her in her arms, crying, Daughter, look up. I have his promise. He is indeed the Messiah. We are saved. Saved. And the two remained kneeling while the procession, slowly going, disappeared over the mount. When the noise of its singing afar was a sound scarcely heard, the miracle began. There was first in the hearts of the lepers a freshening of the blood. Then it flowed faster and stronger, thrilling their wasted bodies with an infinitely sweet sense of painless healing. Each felt the scourge going from her. Their strength revived. They were returning to be themselves, directly, as if to make the purification complete. From body to spirit the quickening ran, exalting them to a very fervor of ecstasy. The power possessing them to do this good in was most nearly that of a draught of swift and happy effect, yet it was unlike and superior in that its healing and cleansing were absolute, and not merely a delicious consciousness while in progress, but the planning, growing, and maturing all at once of a recollection so singular and so holy, that the simple thought of it should be of itself ever after a formless yet perfect thanksgiving. To this transformation, for such it may be called quite as properly as a cure, there was a witness other than Amra. The reader will remember the constancy with which Ben-Hur had followed the Nazarene throughout his wanderings, and now, recalling the conversation of the night before, there will be little surprise at learning that the young Jew was present when the leprous woman appeared in the path of the pilgrims. He heard a prayer and saw her disfigured face. He heard the answer also and was not so accustomed to incidents of the kind, frequent as they had been, as to have lost interest in them. Had such thing been possible with him, still the bitter disputation always excited by the simplest display of the master's curative gift would have sufficed to keep his curiosity alive. Besides that, if not above it as an incentive, his hope to satisfy himself upon the vexed question of the mission of the mysterious man was still upon him strong as in the beginning. He might indeed say even stronger, because of a belief that now quickly, before the sun went down, the man himself would make all known by public proclamation. At the close of the scene, consequently, Ben-Hur had withdrawn from the procession and seated himself upon a stone to wait its passage. From his place he nodded recognition to many of the people, Galileans in his league, carrying short swords under their long abbas. After a little, a swarthy Arab came up, leading two horses. At a sign from Ben-Hur, he also drew out. Stay here, the young master said, when all were gone by, even the laggards. I wish to be at the city early, and Aldebaran must do me service. 
he stroked the broad forehead of the horse, now in his prime of strength and beauty, then crossed the road towards the two women. They were to him, it should be borne in mind, strangers in whom he felt interest only as they were subjects of a superhuman experiment, the result of which might possibly help him to solution of the mystery that had so long engaged him. As he proceeded, he glanced casually at the figure of the little woman over by the white rock, standing there, her face hidden in her hands. As the Lord liveth, it is Amra, he said to himself. He hurried on, and passing by the mother and daughter, still without recognizing them, he stopped before the servant. Amra, he said to her. Amra, what do you hear? She rushed forward, and fell upon her knees before him, blinded by her tears, nigh speechless with contending joy and fear. Oh, master, master, thine God and mine, how good he is. The knowledge we gain from much sympathy with others passing through trials is but vaguely understood, strangely enough. It enables us, among other things, to merge our identity into theirs often so completely that their sorrows and their delights become our own. So poor Amra, aloof and hiding her face, knew the transformation the lepers were undergoing without a word spoken to her, knew it, and shared all their feeling to the full. Her countenance, her words, her whole manner betrayed her condition and with swift presentiment he connected it with the women he had just passed. He felt her presence there at that time was in some way associated with them, and turned hastily as they arose to their feet. His heart stood still. He became rooted in his tracks, dumb past outcry, awestruck. The woman he had seen before the Nazarene was standing with her hands clasped and eyes streaming, looking towards heaven. The mere transformation would have been a sufficient surprise but it was the least of the causes of his emotion. Could he be mistaken? Never was there in life a stranger so like his mother, and like her as she was the day the Romans snatched her from him. There was but one difference to mar the identity. The hair of this person was a little streaked with gray, yet that was not impossible of reconcilement, since the intelligence which had directed the miracle might have taken in consideration the natural effects of the passage of years. And who was it by her side, if not Terza? Fair, beautiful, perfect, more mature, but in all other respects exactly the same in appearance as when she looked with him over the parapet the morning of the accident to Gratus. He had given them over as dead, and time had accustomed him to the bereavement. He had not ceased mourning for them, yet as something distinguishable, they had simply dropped out of his plans and dreams. Scarcely believing his senses, he laid his hand upon the servant's head and asked tremulously, Amra, Amra, my mother, Terza, Tell me if I see her right. Speak to them, O oh master, speak to them, she said. He waited no longer, but ran with outstretched arms, crying, Mother, mother, Terza, here I am. They heard his call, and with a cry, as loving started to meet him. Suddenly the mother stopped, drew back, and uttered the old alarm. Stay, Judah, my son, come not nearer. Unclean, unclean. The utterance was not from habit grown since the dread disease struck her as much as fear, and the fear was but another form of the ever thoughtful maternal love. Though they were healed in person, the taint of the scourge might be in their garments ready for communication. He had no such thought. They were before him. He called them. They had answered. Who or what should keep them from him now? Next moment the three, so long separated, were mingling their tears in each other's arms. The first ecstasy over, the mother said, uh, in this happiness, oh, my children, let us not be ungrateful. Let us begin life anew by acknowledgment of him to whom we are all so indebted. They fell upon their knees, Amra with the rest, and the prayer of the elder outspoken was as a psalm. Terza repeated it word for word. So it had been her, but not with the same clear mind and questionless faith. For when they were risen, he asked, In Nazareth, where the man was born, mother, they call him the son of a carpenter. What is he? Her eyes rested upon him with all their old tenderness, and she answered as she had answered the Nazarene himself. He is the Messiah. And whence has he his power? We may know by the use he makes of it. Can you tell me any ill he has done? No. By that sign then I answer, he has his power from God. It is not an easy thing to shake off in a moment the expectations nurtured through years until they have become essentially a part of us. And though Ben-Hur asked himself what the vanities of the world were to such a one, 
His ambition was obdurate and would not down. He persisted as men do yet every day in measuring the Christ by himself. How much better if we measured ourselves by the Christ? Naturally, the mother was the first to think of the cares of life. What shall we do now, my son? Where shall we go? Then Ben-Hur, recalled to duty, observed how completely every trace of the scourge had disappeared from his restored people, that each had back her perfection of person, that, as with Naaman, when he came up out of the water, their flesh had come again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he took off his cloak and threw it over Terza. Take it, he said, smiling. The eye of the stranger would have shunned you before. Now it shall not offend you. The act exposed a sword belted to his side. Is it a time for war? asked the mother anxiously. No. Why then are you armed? It may be necessary to defend the Nazarene. Thus Ben-Hur evaded the whole truth. Has he enemies? Who are they? Alas, mother, they are not all Romans. Is he not of Israel, and a man of peace? There was never one more so, but in the opinion of the rabbis and teachers he is guilty of a great crime. What crime? In his eye, the uncircumcised gentle is as worthy favor as a Jew of the strictest habit. He preaches a new dispensation. The mother was silent, and they moved to the shade of the tree by the rock. Calming his impatience to have them home again and hear their story, he showed them the necessity of obedience to the law governing in cases like theirs, and in conclusion called the Arab, bidding him take the horses to the gate by Bethesda and await him there, whereupon they set out by the way of the Mount of Offense. The return was very different from the coming. They walked rapidly and with ease, and in good time reached the tomb newly made near that of Absalom, overlooking the deaths of Sadron. Finding it unoccupied, the women took possession, while he went on hastily to make the preparations required for their new condition. End of chapter 4「Eighth, Chapter Five of Ben Hur by Lou Wallace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Five. Ben Hur pitched two tents out on the upper Sadron, east a short space of the tombs of the kings, and furnished them with every comfort at his command, and thither, without loss of time. He conducted his mother and sister to remain until the examining priest could certify their perfect cleansing. In course of the duty, the young man had subjected himself to such serious defilement as to debar him from participation in the ceremonies of the great feast, then near at hand. He could not enter the least sacred of the courts of the temple. Of necessity, not less than choice, therefore, he stayed at the tents with his beloved people. There was a great deal to hear from them and a great deal to tell them of himself. Stories such as theirs, sad experiences extending through a lapse of years, sufferings of body, acuter sufferings of mind, are usually long in the telling, the incidents seldom following each other in threaded connection. He listened to the narrative and all they told him, with outward patience masking inward feeling. In fact, his hatred of Rome and Romans reached a higher mark than ever. His desire for vengeance became a thirst, which attempts at reflection only intensified. In the almost savage bitterness of his humor, many mad impulses took hold of him. The opportunities of the highways presented themselves with singular force of temptation. He thought seriously of insurrection in Galilee. Even the sea, ordinarily a retrospective pour to him, stretched itself map-like before his fancy laced and interlaced with lines of passage crowded with imperial plunder and imperial travelers but the better judgment matured in calmer hours was happily too firmly fixed to be supplanted by present passion however strong each mental venture in reach of new expedients brought him back to the old conclusion that there could be no sound success except in a war involving all israel in solid union and all musing upon the subject all inquiry all hope ended where they began, in the Nazarene and his purposes. At odd moments, the excited schemer found a pleasure in fashioning a speech for that person. Hear, O Israel, I am he, the promised of God, born king of the Jews, come to you with the dominion spoken of by the prophets. Rise now, and lay hold on the world. Would the Nazarene but speak these few words? What a tumult would follow! 
How many mouths performing the office of trumpets would take them up and blow them abroad for the massing of armies? Would he speak them? And eager to begin the work, in answering in the wordly way, Ben-Hur lost sight of the double nature of the man, and of the other possibility, that the divine in him might transcend the human. In the miracle of which Terza and his mother were the witnesses, even more nearly than himself, he saw and set apart and dwelt upon a power ample enough to raise and support a Jewish crown over the wrecks of the Italian, and more than ample to remodel society and convert mankind into one purified happy family. And when that work was done, could anyone say the peace which might then be ordered without hindrance was not a mission worthy a son of God? Could anyone then deny the redeemership of the Christ? And discarding all consideration of political consequences, what unspeakable personal glory there would then be to him as a man. It was not in the nature of any mere mortal to refuse such a career. Meantime down the Sadrin, and in towards Vesuva, especially on the roadsides quite up to the Damascus Gate, the country filled rapidly with all kinds of temporary shelters for pilgrims to the Passover. Ben-Hur visited the strangers and talked with them, and returning to his tents, he was each time more and more astonished at the vastness of their numbers. And when he further discovered that every part of the world was represented among them, cities upon both shores of the Mediterranean far off as the pillars of the west, river towns in distant India, provinces in northernmost Europe, and that though they frequently saluted him with tongues unacquainted with the syllable of the old Hebrew of the fathers, these representatives had all the same object, celebration of the notable feast. An idea tinged mistily with superstitious fancy forced itself upon him. Might he not, after all, have misunderstood the Nazarene? Might not that person, by patient waiting, be covering silent preparation, and proving his fitness for the glorious task before him? How much better this time for the movement than that other when, by Gennesaret, the Galileans would have forced assumption of the crown? Then the support would have been limited to a few thousands. Now his proclamation would be responded to by millions. Who would say how many? Pursuing this theory to its conclusions, Ben-Hur moved amidst brilliant promises, and glowed with the thought that the melancholy man, under gentle seeming and wondrous self-denial, was in fact carrying in disguise the subtlety of a politician and the genius of a soldier. Several times also, in the meanwhile, low-set, brawny men, bareheaded and black-bearded, came and asked for Ben-Hur at the tent. His interviews with them were always apart, and to his mother's question who they were, he answered, Some good friends of mine from Galilee. Through them he kept informed of the movements of the Nazarene, and of the schemes of the Nazarene's enemies, rabbinical and Roman. That the good man's life was in danger, he knew, but that there were any bold enough to attempt to take it at that time, he could not believe. It seemed too securely entrenched in a great fame and an assured popularity. The very vastness of the attendants in and about the city, brought with it a seeming guarantee of safety. And yet to say truth, Ben-Hur's confidence rested most certainly upon the miraculous power of the Christ. Pondering the subject in the purely human view that the master of such authority over life and death, used so frequently for the good of others, would not exert it in care of himself was simply as much past belief as it was past understanding. Nor should it be forgotten that all these were incidents of occurrence between the 21st day of March, counting by the modern calendar, and the 25th. The evening of the latter day Ben-Hur yielded to his impatience, and rode to the city, leaving behind him a promise to return in the night. The horse was fresh, and choosing his own gait, sped swiftly. The eyes of the clambering vines winked at the rider from the garden fences on the way. There was nothing else to see him, nor child, nor woman, nor man. Through the rocky float and the hollows of the road, the agate hoofs drummed, ringing like cups of steel, but without notice from any stranger. In the houses past, there were no tenants. The fires by the tent doors were out. The road was deserted, for this was the first Passover Eve and the hour between the evenings, when the visiting millions crowded the city, and the slaughter of lambs and offering reeked the forecourts of the temple, and the priest in ordered lines caught the flowing blood and carried it swiftly to the dripping altars. When all was haste and hurry, racing with the stars fast coming with the signal after which the roasting and the eating and the singing might go on, but not the preparation more. Through the great northern gate the rider rode, and lo, Jerusalem before the fall, in ripeness of glory, illuminated for the Lord. End of chapter 5
Book Eight, Chapter Six of Ben Hur by Lou Wallace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Six. Ben Hur alighted at the gate of the Khan, from which the three wise men, more than thirty years before, departed, going down to Bethlehem. There, in keeping of his Arab followers, he left the horse, and shortly after was at the wicket of his father's house, and in a yet briefer space in the great chamber. He called for Malik first. That worthy being out, he sent a salutation to his friends, the merchant and the Egyptian. They were being carried abroad to see the celebration. The latter, he was informed, was very feeble, and in a state of deep dejection. Young people of that time, who were supposed hardly to know their own hearts, indulged the habit of politic indirection, quite as much as young people in the same condition indulge it in this time. So when Ben-Hur inquired for the good Balthazar, and with grave courtesy desired to know if he would be pleased to see him, he really addressed the daughter a notice of his arrival. While the servant was answering for the elder, the curtain of the doorway was drawn aside, and the younger Egyptian came in, and walked, or floated, up borne in a white cloud of the gauzy raiment she so loved and lived in, to the centre of the chamber, where the light cast by lamps from the seven-armed brazen stick planted upon the floor was the strongest. With her there was no fear of light. The servant left the two alone. In the excitement occasioned by the events of the few days past, Ben-Hur had scarcely given a thought to the fair Egyptian. If she came to his mind at all, it was merely as a briefest pleasure, a suggestion of the delight which could wait for him, and was waiting. But now the influence of the woman revived with all its force the instant Ben-Hur beheld her. He advanced to her eagerly, but stopped and gazed. Such a change he had never seen. Theretofore she had been a lover studious to win him. In manner all warmth, each glance at admission, each action and avowal. She had showered him with incense of flattery. While he was present she had impressed him with her admiration. Going away he carried the impression with him to remain a delicious expectancy hastening his return. It was for him the painted eyelids drooped lowest over the lustrous almond eyes. For him the love stories caught from the professionals abounding in the streets of Alexandria were repeated with emphasis and lavishment of poetry. For him endless exclamations of sympathy and smiles and little privileges with hand and hair and cheek and lips, and songs of the Nile, and displays of jewelry and subtleties of lace and veils and scarfs, and other subtleties not less exquisite and flosses of Indian silk. The idea, old as the oldest of peoples, that beauty is the reward of the hero, had never such realism as she contrived for his pleasure insomuch that he could not doubt he was her hero. She avouched it in a thousand artful ways as natural with her as her beauty, winsome ways reserved, it would seem, by the passionate genius of old Egypt for its daughters. Such the Egyptian had been to Ben-Hur from the night of the boat-ride, on the lake in the orchard of palms. But now, elsewhere in this volume the reader may have observed a term of somewhat indefinite meaning, used reverently in a sacred connection. We repeat it now with a general application. There are few persons who have not a double nature, the real and the acquired, the latter a kind of addendum resulting from education, which in time often perfects it into a part of the being as unquestionable as the first. Leaving the thought to the thoughtful, we proceed to say that now the real nature of the Egyptian made itself manifest. It was not possible for her to have received a stranger with repulsion more incisive. Yet she was apparently as passionless as a statue. Only the small head was a little tilted, the nostrils a little drawn, and the sensuous lower lip pushed the upper, the least bit out of its natural curvature. She was the first to speak. Your coming is timely, O son of her, she said in a voice sharply distinct. I wish to thank you for hospitality. After tomorrow I may not have the opportunity to do so. Ben-Hur bowed slightly, without taking his eyes from her. I have heard of a custom which the dice-players observe with good result among themselves. 
she continued when the game is over they refer to their tables and cast up their accounts then they libate the gods and put a crown upon the happy winner we have had a game it has lasted through many days and nights why now that it is at an end shall we not see to which the chaplet belongs yet very watchful been her answered lightly a man may not balk a woman bent on having her way tell me she continued inclining her head and permitting the sneer to become positive tell me o prince of jerusalem where is he that son of the carpenter of nazareth and son not less of god from whom so lately such mighty things were expected he waved his hand impatiently and replied i am not his keeper the beautiful head sank forward yet lower has he broken rome to pieces again but with anger ben hur raised his hand in deprecation where has he seated his capital she proceeded cannot i go see his throne and his lions of bronze and his palace he has raised the dead and to such a one what is it to raise a golden house he has but to stamp his foot and say the word and the house is pillared like karnak and wanting nothing there was by this time slight ground left to believe her playing the questions were offensive and her manner pointed with unfriendliness seeing which he on his side became more wary and said with good humour o oh, egypt let us wait another day even another week for him the lions and the palace she went on without noticing the suggestion and how is it i see you in that garb such is not the habit of governors in india or vice-kings elsewhere i saw the satrap of teheran once and he wore a turban of silk and a cloak of cloth of gold and the hilt and scabbard of his sword made me dizzy with their splendour of precious stones i thought osiris had lent him a glory from the sun i fear you have not entered upon your kingdom the kingdom i was to share with you the daughter of my wise guest is kinder than she imagines herself she is teaching me that isis may kiss a heart without making it better ben hur spoke with cold courtesy and iris after playing with the pendant solitaire of her necklace of coins rejoined for a jew the son of a hur is clever i saw your dreaming caesar make his entry into jerusalem you told us he would that day proclaim himself king of the jews from the steps of the temple i beheld the procession descend the mountain bringing him i heard their singing they were beautiful with palms in motion i looked everywhere among them for a figure with a promise of royalty a horseman in purple a chariot with a driver in shining brass a stately warrior behind an orb shield rivalling his spear in stature i looked for his guard it would have been pleasant to see a prince of jerusalem in a cohort of the legions of galilee she flung her listener a glance of provoking disdain then laughed heartily as if the ludicrousness of the picture in her mind were too strong for contempt instead of a sestostris returning in triumph for a caesar held and sorted <laughs> i saw a man with a woman's face and hair riding an ass's colt and in tears the king the son of god the redeemer of the world <laughs> in spite of himself ben hur winced i did not quit my place o prince of jerusalem she said before he could recover i did not laugh i said to myself wait in the temple he will glorify himself as becomes a hero about to take possession of the world i saw him enter the gate of shushan in the court of the women i saw him stop and then stand before the gate beautiful there were people with me on the porch and in the courts and on the cloisters and on the steps of the three sides of the temple there were other people i will say a million of people all waiting breathlessly to hear his proclamation the pillars were not more still than we <laughs> i fancied i heard the axles of the mighty roman machine begin to crack <laughs> oh prince of by the soul of solomon your king of the world drew his gown about him and walked away and out by the furthest gate nor opened his mouth to say a word and the roman machine is running yet in simple homage to a hope that instant lost a hope which as it began to fall and while it was still falling he unconsciously followed with a parting look down to its disappearance ben-hur lowered his eyes at no previous time whether when balthazar was plying him with arguments or when miracles were being done before his face had the disputed nature of the nazarene been so plainly set before him the best way after all to reach an understanding of the divine is by study of the human in a thing superior to men we may always look to find god so with the picture given by the egyptian of the scene when the nazarene turned from the gate beautiful its central theme was an act utterly beyond performance by a man under control of merely human inspirations 
a parable to a parable-loving people. It taught what the Christ had so often asserted, that his mission was not political. There was not much more time for thought of all this than that allowed for a common respiration. Yet the idea took fast hold of Ben-Hur, and in the same instant he followed his hope of vengeance out of sight, and the man with the woman's face and hair and in tears came near to him, near enough to leave something of his spirit behind. Daughter of Balthazar, he said with dignity, if this be the game of which you spoke to me, take this chaplet, I accord it yours. Only let us make an end of words, that you have a purpose, I am sure. To it I pray, and I will answer you. Then let us go our several ways, and forget we ever met. Say on, I will listen, but not to-morrow of that which you have given me. She regarded him intently a moment, as if determining what to do. Possibly she might have been measuring his will. Then she said coldly, You have my leave. Go. Peace to you. He responded and walked away. As he was about passing out of the door, she called to him. A word. He stopped where he was and looked back. Consider all I know about you. O most fair Egyptian, he said, returning. What all do you know about me? She looked at him absently. You are more of a Roman son of her than any of your Hebrew brethren. Am I so unlike my countrymen? He asked indifferently. The demigods are all Roman now, she rejoined. And therefore you will tell me what more you know about me? The likeness is out lost upon me. It might induce me to save you. Save me? The pink-stained fingers toyed daintily with the lustrous pendant at the throat, and her voice was exceeding low and soft, only a tapping on the floor with her silken sandal admonished him to have a care. There was a Jew, an escaped galley-slave, who killed a man in the palace of Iderney. She began slowly. Ben-Hur was startled. The same Jew slew a Roman soldier before the marketplace here in Jerusalem. The same Jew has three trained legions from Galilee to seize the Roman governor to-night. The same Jew has alliances perfected for war upon Rome, and Ilderim the Sheik is one of his partners. Drawing nearer him, she almost whispered, You have lived in Rome. Suppose these things repeated in ears we know of. Ah, you changed color. He drew back from her with somewhat of the look which may be imagined upon the face of a man who— thinking to play with a kitten, as run upon a tiger. And she proceeded. You are acquainted in the antechamber, and know the Lord Sejanus. Suppose it were told him with proofs in hand, or without the proofs, that the same Jew is the richest man in the East. Nay, in all the empire, the fishes of the Tiber would have fattening other than that they dig out of its ooze, would they not? And while they were feeding, <laughs> son of her, what splendor there would be on exhibition in the circus! Amusing the Roman people is a fine art. Getting the money to keep them amused is another art even finer. And was there ever an artist the equal of the Lord Sejanus? Ben-Hur was not too much stirred by the evident baseness of the woman for recollection. Not unfrequently, when all the other faculties are numb and failing, memory does its offices with the greatest fidelity. The scene at the spring on the way to Jordan reproduced itself, and he remembered thinking then that Esther had betrayed him, and thinking so now, he said calmly as he could, To give you pleasure, daughter of Egypt, I acknowledge your cunning, and that I am at your mercy. It may also please you to hear me acknowledge I have no hope of your favor. I could kill you, but you are a woman. The desert is open to receive me, and though Rome is a good hunter of men, there she would follow long and far before she come, for in its heart there are wildernesses of spears as well as wildernesses of sand, and it is not unlovely to the unconquered Parthian. In the toils, as I am, dupe that I have been, yet there is one thing my due. Who told you all you know about me? In flight or captivity, dying even, there will be consolation in leaving the traitor, the curse of a man who has lived knowing nothing but wretchedness. Who told you all you know about me? It might have been a touch of art, or might have been sincere. That as it may, the expression of the Egyptian's face became sympathetic. There are in my country, O son of her, she said presently, Workmen, who make pictures by gathering the very colored shells here and there on the seashore after storms, and cutting them up, and patching the peaches, and inlaying on marble slabs. Can you not see the hint there is in the practice to such as go searching for secrets? Enough that from this person I gathered a handful of little circumstances, and from that other yet another handful, 
and that after a while I put them together, and was as happy as a woman can be who has at disposal the fortune of a life of man whom— She stopped and beat the floor with her foot, and looked away as if to hide a sudden emotion from him. With an air of even painful resolution, she presently finished the sentence. Whom she is at loss what to do with. No, it is not enough. Ben Hur said, unmoved by the play. It is not enough. Tomorrow you will determine what to do with me. I may die. True. She rejoined quickly and with emphasis. I had something from she Gildram as he lay with my father in a grove out in the desert. The night was still, very still, and the walls of the tent, sooth to say, were poor ward against ears outside listening to birds and beetles flying through the air. She smiled at the conceit, but proceeded. Some other things, bits of shell for the picture, I had from... Whom? The son of her himself. Was there no other who contributed? No, not one. Her drew a breath of relief, and said lightly, Thanks. It were not well to keep the Lord's Sahanas waiting for you. The desert is not so sensitive. Again, O oh Egypt, peace. To this time he had been standing uncovered. Now he took the handkerchief from his arms where it had been hanging, and adjusting it upon his head turned it apart. But she arrested him. In her eagerness she had even reached a hand to him. Stay, she said. He looked back at her, but without taking the hand, though it was very noticeable for its sparkling of jewels, and he knew by her manner that the reserved point of the scene, which was so surprising to him, was now to come. Stay, and do not distrust me, O son of her, if I declare I know why the noble Arius took you for his heir. And by Isis, by all the gods of Egypt, I swear I tremble to think of you so brave and generous under the hand of the remorseless minister. You have left a portion of your youth in the atria of the great capital. Consider, as I do, what the desert will be to you in contrast of life. Oh, I give you pity, pity, and if you but do what I say, I will save you. That also I swear by our holy Isis." Words of entreaty and prayer these poured forth volubly, and with earnestness and the mighty sanction of beauty. Almost, almost I believe you, Ben-Hur said, yet hesitatingly, and in a voice low and indistinct. For a doubt remained with him, grumbling against the yielding tendency of the man. A good sturdy doubt, such a one as has saved many a life and fortune. The perfect life for a woman is to live in love. The greatest happiness for a man is the conquest of himself, and that, O oh, Prince, is what I have to ask of you. She spoke rapidly and with animation. Indeed, she had never appeared to him so fascinating. You had once a friend. She continued. It was in your boyhood. There was a quarrel, and you and he became enemies. He did you wrong. After many years you met him again in the circus at Antioch. Messala. Yes, Messala, you are his creditor. Forgive the past. Admit him to friendship again. Restore the fortune he lost in the great wager. Rescue him. The six talents are as nothing to you, not so much as a bud lost upon a tree already in full leaf. But to him, ah, oh, he must go about with a broken body. Wherever you meet him, he must look up to you from the ground. Oh, Ben-Hur, noble prince, to a Roman descended as he is, beggary is the mother most odious name for death. Save him from beggary. If the rapidity with which she spoke was a cunning invention to keep him from thinking, either she never knew or else had forgotten that there are convictions which derive nothing from thought, but drop into place without leave or notice. It seemed to him, when at last she paused to have his answer, that he could see Masala himself peering at him over her shoulder, and in its expression the countenance of the Roman was not that of a mendicant or a friend. The sneer was as patrician as ever, and the fine edge of the hauteur was flawless and irritating. The appeal has been decided, then, and for once a Messala takes nothing. I must go and write it in my book of great occurrences, a judgment by a Roman against a Roman. But did he? Did Messala send you to me with this request, O Egypt? He has a noble nature and has judged you by it. Ben-Hur took the hand upon arm. As you know him in such friendly way, fair Egyptian, tell me, would he do for me, there being a reversal of the conditions that he asked me? Answer, by Isis. Answer, for the truth's sake. There was insistence in the touch of his hand and in his look also. Oh. She began. He is a Roman, you are about to say, meaning that I, a Jew, must not determine dues from me to him by any measure of dues from him to me. Being a Jew, I must forgive him my winnings because he is a Roman. 
if you have more to tell me daughter of balthazar speak quickly quickly for by the lord god of israel when this heat of blood hot or waxing attains its highest i may not be able longer to see that you are a woman and beautiful i may see but the spy of a master the more hateful because the master is a roman say on and quickly she threw his hand off and stepped back into the full light with all the evil of her nature collected in her eyes and voice thou drinker of lees feeder upon hus to think i could love thee having seen masala such as thou were born to serve him he would have been satisfied with release of the six talents but i say to the six thou shalt add twenty twenty dost thou hear the kissings of my little finger which thou hast taken from him though with my consent shall be paid for and that i have followed thee with affection of sympathy and endured thee so long enter into the account not less because i was serving him the merchant here is thy keeper of monies if by to-morrow at noon he has not thy order acted upon in favour of my masala for six-and-twenty talents mark the sum thou shalt settle with the lord sejanus be wise and farewell as she was going to the door he put himself in her way the old egypt lives in you he said whether you see masala to-morrow or the next day here or in rome give him this message tell him i have back the money even the six talents he robbed me of by robbing my father's estate tell him i survived the galleys to which he had me sent and in my strength rejoice in his baggery and dishonour tell him i think the affliction of body which he has from my hand is the curse of our lord god of israel upon him more fit than death for his crimes against the helpless tell him my mother and sister whom he had sent to a cell in antonia that they might die of leprosy are alive and well thanks to the power of the nazarene whom you so despise tell him that to fill my measure of happiness they are restored to me and then i will go hence to their love and find in it more than compensation for the impure passions which you leave me to take to him tell him this for your comfort o cunning incarnate as much as his tell him that when the lord sehanus comes to despoil me he will find nothing for the inheritance i had from the doomfear including the villa by misenum has been sold and the money from the sale is out of reach afloat in the marts of the world as bills of exchange and that this house and the goods and merchandise and the ships and caravans with which simonides plies his commerce with such princely profits are covered by imperial safeguards a wise head having found the price of the favour and the lord sahanus preferring a reasonable gain in the way of a gift too much gain fished from pools of blood and wrong tell him if all this were not so if the money and property were all mine yet should he not have the least part of it for when he finds our jewish bills and forces them to give up their values there is yet another resort left me a deed of gift to caesar so much o egypt i found out in the atria of the great capital tell him that along with my defiance i do not send him a curse in words but as a better expression of my undying hate i sent him one who will prove to him the sum of all curses and when he looks at your repeating this my message daughter of balthazar his roman shrewdness will tell him all i mean go now and i will go he conducted her to the door and with ceremonious politeness held back the curtain while she passed out peace to you he said as she disappeared end of chapter six book eight chapter seven of ben hur by lou wallace this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. chapter seven when ben hur left the guest chamber there was not nearly so much life in his action as when he entered it his steps were slower and went along with his head quite upon his breast. Having made discovery that a man with a broken back may yet have a sound brain, he was reflecting upon the discovery. Forasmuch as it is easy after a calamity has befallen to look back and see the proofs of its coming strewn along the way, the thought that he had not even suspected the Egyptian as in Masala's interest, but had gone blindly on through whole years putting himself and his friends more and more at her mercy, was a sore wound to the young man's vanity i remember he said to himself 
she had no word of indignation for the perfidious Roman at the fountain of Castalia. I remember she extolled him at the boat ride on the lake in the orchard of palms. And, ah... Uh, he stopped and beat his left hand violently with his right. That mystery about the appointment she made with me at the palace of Idernee is no mystery now. The wound, it should be observed, was to his vanity. And fortunately, it is not often that people die of such hurts, or even continue a long time sick. In Ben-Hur's case, moreover, there was a compensation, for presently he exclaimed aloud, Praise be the Lord God that the woman took not a more lasting hold on me. I see I did not love her. Then, as if he had already parted with not a little of the weight on his mind, he stepped forward more lightly, and, coming to the place on the terrace where one stairway led down to the courtyard below, and another ascended to the roof, he took the ladder and began to climb. As he made the last step in the flight, he stopped again. Can Balthazar have been her partner in the long mask she has been playing? No, no. Hypocrisy seldom goes with wrinkled age like that. Balthazar is a good man. With this decided opinion, he stepped upon the roof. There was a full moon overhead. Yet the vault of the sky at the moment was lurid with light cast up from the fires burning in the streets and open places of the city and the chanting and carousing of the old psalmody of Israel filled it with plaintive harmonies, to which he could not but listen. The countless voices bearing the burden seemed to say, Thus, O son of Judah, we prove our worshipfulness of the Lord God and our loyalty to the land he gave us. Let a Gideon appear, or a David, or a Maccabeus, and we are ready. That seemed an introduction, for next he saw the man of Nazareth. In certain moods the mind is disposed to mock itself with an apposite fantasies. The tearful woman-like face of the Christ stayed with him while he crossed the roof to the parapet above the street on the north side of the house, and there was in it no sign of war, but rather as the heavens of calm evenings look peace upon everything. So it looked, provoking the old question. What manner of man is he? Ben-Hur permitted himself one glance over the parapet, then turned and walked mechanically towards the summer-house. Let them do their worst, he said as he went slowly on. I will not forgive the Roman. I will not divide my fortune with him, nor will I fly from this city of my father's. I will call on Galilee first, and here make the fight. By brave deeds I will bring the tribes to our side. He who raised up Moses will find us a leader, if I fail, if not the Nazarene, then some other of the many ready to die for freedom. The interior of the summer-house, when Ben-Hur, slow sauntering, came to it, was murkily lighted. The faintest of shadows lay along the floor from the pillars on the north and west sides. Looking in, he saw the armchair usually occupied by Simonides, drawn to a spot from which a view of the city over towards the marketplace could best be had. The good man is returned. I will speak with him, unless he be asleep. He walked in, and with a quiet step approached the chair. Peering over the high back, he beheld Esther nestled in the seat to sleep. A small figure snugged away under her father's lap robe. The hair disheveled fell over her face. Her breathing was low and irregular. Once it was broken by a long sigh, ending in a sob. Something, it might have been the sigh or the loneliness in which he found her, imparted to him the idea that the sleep was a rest from sorrow rather than fatigue. Nature kindly sends such relief to children, and he was used to thinking Esther scarcely more than a child. He put his arms upon the back of the chair and thought, I will not wake her. I have nothing to tell her. Nothing unless, unless it be my love. She is a daughter of Judah, and beautiful, and so unlike the Egyptian, for there it is all vanity, here all truth, there ambition, here duty, there selfishness, here self-sacrifice. Nay, the question is not, do I love her, but does she love me? She was my friend from the beginning. The night on the terrace at Antioch, how childlike she begged me not to make Rome my enemy, and had me tell her of the villa by Missinum, and the life there that she should not see i saw her cunning drift i kissed her can she have forgotten the kiss i have not i love her 
They do not know in the city that I have backed my people. I shrank from telling it to the Egyptian, but this little one will rejoice with me over their restoration, and welcome them with love and sweet services of hand and heart. She will be to my mother another daughter, and Terza she will find her other self. I would wake her and tell her these things, but— out on the sorceress of Egypt, of that folly I cannot command myself to speak. I will go away, and wait another and better time. I will wait, fair Esther, dutiful child, daughter of Judah. He retired, silently as he came. End of chapter 7《Ben Hur by Lou Wallace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 8 The streets were full of people going and coming, or grouped about the fires roasting meat, and feasting and singing and happy. The odor of scorching flesh mixed with the odor of cedar wood aflame, and smoking loaded the air. And as this was the occasion when every son of Israel was full brother to every other son of Israel, and hospitality was without bonds, Ben-Hur was saluted at every step, while the groups by the fires insisted, Stay and partake with us. We are brethren in the love of the Lord. But with thanks to them he hurried on, intending to take horse at the Khan and return to the tents on the Cedron. To make the place it was necessary for him to cross the thoroughfare, so soon to receive sorrowful Christian perpetuation. There also the pious celebration was at its height. Looking up the street, he noticed the flames of torches in motion, streaming out like pennons. Then he observed that the singing ceased where the torches came. His wonder rose to its highest, however, when he became certain that amidst the smoke and dancing sparks he saw the keener sparkling of burnished spear-tips, arguing the presence of Roman soldiers. What were they? the scoffing legionnaires, doing in a Jewish religious procession. The circumstance was unheard of, and he stayed to see the meaning of it. The moon was shining its best, yet, as if the moon and torches and the fires in the street and the rays streaming from windows and open doors were not enough to make the way clear, some of the processionists carried lighted lanterns. And fancying he discovered a special purpose in the use of such equipments, Ben-Hur stepped into the street so close to the line of march as to bring every one of the company under a view while passing. The torches and the lanterns were being borne by servants, each of whom was armed with a bludgeon or a sharpened stave. Their present duty seemed to be to pick out the smoothest paths among the rocks in the street for certain dignitaries among them, elders and priests, rabbis with long beards, heavy brows, and beak noses, men of the class potential in the councils of Caiaphas and Hannas. Where could they be going? Not to the temple, certainly, for the route to the sacred house from Zion, whence these appeared to be coming, was by the Zistus. And their business, if peaceful, why the soldiers? As the procession began to go by Ben-Hur, his attention was particularly called to three persons walking together. They were well towards the front, and the servants who went before them with lanterns appeared unusually careful in the service. In the person moving on the left of this group, he recognized a chief policeman of the temple. The one on the right was a priest, the middle man was not at first so easily placed, and he walked leaning heavily upon the arms of the others, and carried his head so low upon his breast as to hide his face. His appearance was that of a prisoner, not yet recovered from the fright of arrest, or being taken as something dreadful, to torture or death. The dignitaries helping him on the right and left, and the attention they gave him, made it clear that if he were not himself the object moving the party, he was at least in some way connected with the object, a witness or a guide, possibly an informer. So if it could be found who he was, the business in hand might be shrewdly guessed. With great assurance, Ben-Hur fell in on the right of the priest and walked along with him. Now if the man would lift his head, and presently he did so, letting the light of the lantern strike full in his face, pale, dazed, pinched with dread, the beard roughed, the eyes filmy, sunken and despairing. In much going about following the Nazarene, Ben-Hur had come to know his disciples as well as the Master. And now, at the sight of the dismal countenance, he cried out, 
It is Carrion! Slowly the head of the man turned until his eyes settled upon Ben-Hur, and his lips moved as if he were about to speak. But the priest interfered. Who art thou? Be gone! He said to Ben-Hur, pushing him away. The young man took the push good-naturedly, and waiting an opportunity fell into the procession again. Thus he was carried passively along down the street, through the crowded lowlands between the hill Bethesda and the castle of Antonia, and on by the Bethesda Reservoir to the Sheep Gate. There were people everywhere, and everywhere the people were engaged in sacred observances. It being pass overnight, the valves of the gate stood open. The keepers were off somewhere feasting. In front of the procession, as it passed out unchallenged, was the deep gorge of the Cedron, with all of it beyond, its dressing of cedar and olive trees, darker of the moonlight, silvering all the heavens. Two roads met and merged into the street at the gate, one from the northeast, the other from Bethany. Ere Ben Hur could finish wondering whether he were to go farther, and if so, which road was to be taken, he was led off down into the gorge, and still no hint of the purpose of the midnight march. Down the gorge and over the bridge at the bottom of it, there was a great clatter on the floor as the crowd, now a straggling rabble, passed over beating and pounding with their clubs and staves. A little farther and they turned off to the left in the direction of an olive orchard, enclosed by a stone wall in view from the road. Ben-Hur knew there was nothing in the place but old gnarled trees, the grass and a trough hewn out of the rock for the treading of oil after the fashion of the country. While yet more wonderstruck, he was thinking what could bring such a company at such an hour to a quarter so lonesome. They were all brought to a standstill. Voices called out excitedly in front. A chill sensation ran from man to man. There was a rapid falling back and a blind stumbling over each other. The soldiers alone kept their order. It took Ben-Hur but a moment to disengage himself from the mob and run forward. There he found a gateway without a gate admitting to the orchard. But he halted to take in the scene. A man in white clothes and bareheaded was standing outside the entrance. His hands crossed before him, a slender, stooping figure with long hair and thin face, in an attitude of resignation and waiting. It was the Nazarene. Behind him, next the gateway, were the disciples in a group. They were excited, but no man was ever calmer than he. The torchlight beat redly upon him, giving his hair a tint ruddier than was natural to it. Yet the impression of the countenance was, as usual, all gentleness and pity. Opposite the most unmartial figure stood the rabble, gaping, silent, awed, cowering, ready at a sign of anger from him to break and run. And from him to them, then at Judas, conspicuous in their midst, Ben-Hur looked, one quick glance, and the object of the visit lay open to his understanding. Here was the betrayer there the betrayed, and these with clubs and staves, and the legionaries were brought to take him. A man may not always tell what he will do until the trial is upon him. This was the emergency for which Ben-Hur had been for years preparing. The man to whose security he had devoted himself, and upon whose life he had been building so largely, was in personal peril. Yet he stood still. Such contradictions are there in human nature. To say truth, O oh reader, he was not entirely recovered from the picture of the Christ before the gate beautiful, as it had been given by the Egyptian. And besides that, the very calmness with which the mysterious person confronted the mob held him in restraint, by suggesting the possession of a power in reserve more than sufficient for the peril. Peace and good will, and love and non-resistance, had been the burden of the Nazarene's teaching, would he put his teaching into practice? He was master of life. He could restore it when lost. He could take it at pleasure. What use would he make of the power now? Defend himself? And how? A word, a breath, a thought were sufficient. That there would be some signal exhibition of astonishing force beyond the natural Ben-Hur believed, and in that faith waited and in all this he was still measuring the Nazarene by himself, by the human standard. Presently the clear voice of the Christ arose. Whom seek ye? Jesus of Nazareth, the priest replied. 
I am he. At the simplest of words, spoken without passion or alarm, the assailants fell back several steps, and the timid among them cowering to the ground, and they might have let him alone and gone away had not Judas walked over to him. Hail, master. With this friendly speech he kissed him. Judas, said the Nazarene mildly, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? Wherefore art thou come? Receiving no reply, the master spoke to the crowd again. Whom seek ye? Jesus of Nazareth. I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. At these words of entreaty the rabbis advanced upon him, and seeing their intent, some of the disciples for whom he interceded drew nearer. One of them cut off a man's ear, and without saving the master from being taken. And yet Ben-Hur stood still. Nay, while the officers were making ready with their ropes, the Nazarene was doing his greatest charity. Not the greatest indeed, but the very grandest in illustration of his forbearance, so far surpassing that of men. Suffer ye thus far, he said to the wounded man, and healed him with a touch. Both friends and enemies were confounded. One sighed that he could do such a thing, the other that he would do it under the circumstances. Surely he will not allow them to bind him. Thus thought been her. Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? From the offending follower the Nazarene turned to his captors. Are you come out as a thief, with swords and staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple, and you took me not. But this is your hour, and the power of darkness. The posse plucked up courage and closed about him. And when Ben-Hur looked for the faithful, they were gone. Not one of them remained. The crowd about the deserted man seemed very busy with tongue, hand, and foot. Over their heads, between the torch sticks, through the smoke, sometimes in openings between the restless men, Ben-Hur caught momentary glimpses of the prisoner. Never had anything struck him as so piteous, so unfriended, so forsaken. Yet he thought, as the man could have defended himself, he could have slain his enemies with a breath, but he would not. What was the cup his father had given him to drink? And who was the father to be so obeyed? Mystery upon mystery, not one but many. Directly the mob started and returned to the city, the soldiers in the lead. Ben-Hur became anxious. He was not satisfied with himself. Where the torches were in the midst of the rabble, he knew the Nazarene was to be found. Suddenly he resolved to see him again. He would ask him one question. Taking off his long outer garment and the handkerchief from his head, he threw them upon the orchard wall and started after the posse, which he boldly joined. Through the stragglers he made way, and by littles at length reached the man who carried the ends of the rope with which the prisoner was bound. The Nazarene was walking slowly, his head down, his hands bound behind him. The hair fell thickly over his face, and he stooped more than usual. Apparently he was oblivious to all going on around him. In advance a few steps were priests and elders talking and occasionally looking back. When at length they were all near the bridge and the gorge, Ben-Hur took the rope from the servant who had it and stepped past him. Master, master, he said hurriedly, speaking close to the Nazarene's ear. Dost thou hear, master? A word, one word. Tell me. The fellow from whom he had taken the rope now claimed it. Tell me. Ben-Hur continued. Goest thou with these of thine own accord? The people were come up now and in his own ears, asking angrily, Who art thou, man? O master! Ben-Hur made haste to say, his voice sharp with anxiety. I am thy friend and lover. Tell me, I pray thee, if I bring rescue, wilt thou accept it? The Nazarene never so much as looked up or allowed the slightest sign of recognition. Yet the something which, when we are suffering, is always telling it to such as look at us, though they be strangers, fail not now. Let him alone, it seemed to say. He has been abandoned by his friends. The world has denied him. In bitterness of spirit, he is hated for all of men. He is going he knows nowhere, and he cares not. Let him alone. And to that Ben-Hur was now driven. A dozen hands were upon him, and from all sides there was shouting. He is one of them. Bring him along, club him, kill him! With a gust of passion which gave him many times his ordinary force, Ben-Hur raised himself, turned once about with arms outstretched, 
shook the hands off, and rushed through the circle which was fast hemming him in. The hands snatching at him as he passed tore his garments from his back. So he ran off the road naked, and the gorge, in keeping of the friendly darkness, darker there than elsewhere, received him safe. Reclaiming his handkerchief and outer garments from the orchard wall, he followed back to the city gate. Thence he went to the Khan, and on the good horse rode to the tents of his people out by the tombs of the kings. As he rode, he promised himself to see the Nazarene on the morrow, promised it not knowing that the unfriended man was taken straight away to the house of Hannes to be tried that night. The heart the young man carried to his couch beat so heavily he could not sleep, for now clearly his renewed Judean kingdom resolved itself into what it was, only a dream. It is bad enough to see our castles overthrown one after another, with an interval between in which to recover from the shock, or at least let the echoes of the fall die away. But when they go all together, go as ships sink, as houses tumble in earthquakes, the spirits which endure it calmly are made of stuff sterner than common, and Ben-Hur's was not of them. Through vistas in the future he began to catch glimpses of a life serenely beautiful, with a home instead of a palace of state, and Esther its mistress. Again and again, through the leaden-footed hours of the night, he saw the villa by a Messinium, and with his little countrywoman strolled through the garden, and rested in the panelled atrium. Overhead the Neapolitan sky, at their feet the sunniest of sunlands and the bluest of bays. In plainest speech he was entering upon a crisis, with which tomorrow and the Nazarene will have everything to do. End of chapter 8book eight chapter nine a ben hur by lou wallace this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter nine next morning about the second hour two men rode full speed to the doors of ben hur's tents and dismounting asked to see him he was not yet risen but gave directions for their admission peace to you brethren he said for they were of his galileans and trusted officers will you be seated nay the senior replied bluntly to sit and be at ease is to let the nazarene die rise son of judah and go with us the judgment has been given the tree of the cross is already at golgotha ben hur stared at them the cross was all he could for the moment say they took him last night and tried him the man continued at dawn they led him before pilate twice the roman denied his guilt twice he refused to give him over at last he washed his hands and said be it upon you then and they answered who answered they the priests and people his blood be upon us and our children holy father abraham cried ben hur a roman kinder to an israelite than his own kin and if, uh, if he should indeed be the son of god one shall ever wash his blood from their children it must not be tis time to fight his face brightened with resolution and he clapped his hands the horses and quickly he said to the arab who answered the signal and bid amra send me fresh garments and bring my sword it is time to die for israel my friends tarry without till i come he ate a crust drank a cup of wine and was soon upon the road whither would you go first asked the galilean to collect the legions alas the man replied throwing up his hands why alas master the man spoke with shame master i and my friend here are all that are faithful the rest do follow the priests seeking what and ben hur drew rein to kill him not the nazarene you have said it ben hur looked slowly from one man to the other he was hearing again the question of the night before. The cup my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? In the year of the Nazarene he was putting his own question. If I bring thee rescued, wilt thou accept it? He was saying to himself. This death may not be averted. The man has been travelling towards it with full knowledge from the day he began his mission. It is imposed by a will higher than his. Who is but the Lord's? If he is consenting, if he goes to it voluntarily, what shall another do? nor less did ben-hur see the failure of the scheme he had built upon the fidelity of the galileans 
Their desertion, in fact, left nothing more of it. But how singular it should happen that morning of all others. A dread seized him. It was possible his scheming and labor and expenditure of treasure might have been but blasphemous contention with God. When he picked up the reins and said, Let us go, brethren. All before him was uncertainty. The faculty of resolving quickly, without which one cannot be a hero in the midst of stirring scenes, was numb within him. Let us go, brethren. Let us go to Golgotha. They passed through excited crowds of people going south, like themselves. All the country north of the city seemed aroused and in motion. Hearing that the procession with the condemned might be met with somewhere near the great white towers left by Herod, the three friends rode thither, passing round southeast of Acre. In the valley below the pool of Hezekiah, passageway against the multitude became impossible, and they were compelled to dismount and take shelter behind the corner of a house and wait. The waiting was as if they were on a river bank, watching a flood go by, for such the people seemed. There are certain chapters in the first book of this story which were written to give the reader an idea of the composition of the Jewish nationality as it was in the time of Christ. They were also written in anticipation of this hour and scene, so that he who has read them, and with attention, can now see all Ben-Hur saw of the going to the crucifixion, a rare and wonderful sight. Half an hour. An hour. The flood surged by Ben-Hur and his companions, within arm's reach, incessant, undiminished. At the end of that time he could have said, I have seen all the castes of Jerusalem, all the sects of Judea, all the tribes of Israel, and all the nationalities of the earth represented by them. The Libyan Jew went by, and the Jew of Egypt, and the Jew from the Rhine, in short Jews from all east countries and all west countries, and all islands within commercial connection. They went by on foot, on horseback, on camels, in litters and chariots, and with an infinite variety of costumes, yet with the same marvelous similitude of features which today particularizes the children of Israel, tried as they have been by climates and modes of life. They went by speaking all known tongues, for by that means only were they distinguishable group from group. They went by in haste, eager, anxious, crowding, all to behold one poor Nazarene die, a felon between felons. They were the many, but they were not all. Born along the stream were thousands not Jews, thousands hating and despising them. Greeks, Romans, Arabs, Syrians, Africans, Egyptians, Easterns, so that studying the mass it seemed the whole world was to be represented, and in that sense, present at the crucifixion. The going was singularly quiet. A hoof-stroke upon a rock. The glide and rattle of revolving wheels, voices in conversation, and now and then a calling voice, were all the sounds heard upon the rustle of the mighty movement. Yet was there upon every countenance the look with which men make haste to see some dreadful sight, some sudden wreck or ruin or calamity of war. And by such signs Ben Hur judged that these were the strangers in the city come up to the Passover, who had no part in the trial of the Nazarene and might be his friends. At length, from the direction of the great towers, Ben Hur heard, at first faint in the distance, a shouting of many men. Hark! They are coming now, said one of his friends. The people in the street halted to hear. But as the cry rang on over their heads, they looked at each other, and in shuddering silence moved along. The shouting drew nearer each moment, and the air was already full of it and trembling, when Ben-Hur saw the servants of Simonides, coming on with their master in his chair, and Esther walking by his side. A covered litter was next behind them. "'Peace to you, O Simonides, and to you, Esther,' said Ben-Hur, meeting them. "'If you are for Golgotha, stay until the procession passes. I will then go with you.' there is room to turn in by the house here the merchant's large head rested heavily upon his breast rousing himself he answered speak to balthazar his pleasure will be mine he is in the litter ben-hur hastened to draw aside the curtain the egyptian was lying within his wan face so pinched as to appear like a dead man's the proposal was submitted to him can we see him he inquired faintly the nazarene yes he must pass within a few feet of us dear lord the old man cried fervently once more once more oh it is a dreadful day for the world 
Shortly the whole party was in waiting under shelter of the house. They said but little, afraid, probably, to trust their thoughts to each other. Everything was uncertain, and nothing so much so as opinions. Balthazar drew himself feebly from the litter, and stood supported by a servant. Esther and Ben-Hur kept Simonides' company. Meantime the flood poured along, if anything more densely than before, and the shouting came nearer, shrill up in the air, hoarse among the earth, and cruel. At last the procession was up. See, said Ben-Hur bitterly, that which cometh now is Jerusalem. The advance was in possession of an army of boys, hooting and screaming. The, the king, king of the, of the Jews! Jews. Room, room, room for, for the, the king, king of the, of the Jews! Jews. Simonides watched them as they whirled and danced along, like a cloud of summer insects, and said gravely, When these come to their inheritance, son of her, alas for the city of Solomon. A band of legionnaires, fully armed, followed next, marching in sturdy indifference, the glory of burnished brass about them the while. Then came the Nazarene. He was nearly dead. Every few steps he staggered as if he would fall. A stained gown, badly torn, hung from his shoulders over a seamless under-tunic. His bare feet left red splotches upon the stones. An inscription on a board was tied to his neck. A crown of thorns had been crushed hard down upon his head, making cruel wounds from which streams of blood, now dry and blackened, had run over his face and neck. The long hair tangled in the thorns was clotted thick. The skin, where it could be seen, was ghastly white. His hands were tied before him. Back somewhere in the city he had fallen exhausted under the transverse beam of his cross, which, as a condemned person, custom required him to bear to the place of execution. Now a countryman carried the burden in his stead. Four soldiers went with him as a guard against the mob, who sometimes, nevertheless, broke through, and struck him with sticks and spit upon him. Yet no sound escaped him, neither remonstrance nor groan, nor did he look up until he was nearly in front of the house sheltering Ben-Hur and his friends all of whom were moved with quick compassion. Esther clung to her father, and he, strong of will as he was, trembled. Balthazar fell down speechless. Even Ben-Hur cried out, Oh, my God! My God! Then, as if he divined their feelings or heard the exclamation, the Nazarene turned his wan face towards the party and looked at them each one, so they carried the look in memory through life. They could see he was thinking of them, not himself and the dying eyes gave them the blessing he was not permitted to speak. "'Where are the legions, son of her? asked Simonides, aroused. "'Hannes can tell thee better than I.' "'What, faithless?' "'All but these two. "'Then all is lost, and this good man must die.' The face of the merchant knit convulsively as he spoke, and his head sank upon his breast. He had borne his part in Ben-Hur's labors well and he had been inspired by the same hopes, now blown out never to be rekindled. Two other men succeeded the Nazarene bearing cross-beams. Who are these? Ben-Hur asked of the Galileans. Thieves, appointing to die with the Nazarene, they replied. Next in the procession stalked a mitred figure, clad all in the golden vestments of the high priest. Policemen from the temple curtained him round about, and after him, in order, strode the Sanhedrin, and a long array of priests, the latter in their plain white garments, overwrapped by abnets of many folds and gorgeous colors. The son-in-law of Hannes, said Ben-Hur in a low voice. Caiaphas, I have seen him. Simonides replied, adding, after a pause, during which he thoughtfully watched the haughty pontiff. And now I am convinced with such assurance as proceeds from clear enlightenment of the spirit, with absolute assurance, now know I that he who first goes yonder with the inscription about his neck is what the inscription proclaims him, King of the Jews. A common man, an impostor, a felon, was never thus waited upon. For look, here are the nations, Jerusalem, Israel. Here is the ephod, here the blue robe with its fringe, and purple pomegranates and golden bells not seen in the street since the day Judah went out to meet the Macedonian. Proofs that all this Nazarene is king. Oh, would I could rise and go after him. 
Ben-Hur listened surprised and directly. As if himself awakening to his unusual display of feelings, Simonides said impatiently, Speak to Balthasar, I pray you, and let us be gone. The vomit of Jerusalem is coming. Then Esther spoke. I see some women there, and they are weeping. Who are they? Following the pointing of her hand, the party beheld four women in tears. One of them leaned upon the arm of a man of aspect not unlike the Nazarenes. Presently Ben-Hur answered. The man is the disciple whom the Nazarene loves the best of all. She who leans upon his arm is Mary, the master's mother. The others are friendly women of Galilee. Esther pursued the mourners with glistening eyes until the multitude received them out of sight. It may be the reader will fancy the foregoing snatches of conversation were had in quiet, but it was not so. The talking was, for the most part, like that indulged by people at the seaside under the sound of the surf, for to nothing else can the clamor of this division of the mob be so well likened. The demonstration was the forerunner of those in which, scarce thirty years later, under the rule of the factions, the holy city was torn to pieces. It was quite as great in numbers, as fanatical and bloodthirsty, boiled and raved, and had in it exactly the same elements. Servants, camel drivers, market men, gatekeepers, gardeners, dealers in fruits and wines, proselytes and foreigners, not proselytes, watchmen and menials from the temple, thieves, robbers, and the myriad not assignable to any class. But who, on such occasions as this, appeared no one could say whence, hungry and smelling of caves and old tombs, bare-headed wretches with naked arms and legs, hair and beard and uncombed mats, and each with one garment the color of clay, beasts with abysmal mouths and outcry effective as lions calling each other across desert spaces. Some of them had swords, a greater number flourished spears and javelins, though the weapon of the many were staves and knotted clubs and slings, for which latter selected stones were stored in scripts and sometimes in sacks improvised from the foreskirts of their dirty tunics. Among the mass here and there appeared persons of high degree, scribes, elders, rabbis, Pharisees with broad fringing, Sadducees in fine cloaks, serving for the time as prompters and directors. If a throat dried of one cry, they invented another for it. If brassy lung showed signs of collapse, they set him going again. And yet the clamor, loud and continuous as it was, could have been reduced to a few syllables. King of the Jews, room for the king of the Jews, defiler of the temple, blasphemer of God, crucify him, crucify him. And of these cries, the last one seemed in greatest favor, because doubtless it was more directly expressive of the wish of the mob and helped to better articulate its hatred of the Nazarene. Come, said Simonides, when Bathazar was ready to proceed. Come, let us forward. Ben-Hur did not hear the call. The appearance of the part of the procession then passing, its brutality and hunger for life were reminding him of the Nazarene, his gentleness, and the many charities he had seen him do for suffering men. Suggestions begat suggestions. So he remembered suddenly his own great indebtedness to the man, the time he himself was in the hands of a Roman guard going, as was supposed, to a death as certain and almost as terrible as this one of the cross. The cooling drink he had at the well by Nazareth, and the divine expression of the face of him who gave it. The latter goodness, the miracle of Palm Sunday, and with these recollections the thought of his present powerlessness to give back help for help, or make return in kind, stung him keenly, and he accused himself. He had not done all he might. He could have watched with the Galileans, and kept them true and ready. And this, ah, this was the moment to strike. A blow well given now would not merely disperse the mob and set the Nazarene free. It would be a trumpet call to Israel, and precipitate the long-dreamt-of war for freedom. The opportunity was going. The minutes were bearing it away, and if lost, God of Abraham, was there nothing to be done, nothing? That instant a party of Galileans caught his eye. He rushed through the press and overtook them. Follow me, he said. I would have speech with you. The men obeyed him and when they were under shelter of the house he spoke again. You are of those who took my swords, and agreed with me to strike for freedom and the king who is coming. You have the swords now, and now is the time to strike with them. Go, look everywhere, and find our brethren, and tell them to meet me at the tree of the cross, making ready for the Nazarene. Haste, all of you. Nay, stand not so, the Nazarene is the king, and freedom dies with him. They looked at him respectfully, 
but did not move. Hear you? He asked. Then one of them replied, Son of Judah. By that name they knew him. Son of Judah, it is you who are deceived, not we or our brethren who have your swords. The Nazarene is not the king, neither has he the spirit of a king. We were with him when he came into Jerusalem. We saw him in the temple. He failed himself, and us, and Israel. At the gate beautiful he turned his back upon God and refused the throne of David. He is not king, and Galilee is not with him. He shall die the death. But hear you, son of Judah, we have your swords, and we are ready now to draw them and strike for freedom, and so is Galilee. Be it for freedom, O son of Judah, for freedom, and we will meet you at the tree of the cross. The sovereign moment of his life was upon Ben-Hur. Could he have taken the offer and said the word, history might have been other than it is. And then it would have been history ordered by men, not God. Something that never was and never will be. A confusion fell upon him. He knew not how, though afterwards he attributed it to the Nazarene. For when the Nazarene was risen, he understood the death was necessary to faith in the resurrection, without which Christianity would be an empty husk. The confusion, as it has been said, left him without the faculty of decision. He stood helpless, wordless even. Covering his face with his hand, he shook with the conflict between his wish, which was what he would have ordered, and the power that was upon him. Come, we are waiting for you said Simonides the fourth time. Thereupon he walked mechanically after the chair and the litter. Esther walked with him. Like Balthazar and his friends, the wise men, the day they went to the meeting in the desert, he was being led along the way. End of chapter 9「Book Eighth, Chapter 10 of Ben-Hur by Lew Wallace This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 10 When the party, Balthazar, Simonides, Ben-Hur, Esther, and the two faithful Galileans reached the place of crucifixion, Ben-Hur was in advance leading them. How they had been able to make way through the great press of excited people he never knew. No more did he know the road by which they came or the time it took them to come. He had walked in total unconsciousness, neither hearing nor seeing anybody or anything, and without a thought of where he was going, or the ghostliest semblance of a purpose in his mind. In such condition a little child could have done as much as he to prevent the awful crime he was about to witness. The intentions of God are always strange to us, but not more so than the means by which they are wrought out, and at last made plain to our belief. Ben-Hur came to a stop. Those following him also stopped. As a curtain rises before an audience, the spell holding him in its sleep awake arose, and he saw with a clear understanding. There was a space upon the top of a low knoll, rounded like a skull, and dry, dusty, and without vegetation except some scrubby hyssop. The boundary of the space was a living wall of men, with men behind struggling, some to look over, others to look through it. An inner wall of Roman soldiery held the dense outer wall rigidly to its place. A centurion kept eye upon the soldiers. Up to the very line so vigilantly guarded, Ben-Hur had been led. At the line he now stood, his face to the northwest. The knoll was the old Aramaic Golgotha, in Latin, Calvaria, anglicized Calvary, translated the skull. On its slopes in the low places, on the swells and higher hills, the earth sparkled with a strange enameling. Look where he would outside the walled space, he saw no patch of brown soil, no rock, no green thing. He saw only thousands of eyes and ruddy faces, off a little way in the perspective, only ruddy faces without eyes. Off a little farther, only a broad, broad circle, which the nearer view instructed him was also of faces. And this was the ensemble of three millions of people, under it three millions of hearts throbbing with passionate interest in what was taking place upon the knoll indifferent as to the thieves caring only for the Nazarene, and for him only as he was an object of hate or fear or curiosity, he who loved them all and was about to die for them. In the spectacle of a great assemblage of people, there are always the bewilderment and fascination one feels when looking over a stretch of sea in agitation, and never had this one been exceeded. Yet Ben-Hur gave up at a passing glance, for that which was going on in the space described, 
would permit no division of his interest. Up on the knoll, so high as to be above the living wall, and visible over the heads of an attending company of notables, conspicuous because of his mitre investments and his haughty air, stood the high priest. Up the knoll still higher, up quite to the round summit, so as to be seen far and near was the Nazarene, stooped and suffering but silent. The wit among the guard had complimented the crown upon his head by putting a reed in his hand for a scepter. Clamors blew upon him like blasts, laughter, execrations, sometimes both together indistinguishably. A man, only a man, O oh reader, would have charged the blast with the remainder of his love for the race and let it go forever. All the eyes then looking were fixed upon the Nazarene. It may have been pity with which he was moved. Whatever the cause, Ben-Hur was conscious of a change in his feelings, a conception of something better than the best of this life, something so much better that it could serve a weak man with strength to endure agonies of spirit as well as of body, something to make death welcome, perhaps another life purer than this one, perhaps the spirit life which Balthazar held so fast, began to dawn upon his mind clearer and clearer, bringing to him a certain sense that, after all, the mission of the Nazarene was that of a guide, across the boundary for such as loved him, across the boundary to where his kingdom was set up and waiting for him. Then, as something born through the air, out of the almost forgotten, he heard again, or seemed to hear, the saying of the Nazarene, I am the resurrection and the life. And the words repeated themselves over and over, and took form, and the dawn touched them with its light and filled them with a new meaning. And as men repeat a question to grasp and fix the meaning, he asked, gazing at the figure on the hill fainting under its crown, who the resurrection, and who the life? I am. The figure seemed to say, and say it for him, for instantly he was sensible of a peace such as he had never known, the peace which is the end of doubt and mystery, and the beginning of faith and love and clear understanding. From this dreamy state Ben-Hur was aroused by the sound of hammering. On the summit of the knoll he observed then, what had escaped him before, some soldiers and workmen preparing the crosses. The holes for planting the trees were ready, and now the transverse beams were being fitted to their places. Bid the men make haste, said the high priest to the centurion. These, and he pointed to the Nazarene, must be dead by the going down of the sun, and buried that the land may not be defiled. Such is the law. With a better mind, a soldier went to the Nazarene and offered him something to drink, but he refused the cup. Then another went to him and took from his neck the board with the inscription upon it, which he nailed to the tree of the cross, and the preparation was complete. The crosses are ready, said the centurion to the pontiff, who received the report with a wave of the hand and the reply. Let the blasphemer go first. The Son of God should be able to save himself. We will see. The people to whom the preparation in its several stages was visible, and who to this time had assailed the hill with incessant cries of impatience, permitted a lull which directly became a universal hush. The part of the infliction most shocking, at least to the thought, was reached. The men were to be nailed to their crosses. When for that purpose the soldiers laid their hands upon the Nazarene first, a shudder passed through the great concourse. The most brutalized shrank with dread. Afterwards there were those who said the air suddenly chilled and made them shiver. How very still it is! Esther said as she put her arm around her father's neck, and remembering the torture he himself had suffered, he drew her face down upon his breast and sat trembling. Avoid it, Esther, avoid it, he said. I know not but all who stand and see it. The innocent as well as the guilty may be cursed from this hour. Balthazar sank upon his knees. Son of her, said Simonides with increasing excitement. Son of her, if Jehovah stretch not forth his hand and quickly, Israel is lost, and we are lost. Ben Hur answered calmly, I have been in a dream, Simonides, and heard in it why all this should be, and why it should go on. It is the will of the Nazarene, it is God's will. Let us do as the Egyptian here, let us hold our peace and pray. As he looked up on the knoll again, the words were wafted to him through the awful stillness. I am the resurrection and the life. He bowed reverently, as to a person speaking. Upon the summit, meantime, the work went on. 
The guard took the Nazarene's clothes from him, so that he stood before the millions naked. The stripes of the scourging he had received in the early morning were still bloody upon his back. Yet he was laid piteously down and stretched upon the cross, first the arms upon the transverse beam. The spikes were sharp. A few blows, and they were driven through the tender palms. Next they drew his knees up until the soles of the feet rested flat upon the tree. Then they placed one foot upon the other, and one spike fixed both of them fast. The dulled sound of the hammering was heard outside the guarded space, and such as could not hear, yet saw the hammer as it fell, shivered with fear. And withal not a groan, or cry, or word of remonstrance from the sufferer. Nothing at which an enemy could laugh, nothing a lover could regret. Which way wilt thou have him faced? asked a soldier bluntly. Towards the temple, the pontiff replied. In dying I would have him see that the holy house hath not suffered by him. The workmen put their hands to the cross and carried it, burden and all, to the place of planting. At a word they dropped the tree into the hole, and the body of the Nazarene also dropped heavily, and hung by the bleeding hands. Still no cry of pain, only the exclamation divinest of all recorded exclamations. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The cross, reared now above all other objects, and standing singly out against the sky, was greeted with a burst of delight. And all who could see and read the writing upon the board over the Nazarene's head made haste to decipher it. Soon as read, the legend was adopted by them and communicated, and presently the whole mighty concourse was ringing the salutation from side to side and repeating it with laughter and groans. King of the Jews! <laughs> Hail, King of the Jews! The pontiff, with a clearer idea of the import of the inscription, protested against it. But in vain, so the title king, looking from the knoll with dying eyes, must have had the city of his fathers at rest below him. She who had so ignominiously cast him out. The sun was rising rapidly to noon. The hills bared their brown breasts lovingly to it. The more distant mountains rejoiced in the purple with which it so regally dressed them. In the city, the temples, palaces, towers, pinnacles, and all points of beauty and prominence seemed to lift themselves into the unrivaled brilliance, as if they knew the pride they were giving the many who from time to time turned to look at them. Suddenly a dimness began to fill the sky and cover the earth, at first no more than a scarce perceptible fading of the day, a twilight out of time, an evening gliding in upon the splendors of noon. But it deepened and directly drew attention, whereat the noise of the shouting and laughter fell off, and men, doubting their senses, gazed at each other curiously. Then they looked to the sun again, then at the mountains, getting farther away, at the sky and the near landscape sinking in shadow, at the hill upon which the tragedy was enacting, and from all these they gazed at each other again, and turned pale and held their peace. It is only a mist or a passing cloud, Simonides said soothingly to Esther, who was alarmed. It will brighten presently. Ben-Hur did not think so. It is not a mist or a cloud, he said. The spirits who live in the air, the prophets and saints, are at work in mercy to themselves and nature. I say to you, O Simonides, truly, as God lives, he who hangs yonder is the Son of God and leaving Simonides lost in wonder at such a speech from him, he went where Balthazar was kneeling nearby and laid his hand upon the good man's shoulder. O oh, wise Egyptian, hearken, thou alone wert right. The Nazarene is indeed the son of God. Balthazar drew down to him and replied feebly, I saw him a child in the manger where he was first laid. It is not strange that I knew him sooner than thou. But, oh, that I should live to see this day! Would I had died with my brethren! Happy Melchior! Happy, happy Gaspar! Comfort thee, said Ben-Hur. Doubtless they too are here. The dimness went on deepening into obscurity, and that into positive darkness, but without deterring the bolder spirits upon the knoll. One after the other, the thieves were raised on their crosses, and the crosses planted. The guard was then withdrawn, and people set free closed in upon the height and surged up it like a converging wave. A man might take a look when a newcomer would push him on and take his place to be in turn pushed on. And there were laughter and ribaldry and revilements all for the Nazarene. Ha, ha! If thou be king of the Jews, save thyself. 
A soldier shouted. Aye, said a priest. If he will come down to us now, we will believe in him. Others wagged their heads wisely, saying, He would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, but cannot save himself. Others still. He called himself the Son of God. Let us see if God will have him. What all there is in prejudice no one has ever said. The Nazarene had never harmed the people. Far the greater part of them had never seen him except in this his hour of calamity. Yet singular contrariety. They loaded him with their curses and gave their sympathy to the thieves. The supernatural night dropped thus from the heavens, affected Esther as it began to affect thousands of others, braver and stronger. Let us go home. She prayed twice, three times, saying, It is the front of God, Father. What other dreadful things may happen, who can tell? I am afraid. Simonides was abstinent. He said little, but was plainly under great excitement, observing about the end of the first hour that the violence of the crowding up on the knoll was somewhat abated. At his suggestion, the party advanced to take position near the crosses. Ben-Hur gave his arm to Balthazar, yet the Egyptian made the ascent with difficulty. From their new stand, the Nazarene was imperfectly visible, appearing to them not more than a dark suspended figure. They could hear him, however, hear his sighing, which showed an endurance or exhaustion greater than that of his fellow sufferers, for they filled every lull in the noises with their groans and entreaties. The second hour after the suspension passed like the first one. To the Nazarene they were hours of insult, provocation, and slow dying. He spoke but once in the time. Some women came and knelt at the foot of the cross. Among them he recognized his mother with the beloved disciple. Woman, he said, raising his voice, Behold thy son. And to the disciple, Behold thy mother. The third hour came, and still people surged round the hill, held to it by some strange attraction, with which, in probability, the night and midday had much to do. They were quieter than in the preceding hour, yet at intervals they could be heard off in the darkness shouting to each other, multitude calling upon multitude. It was noticeable, also, that coming now to the Nazarene, they approached his cross in silence, took the look in silence, and so departed. This change extended even to the guard, who so shortly before had cast lots for the clothes of the crucified. They stood with their officers a little apart, more watchful of the one convict than of the throngs coming and going. If he but breathed heavily, or tossed his head in a paroxysm of pain, they were instantly on the alert. More marvelous of all, however, was the altered behavior of the high priest and his following, the wise men who had assisted him in the trial in the night, and in the victim's face kept placed by him with zealous approval. When the darkness began to fall, they began to lose their confidence. There were among them many learned in astronomy, and familiar with the apparition so terrible in those days to the masses. Much of the knowledge was descended to them from their fathers far back, some of it had been brought away at the end of the captivity. And the necessities of the temple service kept it all bright. These closed together when the sun commenced to fade before their eyes, and the mountains and hills to recede. They drew together in a group around their pontiff, and debated what they saw. The moon is at its full, they said with truth. And this cannot be an eclipse. Then as no one could answer the question common with them all, as no one could account for the darkness, or for its occurrence at that particular time, in their secret hearts they associated it with the Nazarene, and yielded to an alarm which the long continuance of the phenomenon steadily increased. In their place, behind the soldiers, they noted every word and motion of the Nazarene, and hung with fear upon his sighs and talked in whispers. The man might be the Messiah, and then... But they would wait and see. In the meantime, Ben-Hur was not once visited by the old spirit. The perfect peace abode with him. He prayed simply that the end might be hastened. He knew the condition of Simonides' mind, that he was hesitating on the verge of belief. He could see the massive face weighed down by solemn reflection. He noticed him casting inquiring glances at the sun, as seeking the cause of the darkness. Nor did he fail to notice the solicitude with which Esther clung to him, smothering her fears to accommodate his wishes. Be not afraid. He heard him say to her, But stay and watch with me. Thou mayest live twice the span of my life, and see nothing of human interest equal to this. 
and there may be revelations more let us stay to the close when a third hour was about half gone some men of the rudest class wretches from the tombs about the city came and stopped in front of the center cross this is he the new king of the jews said one of them the others cried with laughter hail all hail king of the jews receiving no reply they went closer if thou be king of the jews or son of god come down they said loudly at this one of the thieves quit groaning and called to the nazarene yes if thou be christ save thyself and us the people laughed and applauded then while they were listening for a reply the other felon was heard to say to the first one dost thou not fear god we receive the due rewards of our deeds but this man hath done nothing amiss the bystanders were astonished in the midst of the hush which ensued the second felon spoke again but this time to the nazarene lord he said remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom simonides gave a great start when thou comest into thy kingdom it was the very point of doubt in his mind the point he had so often debated with balthazar didst thou hear said ben hur to him the kingdom cannot be of this world yon witness saith the king is but going to his kingdom and in effect i heard the same in my dream hush said simonides more imperiously than ever before in speech to ben hur hush i pray thee if the nazarene should answer and as he spoke the nazarene did answer in a clear voice full of confidence verily i say unto thee to-day shalt thou be with me in paradise simonides waited to hear if that were all then he folded his hands and said no more no more lord the darkness is gone i see with other eyes even as balthazar i see with eyes of perfect faith the faithful servant had at last his fitting reward his broken body might never be restored nor was there riddance of the recollection of his sufferings or recall of the years embittered by them but suddenly a new life was upon him with assurance that it was for him a new life lying just beyond this one and its name was paradise there he would find the kingdom of which he had been dreaming and the king a perfect peace fell upon him over the way in front of the cross however there were surprise and consternation the cunning casuist there put the assumption underlying the question and the admission underlying the answer together for saying through the land that he was the messiah they had brought the nazarene to the cross and lo on the cross more confidently than ever he not only reasserted himself but promised enjoyment of his paradise to a malefactor they trembled at what they were doing the pontiff with all his pride was afraid where got the man his confidence except from truth and what should the truth be but god a very little now will put them all to flight the breathing of the nazarene grew harder his sighs became great gasps only three hours upon the cross and he was dying the intelligence was carried from man to man until every one knew it and then everything hushed the breeze faltered and died a stifling vapor loaded the air heat was superadded to darkness nor might any one unknowing the fact have thought that off the hill out under the overhanging pall there were three millions of people waiting awestruck what should happen next they were so still then there went out through the gloom over the heads of such as were on the hill within hearing of the dying man a cry of despair if not reproach my god my god why hast thou forsaken me the voice startled all who heard it one it touched uncontrollably the soldiers in coming had brought with them a vessel of wine and water and set it down a little way from ben hur with a sponge dipped in the liquor and put on the end of a stick they could moisten the tongue of a sufferer at their pleasure ben hur thought of the draught he had had at the well near nazareth an impulse seized him catching up the sponge he dipped it in the vessel and started for the cross let him be the people in the way shouted angrily let him be without minding them he went on and put the sponge to the nazarene's lips too late too late the face then plainly seen by ben hur bruised and black with blood and dust as it was lighted nevertheless with a sudden glow the eyes opened wide and fixed upon someone visible to them alone in the far heavens 
and there were content and relief, even triumph, in the shout the victim gave. It is finished! It is finished! So a hero, dying in the doing a great deed, celebrates his success with a last cheer. The light in the eyes went out. Slowly the crowned head sank upon the laboring breast. Ben-Hur thought the struggle over, but the fainting soul recollected itself, so that he and those around him caught the other and last words, spoken in a low voice, as if to one listening close by. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. A tremor shook the tortured body. There was a scream of fierce disanguish, and the mission and the earthly life were over at once. The heart with all its love was broken, and of that, O oh reader, the man died. Ben-Hur went back to his friends, saying simply, It is over. He's dead. In a space incredibly short, the multitude was informed of the circumstance. No one repeated it aloud. There was a murmur which spread from the knoll in every direction. A murmur that was little more than a whispering. He is dead. He is dead. And that was all. The people had their wish. The Nazarene was dead, yet they stared at each other aghast. His blood was upon them. And while they stood staring at each other, the ground commenced to shake. Each man took hold of his neighbor to support himself, and a twinkling the darkness disappeared, and the sun came out, and everybody, as with the same glance, beheld the crosses upon the hill, all reeling drunken-like in the earthquake. They beheld all three of them, but the one in the center was arbitrary. It alone would be seen, and for that it seemed to extend itself upwards and lift its burden and swing it to and fro higher and higher in the blue of the sky. And every man among them who had jeered at the Nazarene, every one who had struck him, every one who had voted to crucify him, every one who had marched in the procession from the city, every one who had in his heart wished him dead, and they were as ten to one, felt that he was in some way individually singled out from the many, and that if he would live he must get away quickly as possible from that menace in the sky. They started to run. They ran with all their might, on horseback and camels, and in chariots they ran, as well as on foot. But then, as if it were mad at them for what they had done, and had taken up the cause of the unoffending and friendless dead, the earthquake pursued them and tossed them about and flung them down, and terrified them yet more by the horrible noise of great rocks grinding and rending beneath them. They beat their breasts and shrieked with fear. His blood was upon them. The home-bred and the foreign, priest and layman, beggar, Sadducee, Pharisee, were overtaken in the race and tumbled about indiscriminately. If they called on the Lord, the outraged earth answered for him in fury and dealt them all alike. It did not even know wherein the high priest was better than his guilty brethren, overtaking him. It tripped him up also and smirched the fringing of his robe and filled the golden bells with sand and his mouth with dust. He and his people were alike in the one thing at least. The blood of the Nazarene was upon them all. When the sunlight broke upon the crucifixion, the mother of the Nazarene, the disciple, and the faithful women of Galilee, the centurion and his soldiers, and Ben-Hur and his party, were all who remained upon the hill. These had not time to observe the flight of the multitude. They were too loudly called upon to take care of themselves. Seat thyself here said Ben-Hur to Esther, making a place for her at her father's feet. Now cover in thy eyes, and look not up, but put thy trust in God, and the spirit of yon just man so foully slain. Nay, said Simonides reverently, let us henceforth speak of him as the Christ. Be it so, said Ben-Hur. Presently a wave of the earthquake struck the hill. The shrieks of the thieves upon the reeling crosses were terrible to hear. Though giddy with the movements of the ground, Ben-Hur had time to look at Balthazar, and beheld him prostrate and still. He ran to him and called. There was no reply. The good man was dead. Then Ben-Hur remembered to have heard a cry and answer, as it were to the scream of the Nazarene in his last moment. But he had not looked to see from whom it had proceeded, and ever after he believed the spirit of the Egyptian accompanied that of his master over the boundary into the kingdom of paradise. The idea rested not only upon the cry heard, but upon the exceeding fitness of the distinction. If faith were a worthy reward in the person of Gaspar, and love in that of Melchior, 
Surely he should have some special meed, which through a long life and so excellently illustrated the three virtues in combination, faith, love, and good works. The servants of Balthazar had deserted their master, but when all was over, the two Galileans bore the old man and his litter back to the city. It was a sorrowful procession that entered the south gate of the palace of the Hers about the set of sun that memorable day. About the same hour the body of the Christ was taken down from the cross. The remains of Balthazar were carried to the guest chamber. All the servants hastened weeping to see him. For he had the love of every living thing with which he had in any wise to do. But when they beheld his face and the smile upon it, they dried their tears, saying, It is well. He is happier this evening than when he went out in the morning. Ben-Hur would not trust a servant to inform Iris what had befallen her father. He went himself to see her and bring her to the body. He imagined her grief. She would now be alone in the world. It was a time to forgive and pity her. He remembered he had not asked why she was not of the party in the morning, or where she was. He remembered he had not thought of her, and from shame he was ready to make any amends, the more so as he was about to plunge her into such acute grief. He shook the curtains of her door, and though he heard the ringing of the little bells echoing within, he had no response. He called her name, and again he called. Still no answer. He drew the curtain aside and went into the room. She was not there. He ascended hastily to the roof in search of her, nor was she there. He questioned the servants. None of them had seen her during the day. After a long quest everywhere through the house, Ben-Hur returned to the guest chamber and took the place by the dead, which should have been hers, and he bethought him there how merciful the Christ had been to his aged servant. At the gate of the kingdom of paradise happily the afflictions of this life, even its desertions, are left behind and forgotten by those who go in and rest. When the gloom of the burial was nigh done, on the ninth day after the healing, the law being fulfilled, Ben-Hur brought his mother and Tirza home, and from that day, in that house, the most sacred names possible of utterance by men were always coupled worshipfully together. God the Father and Christ the Son. About five years after the crucifixion, Esther, the wife of Ben-Hur, sat in her room in the beautiful villa by Messinium. It was noon, with a warm Italian sun making summer for the roses and vines outside. Everything in the apartment was Roman, except that Esther wore the garments of a Jewish matron. Tirza and two children at play, upon a lion skin on the floor, were her companions, and what had only to observe how carefully she watched them to know that the little ones were hers. Time had treated her generously. She was more than ever beautiful, and in becoming mistress of the villa, she had realized one of her cherished dreams. In the midst of this simple, home-like scene, a servant appeared in the doorway and spoke to her. A woman in the atrium to speak with the mistress. Let her come. I will receive her here. Presently the stranger entered. At sight of her the Jewess arose, and was about to speak. Then she hesitated, changed color, and finally drew back, saying, I have known you, good woman. You are— I was Eras, the daughter of Balthazar. Esther conquered her surprise and bade the servant bring the Egyptian a seat. No, said Iris coldly. I will retire directly. The two gazed at each other. We know what Esther presented, a beautiful woman, a happy mother, a contented wife. On the other side, it was very plain that fortune had not dealt so gently with her former rival. The tall figure remained with some of its grace, but an evil life had tainted the whole person. The face was coarse. The large eyes were red and pursed beneath the lower lids. There was no color in her cheeks. The lips were cynical and hard, and general neglect was leading rapidly to premature old age. Her attire was ill-chosen and draggled. The mud of the road clung to her sandals. Iris broke the painful silence. These are thy children. Esther looked at them and smiled. Yes. Will you not speak to them? I would scare them. Iris replied, then she drew closer to Esther, and seeing her shrink, said, Be not afraid. Give thy husband a message for me. Tell him his enemy is dead, and that for the much misery he brought me I slew him. His enemy? The Masala. Further tell thy husband that for the harm I sought to do him I have been punished until even he would pity me. Tears rose in Esther's eyes, and she was about to speak. Nay. 
said Iris. I do not want pity or tears. Tell him finally I have found that to be a Roman is to be a brute. Farewell. She moved to go. Esther followed her. Stay and see my husband. He has no feeling against you. He sought for you everywhere. He will be your friend. I will be your friend. We are Christians. The other was firm. No, I am what I am of choice. It will be over shortly. But— Esther hesitated. Have we nothing you would wish? Nothing to— To— The countenance of the Egyptian softened. Something like a smile played upon her lips. She looked at the children upon the floor. Esther followed her eyes, and with quick perception answered, It is yours. Iris went to them and knelt on the lion skin and kissed them both. Rising slowly, she looked at them, then passed to the door and out without a parting word. She walked rapidly, and was gone before Esther could decide what to do. Ben-Hur, when he was told of the visit, knew certainly what he had long surmised, that on the day of the crucifixion Iris had deserted her father for Masala. Nevertheless, he set out immediately and hunted for her vainly. They never saw her more, or heard of her. The blue bay, with all its laughing under the sun, had yet its dark secrets. Had it a tongue, it might tell us of the Egyptian. Simonides lived to be a very old man. In the tenth year of Nero's reign, he gave up the business so long centered in the warehouse at Antioch. To the last, he kept a clear head and a good heart, and was successful. One evening in the year named, he sat in his armchair on the terrace of the warehouse. Ben-Hur and Esther and their three children were with him. The last of the ships swung at mooring in the current of the river. All the rest had been sold. In the long interval between this and the day of the crucifixion, but one sorrow had befallen them. That was when the mother of Ben-Hur died, and then and now their grief would have been greater, but for their Christian faith. The ship spoken of had arrived only the day before, bringing intelligence of the persecutions of Christians, begun by Nero in Rome, and the party on the terrace were talking of the news when Malik, who was still in their service, approached and delivered a package to Ben-Hur. Who brings this? The latter asked after reading. An Arab. Where is he? He left immediately. Listen, said Ben-Hur to Simonides. He read then the following letter. I, Ilderim, the son of Ilderim the Generous, and Sheik of the tribe of Ilderim, to Judah, son of Hur. Know, O friend of my father's, how my father loved you. Read what is herewith sent, and you will know. His will is my will, therefore what he gave is thine. All the Parthians took from him the great battle in which they slew him I have retaken, this writing, with other things, and vengeance, and all the brood of that mir, who in his time was mother of so many stars. Peace be to you and all yours. This voice out of the desert is the voice of Ildrim, Sheik. Ben-Hur next unrolled a scrap of papyrus, yellow as a withered mulberry leaf. It required the daintiest handling. Proceeding, he read, Ilderim, surnamed the Generous, Sheik of the tribe of Ilderim, to the son who succeeds me. All I have, O son, shall be thine in the day of thy succession, except that property by Antioch, known as the Orchard of Palms, and it shall be to the son of her who brought us such glory in the circus, to him and his Dishonor not thy father, Ilderim the Generous, Sheik. What say you? asked Ben-Hur of Simonides. Esther took the papers, pleased, and read them to herself. Simonides remained silent. His eyes were upon the ship, and he was thinking. At length he spoke. Son of Hur, he said gravely, The Lord has been good to you in these latter years. You have much to be thankful for. Is it not time to decide finally the meaning of the gift of the great fortune now all in your hand and growing? I decided that long ago. The fortune was meant for the service of the giver. Not a part, Simonides, but all of it. The question with me has been, how can I make it most useful in his cause? And of that tell me, I pray you. Simonides answered, The great sums you have given to the church here in Antioch I am witness to. Now, instantly, almost with this gift of the generous sheikhs, comes the news of the persecution of the brethren in Rome. It is the opening of a new field. The light must not go out in the capital. Tell me how I can keep it alive. 
i will tell you the romans even this nero hold two things sacred i know of no others they so hold they are the ashes of the dead and all the places of burial if you cannot build temples for the worship of the lord above ground then build them below the ground and to keep them from profanation carry to them the bodies of all who die in the faith ben-hur arose excitedly it is a great idea he said i will not wait to begin it time forbids waiting the ship that brought the news of the suffering of our breth brethren shall take me to rome i will sail to-morrow he turned to malik get the ship ready malik and be there ready to go with me it is well said simonides and now esther what sayest thou asked ben hur esther came to his side and put her hand on his arm and answered so wilt thou best of the christ o oh, my husband let me not hinder but go with thee and help if any of my readers visiting rome will make the short journey to the catacomb of san calixto which is more ancient than that of san sebastiano he will see what became of the fortune of ben hur and give him thanks out of that vast tomb christianity issued to supersede the caesars End of chapter 10. End of book 8. End of Ben-Hur by Lou Wallace.